Hi there, my name is Dimitri and I'm very happy to welcome you to this course on design patterns in Python. So what are design patterns all about? Well, design patterns are simply common architectural approaches that people have observed as they've been designing object-oriented software and people decided to make a catalog out of the most common ones. So that's where we got the popular Gang of Four book, which was written in 1994. This book created an entire industry devoted to design patterns. The original design patterns book was written using Smalltalk and C++, which were the popular language of the day, but the design patterns has since been translated to many other object-oriented programming languages such as C-sharp, Java, C++, Python, and so on, and even languages which are not properly object-oriented such as JavaScript. Design patterns are universally relevant. They are as relevant today as they were back in 1994. We have evidence for that in the fact that modern programming languages internalize some of the design patterns, making them part of the language itself. You can see it, for example, in c -sharp's implementation of the observer pattern or Python's implementation of decorators. In addition to putting patterns right into the languages, we also have plenty of libraries which incorporate some of the patterns. So you can simply take your project, add a library to it, and you have that pattern automatically implemented for you. And finally, you might already be using some of the design patterns in your own code, maybe without even realizing that you're doing so. So the structure of this course is fairly simple. Before we get into the design patterns themselves, we're going to talk about the solid design principles, and then it's off to the standard structure of design patterns. So we're going to talk about three categories of design patterns, creational, structural, and behavioral. So in terms of the actual patterns, we're going to follow the same sets of patterns that are outlined in the original book, because guess what? Not much has changed. over the years and we haven't really uh, moved on from the original pattern catalog. So first of all, we'll talk about the creational design patterns. And here, the only change that I've made to the original catalog is I've put the two factory patterns, the abstract factory and the factory method, under a single course section called factories. Then we'll talk about the structural design patterns, the same set of patterns as in the book. And then we'll talk about the behavioral set of patterns. Once again, the set of patterns here is exactly the same same as you'll find in various literature. So let's talk about the organization of this course. This course is 100% practical and hands-on, which means you're going to be seeing me basically write programs and run them, and I'll be explaining the different ways in which patterns are implemented along the way. You will see me uh, write single Python files for every single demo. So whenever I'm explaining a concept, there's going to be just one file and you can grab this file, you can download it and you can run it in an editor or an integrated development environment or simply run it from the command line. Now, in terms of testing your knowledge and your understanding, every single design pattern has an end of section coding exercise. This is where you get to test your understanding by actually implementing the design pattern discussed in this course section. And uh, you'll see that some of these problems are rather challenging. So what do you need uh, to actually understand all of this? Well, I'm going to be using the latest version of Python. And if you want to follow the examples, I expect you to do the same. Of course, you can uh, modify it to work with, let's say, Python 2.7. Uh, we're going to be using plenty of code generation and refactoring. So essentially, since I'm using an IDE, you're going to see me sometimes do sort of uh, auto magical things like the generation of attribute assignments and things like that. Just don't be surprised when you see chunks of code appearing out of nowhere. That's totally normal. I'm also going to be making liberal use of whatever Python language functionality is available to me, whether it's decorators or meta classes or something else. I'm going to be taking all of it so long as it actually helps us understand the pattern and implement it better, I figure why not use it? And finally, uh, the same goes for external packages. So if I see some package which actually helps us in uh, getting the design pattern to work, then I'm going to use that. 
So what are the prerequisites for joining this course? Well, first of all, you have to have a good understanding of object-oriented programming. This is an intermediate level uh, course, so I'm not going to be hand-holding you through the foundational concepts. In fact, there is nothing in this course to uh, describe uh, Python language features as such. It's not a Python course, and you should consult a Python course if you're not familiar with some of the Python's features because guess what? You do need a good understanding of Python. I'm going to be using whatever functionality is available to me and I will make no discounts in terms of uh, the complexity. Now, in terms of some of the topics that are going to be mentioned tangentially in the uh, course of uh, our discussions, uh, some of the topics I'll mention will be sequence processing, so things like reactive extensions, for example. I'm going to be mentioning concurrency when we uh, come to it in, in its implementation in in some of the design patterns and I'll mention dependency injection and there might be other topics which uh, to be fair every single one of those topics would deserve its own uh, course that you might want to take here uh, on this platform so these are some of the things uh, that might show up here and there they're not the central subject of the course though Okay, so let me talk a little bit about myself, who am I and what I do. My name is Dimitri. Here is a uh, picture of me. I work in an area called quant finance, which is an interesting blend of math and finance and computing, including some sophisticated applications of high performance computing, even some hardware design. I am a book author, a conference speaker, a blogger, a podcaster, very involved in the developer community. And I've done plenty of courses. I've written courses for Pluralsight, Udemy and elsewhere and I have lots and lots of courses but in particular I have a couple of courses on design patterns that you might find elsewhere so I have courses on design patterns in C sharp Java C++ Swift so uh, you can say that I have lots of experience with the topic at hand so if you're ready to learn about design patterns in Python then let's jump in and I shall see you on the other side In this section of the course, we're going to talk about the solid design principles. So the solid design principles are a set of design principles related to software design, of course, which were introduced by Robert C. Martin, also known as Uncle Bob. And Robert C. Martin actually has lots of design principles. He has published various books on software design as well as his blog. And the solid are just a selection of five principles from a rather large number. Now, the reason why we're discussing them is because these design principles are frequently referred to in modern design pattern literature and as a result it's very useful to know what they are so that when I will refer to them as part of this course you know what I'm actually talking about. So the first principle from the solid design principles that we're going to get acquainted with is called the single responsibility principle. Uh, the abbreviation is SRP, that's what we're going to be using to refer to this principle, but you'll also hear another term, and that term is separation of concerns, and they both mean pretty much the same thing. The idea is very simple. If you have a class, that class should have its primary responsibility, whatever it's meant to be doing, and it should not take on other responsibilities. So let me show you how this can actually be set up. Let's suppose that you decide to make a class called journal. Now you're making a journal so you can record your most intimate thoughts. So we'll have an initialize here. We'll have entries as a list and we'll also have uh, just some index that we can use to prefix all the entries. Now when it comes to adding an entry, because you want the journal to do something, so you want to be able to add an entry with some text, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, increment the count, and that, by the way, should be equal to zero. So we're going to say self count plus equals one, and then we're going to add the actual entry to the list. So self dot entries dot append, and here I'm just going to add self count colon and then the actual text. So this is how we're going to be adding the entry. Similarly, we can have some sort of method for removing the entry. So remove entry. Uh, with a position, so you want to remove an entry at a particular position where you just delete it, uh, like so. Uh, one thing you might want to have is to have a human readable representation of all the entries in the journal so that you can actually print it somewhere or save it somewhere. So here I'll define str, 
and I'm just going to take a line break and use it as a separator to join all the entries together. There we go. Okay, so the storing and uh, removing indeed of entries is the journal's primary responsibility. So we're not breaking the single responsibility principle yet. Everything is fine for now. We can actually start using this journal. So we can say j equals journal. I can add a bunch of entries. So I can say I cried today. And let's have another one, I ate a bug. And then what we can do is we can, for example, print the journal. So I can print journal entries, colon, line break, and then the actual journal. So this is something we can actually run. As you can see, we're getting the right output here. So far so good because the journal's primary responsibility is to keep the entries and we're doing that. Now we're going to break the single responsibility principle by giving a journal additional responsibilities that it never really asked for and that might seem like a good idea but aren't really. So for example, we'll uh, give it an ability to save itself. So we have a method called save which takes a file name and that's where we're going to make a file. So open file name for writing. We're going to file.write uh, the string representation of the journal and then we're going to close uh, the file handle like so. So in addition to saving the journal, you might think it's a good idea to also load the journal uh, from some file name. I'm not going to waste your time implementing this. Uh, once again, you might want to also load it from a web resource. So load from web uh, given a particular URI. And once again, I'm not going to implement this. So what is the problem? Uh, with uh, all of this. The problem is that we've added a secondary responsibility to the journal. Not only does the journal now store entries and allow us to manipulate the entries, but it's now taking on the responsibility of persistence by uh, providing functionality for saving and loading the journal uh, from uh, particular resources. Uh, this is a bad idea for a number of reasons. If you think about uh, a complete application where in addition to journals you also have other different types. All of those types might have their own save and their own load and load from web and so on. And this functionality might have to be centrally changed at some point. For example, when saving a file you might want to add additional code for checking that you're allowed to write to a particular directory. Now the problem is if you adopt this approach what's going to happen is you'll have to go into every single class inside your application and change their save method or change their load method. And this is particularly tedious. So you want to take the responsibility of persistence and you want to stick it to a separate class. So I'm going to comment it out here and we'll see how to implement this separately. So you might have a class called persistence manager. And this is going to be the class that will be responsible for saving a particular object to a file, like a journal, for example. So we'll have save to file. Uh, we'll not take self. I'll make this a uh, static like so. So we'll take the journal and the file name and here we'll just do the same thing that we did previously. So let me just copy this stuff over and uh, paste it here. So it's pretty much the same code. The only difference is that instead of self you get the journal. There you go. So this is how you would uh, refactor the code to actually enforce separation of concerns once again. And we can start using this. We can actually use this and verify that everything works correctly. So here what I'll do is I'll uh, make a file name. So uh, I'm on Windows so I'm going to use ctemp journal.txt. I'm actually going to uh, take the persistence manager and use the static save to file uh, method to actually save the journal to a file. And then we can verify that it did in fact work. So I can say with uh, open file as file handle, what we can do is we can print uh, file handle.read. There we go. Okay, so if I now run this, you can see that uh, the journal entries have been printed twice. So the first set is from uh, that time where we actually uh, printed them using str and the second one is by serializing them to a file and then reading them from that file. So what is the takeaway of this entire lesson? The takeaway is that you don't want to overload your objects with too many responsibilities. 
Now, interestingly enough, we have something called an anti-pattern. So an anti-pattern is like the opposite of a pattern. Patterns are good, anti-patterns are bad, but they also show up quite a lot. So one anti-pattern is called God object. God object is when you have a developer, perhaps a newbie developer, somebody who doesn't know uh, programming very well, who decides to put everything in the kitchen sink into a single class. So you add, uh, let's say you add the managing of the entries, you add persistence, you add additional functionality whatever it is and you stick it all into a single class and you get a massive class as the end result this is typically bad code this is why we call it an anti-pattern it's not something that you want to do so the single responsibility principle basically prevents you from making god objects it enforces this idea that a class should have a single reason to change and that change should be somehow related to its primary responsibility The second principle from the solid design principles that we're going to talk about is called the open close principle or OCP. So what is the idea of that principle? Well, it will actually take us a rather long time to kind of explain it and flesh it out. But let me just show you a very simple scenario. Let's imagine that you have a website. Maybe you're like Amazon.com. You're selling different products. So your products have certain characteristics. They have, let's say, color. So I'm going to be using enums here. So uh, let me add the appropriate uh, imports. So let's suppose we have a bunch of colors. I'm just going to give them integers. So red, green, blue, and so on. You, your product might also have a size, which is also going to be an enum. So it might be small, medium, or large. Okay, so now we can define the product itself. So class product. And uh, when we initialize it, uh, we can take, for example, the name, the color, and the size, and we can just, just initialize all of these. Let me just quickly generate the assignments. There we go. Okay, so this is our product. Now what we want to do, just like a website such as Amazon, is we want to be able to filter products. So we want to maybe find all the products of a particular color. So the question is, how do you implement this? Well, you might want to have a separate class. Let's call a product filter. So this is where you're going to be uh, filtering things. And uh, let's suppose you want to filter by color. Filter by color. So uh, you take the products. You take the color you want to filter by. And then it's very easy. So you say 4p in products if uh, p color is in fact the color you're after, then yield p. Okay, so this is very simple. Now, one question you might have is, well, hold on, if you're uh, filtering, why not use a predicate? But remember, we're talking about like a web user interface where somebody uh, explicitly specifies that they want to find this color or that color. So turning that into a predicate of some kind is very difficult, which is why we have a separate method here for filtering by color. Okay, so suppose you implement this, but then uh, you, uh, you put it into production, your boss comes back and they say, well, can you please also implement filtering by size? So you say, well, yeah, sure. But in order to implement filtering by size, you have to jump back into the code that you've already written, you've already tested, and you have to make modifications to it. So you write filter by size. So here we take the products and the size, and we say 4p in products, if uh, p dot size equals size, well, yield p. Fairly obvious stuff. Okay, now we are already seeing something of a problem because uh, essentially a uh, product filter might have already been written, tested, uh, you know, it, it's already working just fine. You, what you're doing essentially is you're jumping into a part of code that's already been written and tested and you're modifying it, which can have all sorts of unpleasant implications like you you change some of the functionality and you break something, which is good if you have unit tests covering everything, but not so good if you don't have any unit tests. Okay, so um, your code once again goes into production. Everybody's happy. Your clients can filter by either size or color, but then uh, your boss comes back and he says, well, you know, can you, can you make it so that people can filter by size and color at the same time? So you say, well, okay, sure. Let's have uh, filter by size and color, where you take the products, 
you take the size, you take the color, and for p in products, if p color is equal to color and p size is equal to size, then you yield p. Okay, hopefully you can see the problem here. The problem is that uh, later on you might have not just color and size but other criteria and then combining those criteria using methods will just cause a huge state space explosion. So for example if you had three criteria then you would have to build seven different methods just to implement all of the combined functionality. So if you have size, color and price you would have to filter by size, by color, by price, by size, color, color, price, price, size, and all three of them. So that's seven different uh, implementations. So we don't really want that. And furthermore, we don't really want to keep jumping back into a product filter and modifying it. So this is where we come to the open-close principle. The open-close principle states that a class should be open for extension, meaning you should be able to extend it by inheriting for example, but it should be closed for modification. And by modification, which we mean that you shouldn't be able to jump into a class that's already written and just start changing it all over the place. And sometimes, in actual fact, it's impossible. Sometimes you don't even own the source code to a particular class, so you cannot really modify it anyway. Maybe you got it in the library somewhere. Maybe you don't understand exactly how that library works. So we're going to build a solution uh, for solving this problem, for actually uh, not breaking the open-close principle. Now, in order to do this, uh, we're going to implement one of the enterprise design patterns. So we have the standard gang of four patterns, but we also have enterprise patterns. And the patterns that we're going, uh, the pattern that we're going to build here is called specification. So we're going to build the entire specification pattern uh, slowly, and I'll explain to you how it works. So the idea is that as we build additional filters, we want to uh, add those filters by extending something, not by modifying something. So obviously that means inheritance. We want to inherit from some base class and then do whatever it is that we want to do. So how can it work? Well, in order to do this, we're going to first of all define a class called specification. It's the specification pattern, so we may as well have a class called specification. Now, the specification uh, class is actually abstract. You don't really need to implement this. Uh, but it defines an interface for having a method called isSatisfied. So what is this for? Well, essentially, you have a method which gives you a true or a false depending on whether the item here satisfies some particular requirement. We'll see those requirements in a moment. So this is one part of the puzzle. And then there is the other part of the puzzle, which is a filter. So here is a class called filter. And once again, this is going to have an abstract method called filter. Uh, and this, uh, this method is going to take two things. It will take a set of items, and it will also take a specification. And once again, I'll just leave it in an unimplemented state because what we're interested in is actually inheriting from uh, these two classes to define our own filters and specifications. So let me show you how this can work. Let's suppose you want to filter by color. So first of all, you make a color specification. So this inherits from specification. And uh, what we do here is we uh, override uh, the appropriate methods. But in addition, we have to specify which color we're filtering by. So first of all, I'll have an initializer where I'll provide the color. I'll simply store it as an attribute. And here, what I'll do is I shall do the following. I will return item.color is equal to self.color. So let's just pause on this for a second and discuss what's going on because it's not immediately obvious. So we have a base class called specification, which defines an, uh, a method called isSatisfied, which checks whether item satisfies some condition. In our case, the condition is that the color of the item here has to match the color that we specified when we made the specification in the first place. So this is the color specification. Uh, we could start using it, but there is still something that we need to do, and that is related to the second part, the filter, because we have to provide the concrete implementation of the filter. This definition here is very general. We have to have a concrete class, so let's go here, and let's make a class called better filter. So this is going to be a better filter than the product filter that we made previously, and it's going to inherit from filter. So once again, I will generate 
the method here called filter and we'll go through uh, all of the items so for item in items what we want to check is we want to check that the specification provided here is satisfied by this particular item so we say if spec is satisfied by that particular item then what we do is we yield that item that's pretty much all there is to it so we take the items and some specification and we only yield those items which satisfy that specification okay so this is already good because we can now start working with all of this and we can actually uh, test this new functionality so i'm going to make a bunch of products i'll have an apple which is going to be a product called apple it's going to be a uh, green in color and its size is small in addition i'll have a tree which is going to be once again a product called tree uh, it's also green trees are green uh, but the size is large and then we'll have a house so house is a product called a house it's going to be blue and the size is large there we go so i'll make a list of all of these so products is going to be a list with apple tree and house there we go okay so now i want to use the functionality that i've made to um kind of uh, filter all of these now before we look at the brand new functionality let's take a look at the old filter how it would work so you would make a product filter like so and then you can get all the green products for example so here i'll print uh, green products done the old way and then here for p in pf dot filter by color so we're going to be uh, actually that should be an f here pf filter by color so here what we're going to do is we'll provide the products and color green like so and we can print the product print uh, let's put a dash then the product name is green so this is the old way of doing things let's actually run this to see that it does in fact work so here you can see the output we have green products uh, apple is green and tree is green but now we want to uh, follow this approach which adheres to the open close principle so we'll make a better filter a uh, better filter and i'm going to comment out uh, this stuff for now so we'll make a better filter uh, and then we'll get the green products in a new way so print uh, green products in a new way there we go so here is how you would do this there's a bit more ceremony here because you have to have a specification and in this case we made a color specification here that's exactly what we're going to be using so let's come back here and let's make one so i'll say green equals color specification color green and then I will use that filter so for p in better filter dot filter so I provide the products and I provide the specification and here I can do the printout so the printout is actually exactly the same as up above so I'm just going to uh, copy it here okay so let's run this just to see that it does in fact work as you can see we get the same output but this is done in a new way so far we've implemented a color specification what about some of the other specifications what about let's say a size specification so let's go here uh, class size specification specification and uh, the implementation is fairly obvious so let me uh, generate the override so here you would uh, uh, first of all you would have an initializer uh, where you specify the size and you just store it as an attribute and when it comes to checking whether it's satisfied you return item dot size is equal to self dot size and that's pretty much it now we can already uh, start using this so we can find for example all the large products so print large products there we go and here i would make large equals size specification i would specify size dot large and then for p in actually it's pretty much the same as here let me just copy the code over so instead of green we have large and we have p dot name is large so let's see if this works okay as you can see here we have the output large products tree is large house is large 
Okay, so we have the color specification, we have the size specification. If you need to uh, filter on other attributes, you would make additional classes. But the question is, what about the combination? What about having uh, size and color both used in a filter? Well, for this, we're going to build something called the combinator. So a combinator basically combines two of the specifications into a kind of meta specification. So let's do this. I'll have and specification. This is also a specification, by the way, so it also inherits from specification. Here is the interesting part. So when you initialize it, you provided uh, two specifications that it has to combine. Let's call them spec1 and spec2. So let's keep these as attributes. I'm just going to stick them in here. And then, of course, we need to override the is satisfied. And this is where we check both of these specifications and we ensure that both of them are satisfied. So we return self.spec1.is uh, satisfied item. And, and then I can just copy this. And uh, that's going to be spec2. So both of these have to be satisfied, and that's how you essentially combine the two things together. So let me show you how you can find all the large and blue items. So print large blue items. So here I can say large blue equals and specification. Uh, now we already have a large, so that's good. But the other part has to be a color specification for the color blue. There we go. Okay, so having made this, what we can uh, do is I can actually just, just copy this once again. We can specify this large blue as a specification here. So large underscore blue, and we can say p.name is large and blue. There we go. So let's run this. As you can see, a house is large and blue. So everything is okay. I can actually do a bit of syntax sugar. Uh, by redefining the AND operator on specification to return one of these AND specifications, just to make things even nicer than they already are. So what I would do is here, I would define AND, and I would return an AND specification uh, with self and other. So what does this give us? Well, this gives us the ability to use the AND keyword to uh, define large blue. So instead of doing it like this, I can write large blue equals large and color specification uh, color blue. So it's just a bit of syntax sugar and if I run this you can see that the end result is pretty much the same. So what is the takeaway from this lesson? The open close principle basically mandates that objects are open for extension and you can see the way that we've been extending things through inheritance both the specifications as well as uh, the filters here, but it's closed for modification. Notice that apart from my implementation of the AND specification, which hopefully you'd only do once, at no point in time do we jump back into the base classes. We don't touch them, we don't modify them in any way, we don't need to, because whenever we need a new spec we just inherit. And this is a much more flexible and a much more reliable approach. So now let's talk about the third of the solid design principles, and this principle is called the Liskov substitution principle, named after Barbara Liskov. And the idea is very simple. The idea is that if you have some interface that takes some sort of base class, you should be able to stick a derived class in there and everything should work. Yeah, I know it sounds a bit cryptic. So let me show you an example. It's actually going to be a bit convoluted because I'm going to make a class, let's call it class rectangle. So I'm going to model a rectangle, but I'm going to model it slightly differently than just uh, by using attributes. So I'll have an initializer where we have uh, width and height. So uh, here I will assign these, but do it in a slightly different way. So what I'm going to do is I'll put underscores in front of both of these. So these are going to be kind of like private in the sense that uh, you shouldn't really be touching them. And then what I'll do is I'll actually implement the width and the height as properties as opposed to just exposing attributes. So uh, this is what it will look like. 
something like the following. So we have the getter for the width, the setter for the width, and the same goes for height as well. Why am I doing this? Well, I want to show you a particular kind of side effect of uh, breaking the list of substitution principle using inheritance. But before we do that, there's a couple of things that I want to set up. First of all, I want to make yet another property for calculating the area of a rectangle. So this will be a property called area. So return self underscore width multiplies self underscore height. Uh, and we'll also have some string representation. So def str return, let's just say width is self width. Actually, let's uh, do this like so, uh, without the, well, it doesn't really matter either way. And then height is going to be self height. May as well use the properties as opposed to the attributes. So having defined this rectangle, we can build some sort of uh, method, for example, or some sort of function for actually using that rectangle. Let's call it use it. Not very imaginative, I know. So here is the rectangle RC. And uh, so here's what we're going to do. First of all, we're going to save the width of the rectangle. So I'm going to say w equals rc width. Uh, then I'm going to set the height of the rectangle. So I'm going to say rc height equals 10. And then what is the expected area of this whole thing? Well, clearly, this is the width and this is the height. So the expected area is w times 10. Expected equals w times 10, turn it into an int. OK, uh, but uh, we might not exactly get it in all situations. So first of all, let me print something out. So I expected an area of expected, but I got rc.area. OK, so let's see if we can actually use this use it function with a rectangle rc equals rectangle 2 comma 3 use it rc there we go let's actually run this let's see what we get okay it looks like our code is working correctly we expected an area of 20 and we got exactly 20. now let's go through the steps that made this possible so first of all we got the width of the rectangle and the width was 2 and then we set the height to 10 so that became 2 width, 10 height, 2 times 10 equals 20. And that's what we have. Expected area of 20 got the area of 20. Everything is good. But now let me show you how we can break the Liskov substitution principle by making a derived class. So making a class which inherits from rectangle, which absolutely does not work with this method, which absolutely breaks this method. And uh, in the process, you'll see why I chose to use properties as opposed to just attributes. So what I'm going to do is I'll make a new class and I'll call it square. A square is a rectangle, so we'll use inheritance and then we'll just define different form of initialization because you don't need the width and the height. In a square, the width is equal to the height. So here we just specify the size and then we can say rectangle in it and we can specify size twice for both the width and the height. So far, everything is okay. But what I want to do is I want to make sure that whatever happens, the square is a square, meaning if somebody changes its width, the height should also change and vice versa. So here I'll define uh, a new setter for the width property. So we'll have self and value. And here I'll say self underscore width equals self underscore height equals value. And of course, let's not forget to uh, decorate this. So this is going to be rectangle dot width dot setter. And the same goes for the height. So let me just copy this and paste. So here, instead of width, you'd have height. And the name should be height as well. OK, so the code looks very innocent. We're just trying to enforce the invariant by making sure that whenever somebody sets the height, they are setting both the width and the height at the same time. Unfortunately, this breaks the Liskov substitution principle. Let me show you how. If I make a square with a size 5, I can call use it with a square. But let's take a look at the output. Oh, we expected an area of 50, and we got 100. So what is the problem here? Well, the problem is 
in this line of code. So you see rc.height equals 10 has the unfortunate side effect of also changing the width. So the width that we cached here is no longer valid. It's no longer the width that you'd expect. But the kind of higher level problem is that we now have this function, which uses a rectangle, which only works on a rectangle and does not work on any derived classes. And this is a direct violation of the Liskov substitution principle, which states that whenever you have an interface taking some sort of base class, you should be able to stick in any of its inheritors. So if you take a rectangle, you should be able to stick in a square in there and everything should work correctly. Now, as to how to correct uh, this particular problem in this example, it's really up to you. Personally, my argument would be that there is no need for a square class in the first place. There's simply no need for it. If you want to have a square, you can have some sort of uh, Boolean property on a rectangle telling you whether or not this is a square. You can have a factory method. We'll talk about those which would make a square instead of a rectangle. There are lots of ways of actually handling the situation, but making a separate class in this case might not be the best idea. Or if you do want to make it, then you certainly want to avoid things like these because ultimately it's these setters which directly violate the Liskov substitution principle. Okay, so the fourth principle out of the solid design principles is the interface segregation principle. And the idea, once again, is very simple. It, the idea is that you don't really want to stick too many elements, too many methods, for example, into an interface. So let's suppose that you are trying to define some sort of uh, machine for printing and scanning and faxing things and so on. So it might seem like a good idea to just define a single interface that's a rather large interface and then let your clients kind of implement this however they want. So you go ahead and you make an interface called machine where uh, you have a print method. Let's say you want to print some document. And here uh, you maybe you raise, since this is a base class, you might raise uh, not implemented error, for example. And the same could go for uh, any number of additional uh, methods that you might want to implement. So for example, if we're talking about kind of printing and scanning, you might want to also have, uh, you know, faxing and uh, scanning and whatever. So all of these things would be part of the machine interface. So let's take scan in here. Okay, so this interface might seem like a good idea because, well, if somebody is making a multifunction printer, then everything is fine. They need to actually have all of these and they need to implement them. So if you make a multifunction printer, which is a uh, machine, obviously, then what you can do is you can uh, override uh, the print, uh, the fax and the scan, and you can give them meaningful implementations, meaning that here, here and here, you can put in some code which actually does something. So that's okay. Now the problem is uh, what happens when you want to make, let's say an old fashioned printer. Old fashioned printer. Now remember we only have this one interface to work with. That is the machine interface. That's all we have to work with. So here we say, okay, let's, let's implement uh, this interface. You go ahead and you actually uh, jump into the implementation of all of these. And then the question is, uh, what do you actually do with this? Because certainly for printing, an old fashioned printer can print, so this is okay. So instead of this pass here, what you can do is you can put in a meaningful implementation that will actually do something. The question is, what about faxing and scanning? Because obviously an old fashioned printer cannot fax, it cannot scan. So what do you put in here exactly? Well, one approach is to simply just do nothing. So here we uh, uh, do absolutely nothing, no operation here, uh, but this is in and of itself problematic. Why is it a problem? Well, because if somebody makes an instance of an old fashioned printer, they're still gonna see fax as an interface member. And they could be forgiven for assuming that even though this is an old fashioned printer, the fax method actually does something. So they end up calling fax on an old fashioned printer. There is absolutely no effect. And then the client, so whoever's using this class, actually gets a big surprise because maybe they expected 
to actually send a fax uh, using an old-fashioned printer. Maybe there's some magical printer which knows how to send faxes. Who knows? So uh, this is one alternative where you simply don't do anything. The other alternative is to just start complaining. So you raise a not implemented error where you say, uh, for example, uh, printer cannot scan. This way, if people uh, run it, uh, they're, they're going to get an error, obviously. And this is something that uh, maybe is okay if uh, people are just writing small scripts and they can, uh, they can detect this error just by looking at the output of some console or other. But this is a much bigger problem if this is part of a large application and you have, let's say, a web server and somebody calls old-fashioned printer scan as part of some a web service transaction or something, then it's really a problem because you're, you know, you're crashing your application effectively. Now, you can be extra helpful here by providing additional comments saying this is not supported and whatever, but it's still a problem because people are still going to see the API and they're going to think, well, uh, this old-fashioned printer might be old-fashioned, but hey, I can see that it has a scan method, so why don't I use it to actually scan something? Okay, so the idea of interface segregation is basically the following. The idea is that instead of having this one large interface with several members in it, what you want to do is you want to keep things granular. You want to split this interface into separate parts that people can implement. So if somebody uh, wants to print something, they can have an interface called printer. If they have uh, scanning functionality, they can implement an additional interface called scanner. So the implementation of all of this is fairly obvious. So instead of having this machine class, you would have a class called printer, printer, and then you would have uh, print uh, where you print the document. Let's just stick past it here. I may as well decorate it with uh, with abstract method, for example. So uh, similarly, you would have another class called scanner, where you would once again have an abstract method called scan, uh, where once again you take the document, and so on and so forth. So if you want a fax machine or something else, then you would have those as separate classes. And now what you can do is you can actually combine these. So you can combine just the parts that you need. So for example, if you want just a printer, let's suppose you just need a printer. So you say class my printer, my printer, and you just grab the printer interface and then you say, well, okay, let's override this and let's, for example, print the document, like so. If you need, a, let's say, a photocopier. So a photocopier is both a printer and a scanner. So here you can pick the interfaces. So you have photocopier, uh, which is both a printer and a scanner. And here what you can do is you can just generate the, the overrides for both the printer as well as the scanner, and then you can fill them in too however you want. So for printing you would print, for scanning you would uh, scan and so on. And the same goes for uh, any other kind of multifunction device. So if you want a multifunction device you would uh, implement both printer and scanner and fax and or whatever else that you actually need. But in addition, uh, if you really must have this kind of interface, if you really want to have this interface available to the users, so an interface which has both of these, uh, both print and scan and whatever else, then you can have that as well too. So you can you can define it as an interface. And the way you would do this is you would define something like the following. So you say class multi-function device, which is a printer and a scanner, and you can add a fax here or whatever. And then what you would do is uh, you would simply override uh, both of these uh, methods. But instead of just overriding them, you would once again uh, decorate them as abstract methods. So you would go here and you would say that both of these are abstract methods. Now the upside is that if somebody does want some sort of multifunction machine, so let's say you have a class multifunction machine, you can say well this is going to implement the multifunction device interface and then you already have the interface definitions up here. So you have a combination of the two definitions so you can for example, go ahead and just, just implement them like this. Or if you want to build, uh, let's say, a decorator on top of 
both the printer and the scanner. Let's suppose you already have the printer and the scanner and you want to combine them somehow. You can, for example, build a decorator, which we'll talk about when we come to the decorator pattern. So here you will take both the printer and the scanner. You would uh, simply uh, stick them as attributes, like so. And then, of course, uh, for printing, you would simply say self.printer.print document. And the same goes for the scanner. So self.scanner.scan document, like so. So the takeaway from all of this is that making interfaces which feature too many elements is not a good idea because you're forcing your clients to define methods, in this case, which they might not even need. So an ordinary printer does not need to define fax. It does not need to define scan. And you don't really want either scan or fax to appear as part of their interface. So whenever somebody uses code completion, you don't want those things appearing in there. So the interface segregation principle states that you should segregate these. You should split them into the smallest interfaces you can build so that people don't have to implement more than they need to. The final principle from the solid design principles is the dependency inversion principle. So the first thing I want to say is that the dependency inversion principle does not directly relate to dependency injection. So please don't confuse the two. Now, one of the things that the dependency inversion principle states is that high level uh, classes or high level modules in your code should not depend directly on low level modules. Instead, they should depend on abstractions. Now, what do we mean by abstraction? Well, typically what we mean by abstraction is some sort of abstract class or a class with abstract methods. So essentially you just want to depend on interfaces rather than concrete implementations because that way what you can do is you can swap one for the other. Now, of course, Python has duck typing, so you can simply swap one for the other just by, you know, sticking a different class with the same interface. But it's nice to have the interface explicitly fleshed out so that your clients, the people who use your code effectively, can figure out exactly what's going on. So let me show you an example. Let's suppose that we're doing genealogy research. I'm going to have an enum, which is going to define the relationship between two different people. So there's going to be an enum, and we'll have some relationships like parent, child, and maybe sibling, and so on. So then we're going to define a class called person, and I'll just make a very simple initialization here. I'll just stick the name of the person and assign that, and that's pretty much all that we're going to do. Now, what we're interested in is, first of all, we need some sort of low-level module, so a kind of... Uh, module with all the all the implementation details, all the kind of uh, storage semantics and whatever for storing the relationships between different people. So we're going to have a class called relationships. Relationships. There we go. So this is a class where we're going to store all the different relations. So let's just uh, initialize it. Uh, self.relations equals empty list like so. And then we're going to have some sort of functionality for actually manipulating it. So just as we had in the discussion of single responsibility principle, we're going to have some functionality for adding uh, a relationship between, let's say, a parent and a child. So I'll have def add parent and child, where we have the parent and the child. And this is where we can add relations. I'm just going to add them as tuples. So self relations dot append. And here I'll just make a tuple. So we'll have the parent, the relationship uh, will be uh, parent and the child. And you could also have uh, the uh, inverse uh, relationship. So we say, so let me, uh, let me duplicate this and you can have it the other way around. So the child happens to be the child of a particular parent child and then stick parent in here. Okay, so this is fairly obvious stuff and this is kind of low level storage. So here we see that relations is a list and instead of a list you could be using something else later on. Now in order to break uh, the uh, dependency inversion principle, what we're going to do is we're going to first of all define 
a high level module. Now the high level module shouldn't really care about how these things are actually stored. So high level module is going to be called research. And this is where we get to perform some research on, uh, let's say, on f attempting to find uh, all of the children of John, for example. So here in uh, the uh, init, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the relationships in here, like so. And uh, then I'm going to just grab their relations. So remember, we have this list here. So I'm going to say relations equals relationships dot relations. And then I'm going to say for R in relations, if R at zero name is equal to John and R at one is equal to relationship dot parent. So if we found somebody whose parent is John, then uh, print John has a child called and then R at index two dot name. So this is what you get when you work with tuples. You have to use these indices like zero, one, two, and so on. But interestingly enough, this code is fine. This code is fine from the perspective that it's going to work. So let's make a parent. Uh, it's going to be John. And then we'll make uh, child one. Let's call him Chris. And let's have uh, child two. Let's have Matt. And then what we can do is, uh, first of all, we can build the uh, relationships. We can now add the parent and the child uh, using the add parent and child method. So I can say relationships dot add parent and child. So it's going to be parent and child one. And I'll just duplicate this and have parent and child two. And then I can do the research. Okay, so let's actually run this. And we actually get an error name in I'm not defined. Let me just fix this quickly. So we need an import here. So let's do this again. And now we get the right output. So John has a child called Chris and John has a child called Matt. So it might look as though everything is okay, but there is a big, huge problem right here. So you'll notice that relations is basically the way that the relationships modules stores the relations. So at the moment, it's a list. But imagine if you decide to change from a list to something else, to maybe a dictionary or some sort of specialized data storage structure. In this case, what's happening is you're accessing the internal storage mechanism of relationships, which is a low-level module, in your high-level module, which is a bad thing. It's a bad thing because, for example, you cannot just go ahead and change this to something else. You cannot go ahead and change this to a dictionary, for example, because then what would happen is all of this code would effectively break. It would no longer work. So this is something that we want to really avoid. This is something that we don't really want to show up here. And if you have a dependency on the storage implementation, then it's better to provide some sort of utility methods right inside the low-level module to perform the search, because if you change the storage implementation, the search would look completely different. So how would we go about fixing the situation? Well, first of all, we could define an interface uh, for the low-level module. Remember, the idea is that research should not depend on the concrete implementation, which is relationships, but it should depend on some sort of an abstraction that can subsequently change. And you might want to change it, for example, for purposes of testing. So I'm going to define a class called relationship browser. So this is just going to have an interface for finding all children of somebody given the name. So that's going to be an abstract method. And this abstract method would need to be uh, implemented in whoever actually inherits from Relationship Browser. So what we're going to do now is we're going to define that this Relationships module is in fact a Relationship Browser. It is now a Relationship Browser. Now, uh, you'll notice that uh, we now have this requirement that we need to implement this method. So instead of having the search done in here, where it would immediately break if we were to change relations to a different storage structure. We move the whole functionality in a way to a low-level module. So now coming back to relationships, what we would have to do is we would have to actually uh, 
add the implementation of find all children of, and this one is uh, fairly simple here. So for r in self dot relations, if r at zero name is equal to name and r at one is equal to relationship uh, relationship dot parent, then uh, yield r at two dot name. So this is how you would get all the children of a particular person given their name. Now, why is this better? Why is this better than doing it down here? Well, it's better because if you change the implementation of relations, you can rewrite this method to continue to work. And the client who will no longer depend on uh, the uh, concrete implementation, they will not have their code break. The code will continue to work. So now the question is, well, given that we refactored this, what about the initializer for research? How do we actually do the research? So let's do that. So let's have a new init. And here, all we would do is we would take the browser as the argument. Notice that a relationships which gets passed in here is by definition a relationship browser. You can see that it inherits from a relationship browser. So this code, the code that we've written down here, doesn't need to be modified even. But the implementation of the research will be modified because now we say for p in browser dot find all children of John for each of the children of John, we can print them. Print John has a child called P. There we go. So uh, once again, let me actually first of all run this and you can see that the output is pretty much the same. But the, the reason why we did all of this is to avoid depending on the internal implementations. So just to recap, research here is what you would call a high level module. It's a high level in the sense that it uses uh, some other functionality, which is much closer to the hardware, so to speak. And this would be a low level module because essentially it's dealing with things like storage. So storage is a low level concern. Maybe instead of having a list here, you actually go into a database. So you could easily change the underlying part, this part, to use a database and the research module will not break it will not break because it no longer has a dependence on any of the uh, kind of internal mechanics of the way that relations are actually stored. So that is ultimately the goal of the dependency inversion principle. Instead of depending on a low-level module directly, we also introduced an interface. We introduced this interface relationship browser. Now, of course, if I were to uh, delete this interface and delete this part, everything would still continue to work due to duct typing, but it's a very friendly thing to do because now that there is this interface, people know that, you know, this is, uh, this is how you can, you can implement a relationship browser. So, for example, let's suppose that the real browser, the real relationships, actually goes into a database. But let's suppose that you're interested in unit testing. For unit testing, you don't you probably don't want to go into a real database. You just want to make some sort of in-memory storage. So you could use this interface to build another class, let's call fake relationships, where all of the data would be in memory, and then you would expose this data to your unit tests in a predictable fashion. So this is what the dependency inversion principle is all about. All right, so let's try to summarize what we've learned in this section of the course. So we talked about the solid design principles. So it's a good place to summarize them. First of all, we looked at the single responsibility principle. Basically this idea that a class should only have one reason to change. And it's also related to something called separation of concerns in that if you have a system which is handling different kinds of concerns, it makes sense to put them in different classes so that these can be refactored independently for example, or replaced by something else. Now, the next principle we looked at is the open-close principle. That's where we looked at the specification pattern. And we talked about this idea that classes should be open for extension and closed for modification. So essentially, the idea here 
is that if you are coming back into an already written, already tested class and modifying things in order to extend functionality, this is probably not the best way to go and you should consider using the object-oriented paradigm and inheritance instead of just modifying existing code. And then we looked at the Liskov substitution principle, the idea that you should always be able to substitute a base type for a subtype. And we looked at the situation where the violation of this principle leads to rather unpleasant results. Then we talked about the interface segregation principle, the idea that you shouldn't be putting too much into an interface. In the case of Swift, that's a protocol that you shouldn't be overloading. And you should split a protocol into separate protocols or separate interfaces. And uh, thereby, you don't force the implementer to put lots of stubs and throwing exceptions out of not implemented methods. So this is also related to something called Yagni, which is this idea of you ain't going to need it, meaning that uh, you are not going to need certain methods implemented, so why force other people to implement uh, the interface in the first place. Now finally we looked at the dependency inversion principle, nothing to do with dependency injection, basically this idea that high level modules should not depend on low level ones, that you should abstractions instead and have everything done through abstractions and we looked at how code can be refactored to do exactly that. Before we get to the design patterns themselves, there is just one more piece of housekeeping that I wanted to mention, and that is to do with the so-called gamma categorization. So typically in design pattern literature, regardless of which language of design patterns we're talking about, we are splitting all the design patterns into several different categories. Now these categories are often called gamma categorization, and this is a name that comes after Eric Gamma, who happens to be one of the authors of the original Gang of Four book, the book that you uses C++ and Smalltalk. So uh, first of all you have creation of patterns. Now these patterns as the name suggests they are dealing with the creation or construction of objects. Now you might think that a construction of an object is quite simply invoking the constructor but in actual fact things are quite often a bit more complicated. So sure you have explicit creation. That's when you call the constructor, you provide a few arguments, and you get your initialized object. But there are always situations where the creation of an object is actually implicit. So for example, you might be using a dependency injection framework, or you might be using reflection or some other mechanism which actually creates the object behind the scenes. That's also creation, but it's not explicit creation in the sense of you calling a constructor to initialize something. So that's worth mentioning. And in addition, there are different uh, processes for actually initializing the objects before they are ready to use. So sometimes you'll have wholesale creation of an object, meaning that a single statement like a single constructor call is actually sufficient to initialize the object. But in certain situations, initialization itself is a complicated process. And this is where we get the so-called piecewise or step-by-step -step initialization. That's when you need to have several statements or several steps that need to be taken before an object is actually initialized and ready to use. So after the creation of patterns, we're going to see the uh, second category, which is structural patterns. Now, as the name suggests, it's mainly concerned with the structure of the classes that are involved here. So it's concerned with class members, it's concerned with things like the class adhering to some interface or other. Uh, so what we're going to see here is we're going to see, for example, many patterns which are wrappers which mimic the underlying interface. So you have a wrapper around the class and that wrapper tries to mimic as much as possible the underlying class, the class that it's actually wrapping. So this is an example of a uh, structural approach here. And uh, structural design patterns generally put uh, extra weight on the importance of good API design. And par uh, some of the patterns are actually all about this idea of replicating the interface as much as possible or making the interface as convenient to use as possible. So in studying structural patterns, you're going to see some uh, good applications of just good API design that makes objects usable and makes APIs usable for other people. Finally, we're going to take a look at behavioral design patterns. Now, unlike the creational patterns and structural patterns, behavioral patterns don't really follow any central theme. They're all different. They're all doing their own thing. There is some overlap here and there. So for example, the strategy and the template method design patterns, they're kind of doing the same thing, but they're doing it using completely different object-oriented mechanisms. So there's going to be some overlap here and there, but generally, 
actually most of the behavioral design patterns are unique in their approach, meaning that they solve a particular problem, they solve it in a particular way, they have a particular set of concerns, and so we're going to cover all of them as well. So these are the three categories of patterns that we're going to see as part of this course. All right, so we're going to discuss the builder pattern next. And uh, first of all, what is the motivation for using the builder design pattern? Well, we know that some objects that we work with are typically quite simple to create, and they can be created in a single initializer call. You just call it and you're done. That's it, basically. But we sometimes encounter more complicated objects, which do require a lot of ceremony to create, which means that you have to build up the object in stages, and it takes a lot of time. And you might be tempted to create a very large initializer but to be honest having an object with let's say 10 different initializer arguments is really not productive so instead what we do is we opt for piecewise construction so instead of getting the entire object initialized with one very massive call to an initializer what happens is you call different methods of a special component called a builder which actually allows you to do that so essentially the builder is a component which provides an api for constructing the object step by step. So here is the formal definition of a builder. So when piecewise object construction is complicated, the builder actually provides an API for doing it succinctly. And we're going to see how exactly that is done in the next lesson. So the builder design pattern, why do we need it? Why do we need to bother with it? Well, the builder is required when you have some sort of complicated construction of objects. So not just constructing an object in a single statement, but actually taking several statements to construct something. So let me try to kind of ease you into this idea of con piecewise construction by looking at constructing HTML elements. So let's begin with something simple. Let's suppose you want to construct a paragraph out of uh, a, a chunk of text. So we're gonna have a chunk of text and you want to construct an HTML paragraph because maybe you have a web server which is serving this stuff or maybe you're just generating web pages. doesn't really matter. So what do you do? Well, you make a uh, list. Uh, so you can make a list where you have the opening paragraph tag, then you put in the text, then you have the closing paragraph tag, and then you can print the whole thing. So we can print, uh, we can join all the parts together and just print it like so, and we get fairly predictable output. Uh, this construction of the paragraph is rather easy. It took us, well, two lines. You can stick hello in place of text, and that would make it one line. You could make it a single string, but this is a very simple scenario. Let's suppose that you have a more complicated scenario. Let's suppose that you're given a bunch of words, and you want to make an HTML list out of those words. So we have a bunch of words like... Uh, hello and world, and sorry about the cliche here, and you once again build up the parts. So this time around it's a bit more complicated because you have to have the opening tag, unordered list, like so, and then for W in words you have to append every single one of them, so parts.append, and here uh, we can add list item, W, and then closing tag as well and then the closing unordered list so parts.append uh, closing unordered list and once again we can print this all this time around I'll use the new line as a separator so we can print backslash n dot join parts okay there we go you can see that the output is all nice and formatted and whatever but things are a bit more complicated now because in order to manufacture a list you had to have five lines of code written and those five lines they have to pretty much follow a particular sequence so for example uh, you don't really want somebody to forget to close this tag so if we forget this part we would get some invalid html the same goes for the list item if somebody writes li they better close it now i know websites work just fine even if you forget the list tag but you really want to close it anyway so how can we actually enforce all of this well uh, what we need to do really is we need to outsource the process of constructing different 
chunks of HTML, not necessarily paragraphs or lists, anything, virtually anything made of HTML, we can outsource it to a builder. But it sure makes life easier if we were working with an object-oriented structure, meaning a structure where each of the HTML elements is actually represented by a class of some kind. So let's do exactly that. So I'm going to define a class called HTML element. These elements are going to be nicely indented. I'll define indent size uh, to be two spaces for the purposes of our demo. Each of the elements will have some sort of initializer. So when you have an HTML element, it might have a name. Uh, well, in most cases, it has a name and uh, it might have some text as well. But I'll leave blanks here just so that you can omit it and initialize it later on. I'm going to just uh, initialize both of these. But of course, uh, each HTML element can also have any number of children. So it can have any number of inner elements within it, like a list item, for example, can have a paragraph in it. There is no problem in doing that. So we'll have self.elements equals empty list. And this is the list that you can populate. OK. so. Uh, the key aspect of an HTML element, in addition to actually storing all of this information, is to be able to print itself. But of course, to print itself means printing all of the inner elements, if there are any. And this is a recursive operation. So rather than me typing out a huge chunk of code, let me actually show you uh, what it would look like. So effectively, I'm defining uh, the typical str method here. But I am uh, calling an internal, shall we say, str with uh, this value 0, which is the indentation. And so we get the indentation right regardless of how many levels of nesting we have in our HTML structures. So uh, this is just a helper which helps us model HTML elements. But what about the builder? Because we're here to, gathered here today to discuss the builder pattern. So what about that? OK. So the idea is that uh, once you have an object-oriented structure, which is recursive and which can actually store the HTML elements, you can make a builder. And this is a special construct which is going to take uh, an element, an HTML element, and it's actually going to build it up. It's going to kind of uh, construct it and uh, effectively you know, help you build up an element from scratch using a particular API. So let's define uh, the uh, initializer for uh, the element. I'll have a root name as the name of the top level HTML element. And what we're going to do is we're going to store it. But in addition, we have to have an instance of uh, the element that we're actually building. So uh, in this case, what I can do is I can, for example, say that self, let's have two underscores, underscore, underscore uh, root equals uh, HTML element. So this is the element that we're actually going to build up. And then we can, of course, define the name. So we can say name equals root name. There we go. OK, uh, so far so good. Uh, in the sense that we have defined uh, what we're actually building up. So root is the thing that we're building up. I put in two underscores in front of it so that people wouldn't access it directly. But of course, at some point, you would have to access it. So the question is, well, how do you expose the object you're building up? Well, in my case, I can do it like this. I can define str. And that's just going to return a string representation of self dot underscore underscore root like this. So that will uh, work just fine. Uh, that should be no problem. OK, so uh, moving on, what about some sort of APIs for actually building up uh, the element that we're working with? So I can have a method called addChild, and this method is going to help us add a child to the current root uh, with a particular name, so child name and the particular text. There we go. So the implementation is fairly simple. We simply take the root, we grab its elements, and we append. So what do we append? We append a new HTML element uh, with child name and child text as the arguments. OK, so actually, I don't think we need this name here. We can just leave it as root underscore name like so. So uh, having said all of this up, we can now start using the builder and build up some of the structures that we kind of looked at previously. So. 
For example, I can say builder equals HTML builder uh, with a root tag of unordered list, for example, and then I can add a bunch of elements. I can say builder dot add child, and here I can specify a list item uh, with the text hello. I can duplicate this, have a list item with the uh, world in here, and we can print it out. So I'm going to just print ordinary builder and then uh, print uh, the builder itself. So when I print the builder, of course, what happens is you call str, and this calls the str on the root, which in turn gets us uh, here and effectively uses this method here. So this is the setup, and we can actually try running it and seeing what we get. So as you can see, we're getting pretty much the output that we wanted. We have an unordered list with two list items, and everything is nicely formatted and indented and whatever. It's all very beautiful. So this is how you construct a builder. So in this case, uh, we have an HTML builder, which is a dedicated component to building up uh, the different... Uh, uh, the different HTML elements. Now we can make it uh, somewhat nicer by making a fluent interface. A fluent interface is very similar to an ordinary interface except you can chain it. You can have two add child calls one after another. Now the, the way it's done is very simple. Uh, let me show you. So we're going to have add child fluent. In actual fact let's just duplicate this. It's going to duplicate this and uh, put it here. So the only difference to add child, say fluent here, is at the end you return self. Now what this allows you to do is it allows you to basically chain the invocations one after another. So let me show you. You can say builder add child fluent list item hello and then you can put a dot here and you can say add child fluent once again and you can have uh, the second element. Of course you might want a line break here but uh, list item uh, world like so. If I run this the output is pretty much the same. We haven't really changed anything. We're just, uh, we're just allowing somebody to call several methods one after another by doing this return self which is a, a very small insignificant trick. So uh, a few embellishments that we can put on top of this is uh, for example having some sort of static method which allows us to start working with an HTML element because your client might see an HTML element with this uh, weird looking constructor and they might think well hold on what do I do with this? How do I get started with this? So what you can do is you can expose the builder right from the element itself. Now some of you might say, well hold on, isn't this breaking the open-close principle? And in some way it is, but you have to realize that there is a bit of entanglement between an element and its builder. They are connected. So unless you actually physically split them into separate, uh, separate applications, for example, separate parts of the system, there is no problem in having some sort of uh, static method here which is called maybe create which takes a name and simply uh, returns an HTML builder initialized with this name. Now what this gives us is it gives us an alternative as to how we can get started with using a builder. So instead of saying uh, builder equals HTML builder what you would say here is you would say HTML element dot create and then you would put the UL in here and the end result as you can see is pretty much the same. So this is how you can construct a builder. So now we're going to take a look at a complication of the builder design pattern. And this complication arises from the fact that sometimes you have an object that is so complicated to build that you need more than one builder to do it. So the question is, how can you get several builders participating in the buildup of an object? And how, how can you actually make a nice fluent interface so you can jump from one builder to another? Well, surprisingly enough, this is possible. And we're going to take a look at how to do it now. So uh, the object that we're going to build building up is a person. And let's suppose that a person has two different aspects. So one aspect will be 
their address and the other aspect will be their employment information. I'm just going to initialize those attributes with nothingness basically because we're going to be building them up using builders. So here I'll have a street address, uh, I'll have a postcode, I'll have, um, should be a capital N, I'll have city. So this is uh, the address information. And an additional part would be employment information. So you might have company name, you might have position, and maybe annual income. Uh, now I'm, I'm initializing them to none. I could be initializing them to like zeros and empty strings. It doesn't really matter. Now what we want to do is we want to be able to print this person out once it's initialized. So here I would uh, define str and in actual fact what I'm going to do I'm just going to paste in a chunk of code which prints the information about the person because it's just too much typing. So here we are this is going to print both the address as well as where a person is employed. So uh, what we want to uh, discuss here is the idea of having two separate builders one for the job information and the other for the uh, address. How can we set it all up? Well, in order to have these two builders, we're also going to have a third builder, let's call it a person builder, which is going to serve as a base class. So essentially the idea here is as follows. We initialize a person builder, and then we do a little trick. So we have an argument here uh, called person. Now this parameter is going to represent the person that's actually being built up. However, if you call this builder, if you call this constructor by itself, then what we want to do is we want to initialize it with a blank person object that we can subsequently build up. And then we can store it somewhere, so we can say self person equals person. But this trick that I did up here is actually very important. It's something that's going to allow the sub builders to work with an object that's already constructed rather than creating new persons whenever you want to customize something. We don't want any extra replication and initialization invocation. Okay, so we have uh, this builder here. We may as well define some sort of build method which is actually going to expose this uh, person. So we return self.person when we are done uh, with the building and now we can confine uh, we can define rather the sub builders so we want to have two sub builders we want a sub builder for the employment information and another one for the address so what does a sub builder look like well it's a class let's have person job builder and it's a class that inherits from person builder surprisingly enough and this is hopefully uh, making more clear why we have the constructor like this because now what we can do is we can uh, define the initializer but we no longer want this part we no longer want to initialize it with a default instance of person because we are going to pass in a person that we are already working on don't worry we'll do this in a moment so the person job builder builds up various employment information for example you can say that a person works at a particular company so you can say def at and here you can provide the company name and uh, the assignment is fairly simple. You say self.person.companyName equals company name and then you return self making it a fluent interface. And so working with a person job builder you can add additional uh, methods for setting for example the position or how much a person earns. So here we can say that we've got a person that works at a particular company as an engineer whatever earning so many thousands a month or a year or whatever. So this is the setup for person job builder. Now the question is how does the client actually use the person job builder and here comes a nice trick that we can do. We can make a property, uh, define a property called works. So a property called works is going to return a person job builder and notice the argument here. The argument is self.person. So hopefully it's clear to you now why we have this very curious definition here. So when you're working with a person builder, that means you're starting out 
in the process of building up a person. So you need to initialize it to a blank slate, a blank person that has nothing in it. However, as you go ahead and you work with the sub builders using the Fluent interface, what happens is you need to provide an instance that's already been constructed, not a brand new instance, which is why you provide self.person, which in turn goes in here, which in turn causes this super call, which gets us back to here. So a person has been provided. We do not construct a blank person. We simply use the one that's been provided for us. So this is very convenient. And this is what a job builder looks like. Now, in addition to this, we can define an address builder. So let me just uh, cut and paste one of those in. So I'll stick it in here. And uh, the address builder is also very similar. It also inherits from person builder. It also propagates the init call and it can tell you that the person lives at a particular street address with the postcode and in the particular city. Uh, once again, we need to expose it from uh, person builder here. So we can make another property uh, called lives which once again is going to return a person address builder this time providing self.person as before. So we've now constructed an interface where you can use two builders, person job builder and person address builder interchangeably through a common API because they both inherit from person builder. So both of these builders have a works property and a lives property that you can use to jump from one to another. So let me show you how everything can be put together. Okay, so you make a person builder and you could expose it through a static property inside person itself if you wanted to, but that's not critical to this example. And then we say person equals. So we start with person builder and then I'm going to do a couple of line breaks here just so you can see the beauty of it. So let's do a line break. So first of all, I say that the person lives. Notice that this is the use of a property and now we jump into a person address builder. So I can do it like this and I can say the person lives at 123 London Road. I can also say that uh, they live uh, in city uh, of London. And I can say with postcode uh, SW12BC, for example. So now at any point, I can jump from uh, the uh, person address builder to the person job builder just by using the property works. So I can say dot works and now I'm using a different sub builder. So a person works at Fabricam. Uh, they might work as an engineer and they might be earning, let's not forget a dot here, earning let's say 123,000. So having made this object using the two sub builders, uh, we can now say dot build. And this builds us a person that we can work with and we can actually print uh, the person like so. So as I run this, you can see that we get the correct output. We get address 123 London Road, SW12BC, London, and then maybe there should be a line break here, but you can see that it's working just fine. So coming back to the code, the idea of sub builders, if you want to expose them, is you can give them a base class, person builder in this case, and the base class can have a very nice fluent interface from jumping from one builder to another which is very convenient. So one of the things that you might have noticed as we looked at the uh, builder facets and the idea of combining builders is that we were directly violating the open close principle because whenever you have a new sub builder, you have to add it to the red builder. So there is an alternative approach to this entire story and the approach is to simply use inheritance. So whenever you need to build up additional information, you inherit from a builder that you've already got. So let me show you a scenario of how it would work. Let's say that we have a class called person. Now this time around, I'm going to keep it fairly simple. So we'll have uh, some sort of initializer. I'll set the name to none. I'll set the position to none and uh, say date of birth to none as well. So let's suppose that as we're working with this person, uh, you want to uh, 
add additional builders which customize more and more of the object as you go along. So maybe you're designing the builders and you're adding new builders on top of that. Now, first of all, as always, I want to define str so that I can actually uh, print the object. So we'll say self name uh, born on self date of birth. And uh, uh, then let's just uh, stick in uh, plus here. So works at uh, or works as self position something to that effect. So we have a string representation and what we can do is we can actually start using all of this and this time round I'm going to actually uh, have a some sort of a static method for actually starting up the whole builder thing. So we're gonna have a static method uh, called new just new without the underscores so uh, new where I'm going to return a person builder now a person builder, let's suppose that to start with, we have a person builder which just just initializes the person and uh, can return that person. So I would have a class called person builder, uh, which would do nothing more than just uh, initialize a person like so. So we initialize whatever the person is and we have some build method uh, where uh, we return self person like so. Okay, so now we can have any number of builders which initialize different aspects of person and they do this through inheritance. So for example, I can have a person info builder uh, which inherits from person builder. And here I can have a method uh, called where you can provide the name of the person. And here we do the same fare as we did in the sub builders. So we essentially assign the person's name to the name provided and we return self. So we make a fluent interface. Now what we can do is we can use inheritance to now inherit from person info builder to make let's say a person job builder and we can continue this idea to infinity. So let me show you a couple of more uh, derived classes. So the idea is that as you kind of expand your model, if you do need additional builder steps, then you can simply use inheritance to add them all together. So we have a person builder, which by itself does nothing more than simply build the object by returning whatever is being built up. Then we have person info builder, which is an inheritor of person builder, which has a called method. We have person job builder, which inherits from person info builder. We have person a birthday builder which inherits from person job builder and they can all participate in this idea of building up the object as we go along. So essentially what I can do is I can now make the most derived builder that I have a person birth date builder for example and I can say pb equals uh, person birth date builder like so and I can use this builder to actually build up some information about a person so I can say me equals pb and then we can start calling all sorts of uh, interface members that we've defined so uh, for example we can have a uh, person called Dimitri that works, that's, works uh, as a quant uh, born and let's not forget the uh, line breaks here. So born 1-1-1980, not my real date of birth, by the way. And then we can build the whole thing. So now if I print me, let me actually run this. And as you can see, we get the correct output. So the takeaway from this example is that you can use uh, builders as inheritors of other builders and you can do it to infinity and this kind of solves the problem of your original builder the root builder depending on, upon the sub builders as we looked in the previous example because in the ideal scenario you would never have to go back into a person builder and modify it or indeed you would never go back into a person info builder or person job builder they are okay as they are if you want to have additional builders then you use inheritance and this is strictly in line with the open close principle because every single one of these builders is open for extension through uh, inheritance but closed for modification which is what we wanted in the first place.
All right, let's summarize what we've learned about the builder design pattern. So we saw that the builder is a separate component which is used for building up an object and you can either give the builder itself an initializer to begin with or you can return the builder via some sort of static function Either way is fine so long as you get the builder and you get uh, working with it. Now you can also make a fluent builder to make the initialization even more succinct. And this is done by returning self from every single method of the builder. That way you can chain the method calls together and it all looks even nicer. And we also saw a more complicated implementation where we looked at how different facets or different aspects of an object can be built up using different builders which are working in tandem through a base class. So this particular neat trick allows you to separate the builder even if even the builder is getting too complicated for you. In this section of the course we're going to talk about factories. This section of the course is actually a fusion of two different design patterns that we're going to consider, which are the factory method and the abstract factory. So what are we going to see? Uh, why do we need factories in the first place? Well, sometimes your object creation logic becomes a bit too convoluted. So certainly if you've got a simple initializer, there's really nothing to worry about. But sometimes the initializer gets longer and longer and more sophisticated, and you might want to somehow move this logic somewhere. Now the initializer itself as a method is not a particularly descriptive method because its name is always in it. You cannot rename it so as to give people hints as to what it actually does. You cannot overload the initializer with different sets of arguments like same arguments with different names. You have uh, generally a potential for turning an initializer into some kind of optional parameter hell as you add more and more arguments and you realize that some of those might be optional some of those have default values that you want to apply there might also be convoluted logic in terms of how the different uh, arguments interact with one another and so you might want to somehow organize all of this so we're talking here about wholesale object creation. We're talking about a single statement that would create an object as opposed to the builder pattern where you would actually perform several different steps in order to initialize something. So just like with the builder, what you're doing is you're doing some sort of outsourcing. So you're outsourcing the process of the creation of an object provided it's complicated enough to a design pattern that you choose. So there are different variations here. First of all, you can create separate methods, typically static methods, and that is the factory method design pattern that we're going to look at. Uh, then you might also want to take this whole idea and just move it to a separate class, in which case you get what we typically call a factory. So if you have a class called foo, then you would have a foo factory, which is in charge of manufacturing different types of foo objects. And finally, what you can end up with is you can end up with a hierarchy of factories corresponding to a hierarchy of your own types and this takes us to the abstract factory design pattern. So uh, what is a factory generally? Well a factory is quite simply a component that is responsible solely for the wholesale as opposed to piecewise creation of objects. All right, so the first implementation, shall we say, of the whole factories paradigm that we're going to take a look at is called the factory method. Now, uh, here is a scenario that's very simple. Let's suppose you have a class called point. So you want to initialize points. And to begin with, you might want to have a very simple kind of initialization where you uh, initialize a point from x and y. So you say self.x equals x and self dot y equals y. Now, if you were to just stay with uh, Cartesian coordinates, everything would be fine. But let's imagine that you also want to add support for initializing this point, and this is a Cartesian point. But imagine you want to initialize it from polar coordinates. So one thing you could try writing is something like the following. You could try writing in it and then uh, writing uh, rho and theta and performing the conversion here. Unfortunately, this is impossible. <laughs> this is impossible because you've just redeclared in it 
and uh, that's just not going to fly. So how can you how can you fix this problem? Well, one problem is to just expand the constructor, just change the initializer so that you can actually initialize the point using either coordinate system. But this uh, this requires you to make quite a lot of changes. So first of all, you have to introduce some sort of uh, indicator for which coordinate system you want. So you might want to say, for example, coordinate system uh, enum, using an enum for this, and you define the coordinate system. So Cartesian at polar, and then, of course, you can no longer take X and Y. You have to give them names which do not hint at which coordinate system you're using. So you call them A and B. But you also need the third argument, which defines which system you're actually using. So here you would say system, and you can initialize it with coordinate system Cartesian, for example. So uh, this initialization gets removed, and we do it differently. So if we say if system uh, is equal to uh, coordinate system dot Cartesian, then we do self x equals x and uh, or a rather. Notice I try to type x. There is no x. Self uh, y equals b. Otherwise, what we do is we perform the actual coordinate conversion. So if system is equal to coordinate system dot polar, uh, let's try this again polar like so, then what we do is we perform the conversion. So we say self x equals a multiplied by sine b. And for that, we need the uh, math stuff. So uh, for math, import everything. And the same goes for uh, y. Self y equals b a times cosine of b, something like that. So um, Actually, it could be the other way around. X is the uh, cause and Y is the sign, but it doesn't really matter. I'm just demonstrating things. So we have a scenario which is particularly painful. It's particularly painful because imagine you introduce another coordinate system. What you would have to do is you would have to change the enum here. So you would have to have another member of the enum. But in addition, you would also have to have another uh, check inside the constructor kind of breaks the open close principle in a way and in any case what's happening it's not so much the open close principle that's the problem is the fact that these things are called a and b that you have to somehow figure out that a maps to x and b maps to y when you're doing uh, Cartesian for example so it's all very inconvenient which is why instead of using the initializer we do something different so we sort of uh, comment out the initializer we decide that we're not going to use it instead what we do is uh, we uh, make uh, factory methods. And factory methods allow us to be explicit about what kind of point we're initializing, wh whether we're initializing from Cartesian coordinates or from polar coordinates. So what I can do is I can, uh, first of all, uh, have just an ordinary initializer which uh, uh, initializes the x and y value. So we can sort of go back to the original in a way. We can go back to the situation where we, we had um, uh, the initializer with x and y, uh, where we say self x equals x and uh, self y equals y, or we could, for example, get rid of them and uh, initialize both of these to zero, for example, to subsequently be customized. It doesn't really matter. The point is that we're going to provide the client a new API for actually creating points. So for a new Cartesian point, you can have a static method defined as follows. You can have new Cartesian point uh, which takes x and y, and obviously here you return a point which just uh, initializes those things with x and y, or alternatively you could have a factory method uh, which uh, makes a point from polar coordinates. So let's call this new polar point. It's not actually a polar point, it's still a Cartesian point, just gets initialized differently. And here we specify rho and theta. Notice that it's a lot more understandable what's going on because we explicitly say that this is a polar initialization. The naming of the arguments here is correct. It's not A and B. It's actually rho and theta, which is very useful for somebody trying to understand how these map to uh, to a point. So here we uh, return new point uh, with rho uh, cos theta and rho sine theta. Sorry, that should not be a new here, a wrong programming language. And uh, that's pretty much it. So let me just show you how you would consume this whole thing. So instead of uh, 
instead of just, I mean, you still have an option of having a Cartesian point. So you can say p equals point uh, 2 comma 3, because remember, we left this initializer. And uh, since Python doesn't have uh, private initializers or private anything properly, there's no way for us to shield whoever's using it from uh, using uh, this approach. But in addition, what they can do is they can use the factory methods. So here I can say p2 equals point dot new uh, polar point, for example. And here I can say that uh, we're going to have values of 1 and uh, 2, for example, for the initialization. And uh, well, we can uh, we could certainly print these if we wanted to. Let's actually define str here just so that this demo is complete. So I'm going to um, uh, return x self x and y self y. So now coming back here, we can print uh, p and p2. Let's let's actually run this. Let's see what we get. So as you can see, uh, the ordinary Cartesian initializer stuff is is okay, but but this uh, this thing is also fine in the sense that the conversion has happened and we did the right thing here. So uh, the kind of uh, modern naming, if you will, the modern uh, explanation of what a factory method is, it's typically any method uh, which creates an object. That's it. So um, what I recommend is you don't try to read too much into uh, some sort of special meanings that factory methods typically have. So a factory method is an alternative to initializer that has uh, lots of advantages. So for example, uh, you can uh, you have good naming, so you have uh, a better name than in it. You have new Cartesian point. It tells you what's going on. You have better naming for the arguments because you can name them whatever you want, obviously. And generally, it's just a, a convenient way of uh, creating objects when it's not exactly obvious how to create them because otherwise what you end up with is you end up with massive constructors. So once again, this is kind of like God object, but uh, for initializes you end up with an initializer that takes like 10 arguments and you have to be really explicit in the documentation about how these arguments can be assigned and whatnot you don't really want this instead you want these tiny little static methods that just initialize the object for you All right, so now that we looked at factory methods, it's time for us to discuss the concept of a factory. So a factory is essentially this implementation of the idea of the single responsibility principle or the separation of concerns. And that is the idea that once you get too many factory methods inside a class, it might make sense to actually move them out of the class or at least to try and group them somehow into a separate entity. And of course, in the context of object-oriented programming languages, that entity is in most cases a class. So what we can do is we can make a class called point factory and now all the factory methods that we made in the previous demo that would be new Cartesian point and new polar point they are now members of this class. So instead of using a point you might be using a point factory. So that's pretty much all there is to actually making a factory for your object. And so now you have this relationship between point and point factory in the sense that, for example, if the uh, point initializer changes, then all of a sudden you have to change all of these. And there isn't really much you can do about it because uh, you are dependent upon this kind of setup. Now, certainly what you can do is you can try and uh, wiggle out of this somehow. So for example, we can uh, we can set default parameters here and then we can say that well we don't really care about uh, the way the point is constructed just so long as you can feed it uh, no arguments whatsoever here we can say p equals point and then they can say p dot x equals x and p dot y equals y and then uh, return point so this is uh, uh, this is a way of getting away from this idea of depending on this one particular initializer, but it's not a critical uh, issue here because however you look at it, there is an intrinsic relationship between the factory and uh, the object that is actually getting constructed. So one question 
uh, with all of this is discoverability. How does the client know that there is now a factory that they can use? And the answer is, well, they really don't in the sense that so long as you have an initializer here with X and Y, people are going to think, well, that's all that I'm given. Therefore, if I need to initialize from polar coordinates, I'm just going to do it myself, basically. That's uh, not... Uh, uh, not the most desirable approach, but the only thing you can do about it really is you can uh, specify in the documentation that there is a point factory that somebody could be using. So uh, another thing in addition to having a point factory as a separate class is you can stick it as an inner class. Now this is typically done in other programming languages such as C Sharp or Java, for example, and not so much in Python. There, there's really no need to do it because all, uh, the whatever you do, the uh, con the initializer is always going to be public. There is no way to make it private, but it's still a possibility. So what you can do is you can uh, grab the entire point factory class and just press tab, and by virtue of magic, you can see that we've sort of moved it uh, to an inner class. So now point factory is inside point, and you can. Uh, you can do it, uh, you can use it now like this, point dot point factory, like so. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, it doesn't really matter whether these uh, factory methods are static or not anymore. Uh, certainly when we were uh, just, when they were factory methods of point, it was important, but now you can just get rid of this altogether, and it doesn't really change the way that uh, the uh, whole thing behaves. The only difference is that now you need to add self here, and obviously need uh, self here, but apart from that everything continues to operate. Notice I don't need to make any changes down here because everything is functioning as before. Now why would you want to do this? Why would you want to have them not static? Well uh, the only reason is if your factory also stores some state. So for example let's suppose that due to the wandering geomagnetic pole you need to bias uh, the uh, uh, bias the values on uh, the point. Maybe you want to have separate factories, you want to have a point factory which operates normally and a point factory which has a bias value that gets added whenever you initialize from polar for example. So in this case yeah you would not be able to have these factory methods static because you would also need to uh, use some uh, non-static elements in here in order to actually uh, perform the calculations. Um, now final thing that I want to show you is that you can also take this uh, point factory and you can make an instance of it. So for example if you don't want to uh, make these static but you do want point factory to act in a static fashion what you can do is you can write something like the following factory equals point factory. So now what you can do is you can access the factory by saying point dot factory dot new polar point. So in this case we're referencing factory which is uh, effectively a singleton instance of sorts of a point factory. I mean you can create additional point factories if you need to but it's a singleton in the sense that a point has one single static factory that is simply available for you to use. So this is just a convenience uh, member that, that you can use to uh, to operate on the factory. But the main takeaway from all of this is that a factory is just a separate entity. It's typically a separate class. However, what you need to realize from the perspective of terminology is uh, sometimes we refer, uh, when we call something a factory, we can refer to anything that manufactures objects. So for example, if you have a lambda, which gets passed into an, uh, as an, as a parameter, a lambda parameter in a uh, method, for example, that uh, parameter can be called a factory if you expect it to actually manufacture some object or, or other. But in most cases, a factory is just a separate class uh, which is full of factory methods, not necessarily static ones, that allow you to create objects. So the final part in our discussion of factories has to go to the abstract factory design pattern. Now when we're talking about abstract, what we're talking about is essentially abstract base classes, however you can make them. So the idea is very simple. If you have a hierarchy of types, then you can have a corresponding hierarchy of factories. And so at some point you would have an abstract factory as a base class of other factories. Yeah, I know, it all sounds cryptic. Let's take a look at how you actually implement this. Let's suppose we want to have a vending machine which makes tea or coffee. So um, let's have a class called hot drink. 
I'll make this an abstract base class. So I'm going to import all the relevant bits. And we're going to have a method called consume, uh, which is where you actually consume the drink. So now we can make uh, concrete implementations of this class. We can make tea, we can make coffee, that sort of thing. So let's have tea. So first of all, we'll have tea uh, consume. And here I'm going to print, uh, what am I going to print? This tea is delicious, for example. Or we'll have coffee, class coffee, also hot drink, and uh, may as well use the ID generators here. So let's print this coffee is delicious. There we go. Okay, so we now have a hierarchy of different types. We have a base class hot drink and we have some inheritors, tea and coffee. Now let's suppose that the operation of making tea or making coffee is, well, both of these operations are uh, so sophisticated that you need a factory to, I, to actually sort of prepare the drink for you. So in addition to a hierarchy of the actual drinks, we'll have a hierarchy of the factories. So first of all, we'll have a hot drink factory, abstract base class. Uh, so here I'll define a method called prepare, which prepares a certain amount of the drink. And here I'll print uh, the, uh, well, actually for the abstract class, we, we want uh, print anything. We'll just have a pass, but now let's do a tea factory. So we'll have tea factory, which is uh, a hot drink factory, like so. Uh, let's override the appropriate member here. And uh, here I'm going to print that I, uh, I'm making tea. So put in tea bag, boil water, and then um, I want to pour a certain amount uh, of milliliters and enjoy. And of course I have to return something, so I return T. You can put other constructor arguments here if you want to uh, for the initializer, but I'm just going to leave it blank. So then we can have a coffee factory, which is also a hot drink factory. Once again, generate the override. And here I'm going to print something different. So I'm going to uh, grind some beans, boil water, and then uh, I'm going to pour a certain amount, uh, milliliters, and enjoy. There we go. Once again, I'm going to return uh, coffee here. So you can think both. Uh, you can think of prepare as a factory method. I'm just not calling it like make a tea or anything. I'm calling it prepare. So prepare is something that does certain operations. Uh, in order to set up the object and then it returns the object. I'm just simulating them with a print, but typically you could customize, you know, specify various arguments to the coffee initializer, for example. Okay, so we now have a hierarchy of types. We have a hierarchy of factories of those types. So the question is, well, how do we actually make a drink? If, if somebody wants a drink, well, let me show you a very simple scenario, first of all. So a simple scenario might look like the following. So we ask the user what kind of drink they want. So we say entry equals input, uh, what kind of drink would you like? Question mark, we say drink, um, uh, drink equals make drink, uh, entry, and then uh, drink dot consume. So the question is, how would this make drink uh, function look? What would we put in it? Well, a simple ah, a simple implementation. When I learn how to speak again, might look like the following. So make drink type. So the type here is a string, and we can check that string. So if type is equal to t, then what we can do is we can uh, return a t factory dot prepare a certain amount, 200 milliliters. Otherwise, if type is equal to coffee, then return a coffee factory, uh, coffee factory dot uh, prepare, let's say 50 milliliters because you don't need so much coffee. Otherwise, return none. Ta -da. So this would actually work. Let's actually run this to see that it works. So what kind of drink would you like if I want tea? Then put in the tea bag, boil water, pour 200 milliliters, and enjoy. And I'm enjoying, I'm consuming this tea. And the 
tea is delicious. The, the consume happens here, the actual preparation. So the factory methods effectively happen here. So this is a very simple approach. The only thing that's not being leveraged here is this idea of uh, having it abstract. Why, why do we have an abstract base class if we're not really using it? The, at the moment, the only reason why we have an abstract base class is to mandate a particular API to say that whenever you have an inheritor, that inheritor has to have a method called prepare, which takes an amount. That's, that's pretty much the only benefit. Now, what we can do is we can organize things a little better by making a separate component such as a hot drink machine, which is going to actually make use of the different factories and stick them into some sort of collection somewhere. So let's have a class called hot drink machine. Now a hot drink machine is going to obviously have some sort of information about the kind of drink that uh, you can uh, you can actually get from it. And there are different ways of going about this. So, so one way obviously is you would just enumerate the uh, uh, types of drink by hand. So you could have an inner enum class called available drink, which is going to be an enum. And that's going to list uh, uh, coffee. Let's just have it as auto and also have tea, like so. And uh, then you would operate on that. Now, obviously, this approach breaks the open close principle because when you make a new kind of uh, drink and you make a new kind of factory, then suddenly you're in trouble. Suddenly you have to go into this enum and modify it. So you've broken the open close principle, but hey, it's better than nothing. So that's what we're going to uh, be working with. And um, and so let's, let's actually initialize the hot drink machine. Now what we want to do is we want to have uh, some sort of uh, set of factories. We want to have a factory for every single available drink type. So here I'm going to have the factories. In actual fact, there is no real reason to have them as instance members. So I'll just have a static member. I'll say factories equals empty list. And here we can uh, check whether or not it's been initialized. So I'll add another uh, static here, initialized equals false. And then we can say, well, if not initialized, then uh, we set initialized equals true. And we perform the actual initialization of the factories, obviously with a capital T here. Okay, so how can we actually initialize the factories? Well, if we're going with, with this approach of using that enum that we made, we can go through every single member of that enum and create a corresponding factory. So I can say for uh, d in self dot available drink, notice I'm actually going through enum members here. And what I can do is I can first of all, uh, get uh, the name of the drink itself. Now the name is not coffee in uppercase. Only the first letter is capital and the rest is normal. You can see the names here. This is not uppercase, but the enum members are uppercase so I can transform them. And the way I can do this is as follows. So I can take uh, D name at position zero. So that's the first letter. And then I can take uh, a D name uh, from uh, the first uh, letter going forwards and uh, just do lower. So just, just, just get everything lowercase except the first letter. So now I have the name of the actual drink. I can make the factory name. That's uh, fairly obvious. Uh, that's the word, uh, uh, that, that's the name plus the word factory like so. Now what I can do is I can make an instance of that factory. So in order to do this, I can say factory instance uh, equals eval and here I can stick in factory name so I can evaluate the name of the factory just call it with uh, no arguments because I know that all of the factory initializers don't take any arguments so I initialize a factory I now have a factory instance and I can stick it into my list and in actual fact um, let's have a list of tuples let's have a list where uh, you have a tuple of the factory name and the factory instance. So here I can say self.factories.append and I can stick in a tuple which uh, has a name as well as the factory instance. So that's pretty much it. We've now initialized this rather uh, interesting list of factories. And what we can do is we can now uh, have an interactive display like, like you would on a vending machine for actually making a drink. So let's, uh, let's call this one make drink. So the first thing uh, we're going to do is we're going to print the available drinks. So let's uh, print available drinks like so for F in factories. So for every single factory in our list, I can print 
the first uh, the first element of the tuple, which is actually the name of the drink. And then we can ask the user, well, can you tell us which drink you want? Let's actually get an integer. So uh, the integer is going to be as follows. So we'll get uh, the uh, pick. So please pick drink. And the drink is going to go uh, from uh, zero to uh, the, the number of factories minus one. So here, uh, length of uh, self factories uh, minus one. Um, that's uh, where the user actually specifies uh, the, uh, the string. We turn the string into an index uh, like so, and then we have that index. So now you have to specify the amount. So maybe you want to specify whether you want a small drink or a large drink. I'll just ask for the amount. So here, once again, we'll say input specify amount. And then we say amount equals uh, int s, like so. And then we can actually uh, use the factory to make that drink. Here is the where the magic happens. So first of all, uh, we uh, grab the uh, uh, grab the actual factory. So uh, one way to do this is just to eval the factory name. But we actually already have uh, the factory instance in uh, f at one. But of course, we need to find it. Here is the the tricky part. So we so we have to effectively uh, get uh, self factories at uh, the index that we specified, and then uh, get the instance which is at position one, and then we can say uh, prepare a particular amount. So uh, at index one, remember we have a tuple where the first element is the name and the second is the factory instance. So at index one, we have the factory instance, and we say, can you please use that factory to prepare that particular amount. So now we can we can experiment with this. We can actually uh, have an interactive scenario. So I make a hot drinks machine here, um, hot uh, drink machine like so, and just say hdm dot make drink, and this starts the entire interactive process. So let's run the whole thing. So here you can see the uh, output. I forgot the closing round bracket here, but here are the available drinks. So we have coffee and tea. I'm going to pick zero here. Press return. Specify the amount as 50 milliliters, and then here we go. So we actually grab the uh, factory that we had uh, stored in our list. We use it to boil the water to pour 50 milliliters and then enjoy. And uh, from here on out, remember this um, this returns something. So we can effectively consume that drink and do whatever, pour it down the drain if we didn't like it. So that's pretty much it. This is the implementation of the abstract factory design pattern. Now, one thing you once again notice, and this is important, is that uh, there is really no need for uh, the base here. So there is no need for the abstract hot drink factory. In fact, if I comment it out, uh, apart from these things, everything will continue to work. So I can get rid of uh, both of these and everything will continue to work as before. There's absolutely no problem in any of this because essentially uh, Python uses duct typing. So when we make a list here, a list of factories, this list is not typed to a hot drink factory. So everything still continues to work. However, obviously in the kind of uh, strong typing uh, programming languages in literature, you're gonna see the reference to an abstract base class for the factories, uh, which is essential in other languages, but it's kind of optional in Python. Obviously it's a good idea because it then tells you what kind of API you're expected to implement. So that's it for the abstract factory. All right, so let's try to summarize what we've learned about factories. So first of all, we looked at something called factory method, which is a method, typically a static method, that is capable of creating objects. Then we talked about the general idea of a factory as just any entity that can take care of object creation. Typically, when we talk about a factory, we talk about a class, but that's not necessarily the case. For example, if you have a method and that method takes a lambda that creates objects, then you have a factory wrapped as a little anonymous function. We also talked that a factory as a separate class can either be external, so it can reside as a completely separate entity, or you can actually put it as a nested class inside the class which it actually creates. And finally, we looked at hierarchies of factories that can be uh, made to correspond to hierarchies of types and can be used to easily create related objects.
In this section of the course, we're going to talk about the prototype design pattern. So what is the motivation for using the prototype design pattern? Well, if you think about the real world, complicated objects such as cars or iPhones or anything like that, they are typically never designed from scratch. You don't design a car just by starting with a blank sheet of paper and drawing a car. That's really not how it works. Instead, what you do is you reiterate existing designs. You look at what people have already done and you try to improve upon the existing constructs. And the prototype design pattern goes in the same vein because essentially the idea is that you've already got some sort of existing design and you want to simply make a copy of that design, customize it somehow and then start using it. And that design, it can be a fully constructed design that you simply want to change or it can be partially constructed with some pieces missing and then you can add those pieces and manufacture the completed object. So what do we typically do when we uh, want to use a prototype? Well, we make a copy. We take some object and then we copy or clone the prototype and then we customize the resulting instance and give it to the client to consume. So of course, in order for this to work, you need something called deep copy and that is essentially a wholesale copy of the object. We're going to take a look at how this is implemented in Python. And uh, we also want to make cloning convenient. So what we can do is we can, for example, build a prototype factory where you have a few predefined designs and then you ask the factory to customize this design, giving you essentially a custom item. All right, so a prototype is a partially or fully initialized object that you copy or clone and then you subsequently make use of it. All right, so now we're going to take a look at the prototype design pattern. And let me show you the scenario where the prototype might be useful. Let's suppose that we define a class called person. Now class called person, I'm gonna put the initializer in here. We'll just initialize it with some name and some address. And then I will assign both of these. So I'll stick them as attributes like so. And in addition, I'm going to define str so that we can uh, subsequently uh, see what the person is made of. So here I'm going to return uh, self.name lives at self.address. There we go. So up above, uh, let's define the address. So the address is going to be a separate class. We're going to have a class called address. And here, once again, in the initializer, we might specify, uh, let's say, a street address, uh, city and a country, like so. So I will once again just assign all of these like so and I also define str here the fstr so we can print the whole thing so just put self dot street address uh, followed by self city uh, followed by uh, self country there we go okay so uh, let's suppose that we have some person let's call them John and John lives at a particular address so uh, person, the name is John and uh, the address is uh, 123 London Road in London, UK. Okay, so this is John. Now let's suppose, and we can actually print John, uh, just so that you can see how the whole thing works. We can see that John lives at 123 London Road in London, UK. But uh, let's suppose that we want to make additional people. Let's suppose that Jane happens to live in the same uh, in the same place as John, maybe the same exact address, maybe they live together, who knows. So you might be tempted to write something like the following, Jane equals John, and then customize Jane. So say Jane.name equals Jane. However, this is not going to work, and I'll show you why it's not going to work. So if I print Jane, uh, and actually uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, print both John and Jane once again. And maybe uh, just, just uh, uh, a few lines here. Okay, so as I print this, you can see that we now have a problem. And the problem is that both uh, John and Jane, they now refer to the same object. So down below, we see Jane printed twice. So even though we took uh, John's name and changed it to Jane, we changed both objects. 
Now, the reason for this, if we come back to the source code, is because John and Jane, through this assignment, now refer to the same object. It's basically just a reference assignment. So it wasn't really the right way of uh, copying. And that's what we need to do for the prototype pattern. If we want to make it easy to create someone living at this address, then there has to be some other way of doing it. So one way of doing it, of course, would be to say uh, address equals and then uh, set this address and then uh, put the address here. So we put the address here and uh, subsequently this thing is still wrong, by the way. This thing is still wrong. We still need to make a copy, but we could do it like this. We could say Jane equals person Jane and then reuse the address. So this would work. But unfortunately, it would only work in this uh, very simple scenario. So, of course, if I run this now, everything is okay. You can see that John lives at 123 London Road, and so does Jane. However, let's suppose that Jane moves out. Maybe she breaks up with John and decides to live in a flat next door or something. So... Uh, we cannot actually just uh, take Jane and customize her address. What I mean is we cannot say something like Jane dot address dot uh, street address equals 123B London Road. Now, the reason why we cannot do this, and you can see what's happened here, is that a street address is still a reference. So we've assigned the reference uh, to 123 uh, be London Road, and now unfortunately both John and Jane have been moved to 123B. Now let's take a look at why exactly this is happening. This is happening because uh, both John and Jane, they actually refer to the address, so they keep a reference to the address, and there's just a single reference, and they modify this reference here, and so it's modified for both John and Jane. Once again, this isn't what we wanted. So uh, this approach would somewhat work in, in terms of, uh, you know, having a, uh, having a quicker way of assigning the address, but there is a much easier way of uh, getting what we wanted. And it takes us back to uh, basically the question of how do you copy an object so that it doesn't refer to the original object's attributes. And the way this is done is using uh, the copy, uh, copy.deep copy specifically. Copy deep copy, uh, what it does is it basically performs a recursive copy of all of the attributes of an object, uh, thereby making a brand new object that doesn't refer to the original. And that's the critical thing. So we can say uh, after we make person, after we make John, so let's make John again. So John is a person, uh, John, comma, like so. So here is John, and then we'd say Jane equals copy and let me import copy so copy deep copy John and now what we can do is we can take Jane and we can uh, customize this object so it's a, it's a separate object not in any way referring to uh, to John of course so I can say Jane.name equals Jane I can also customize the address if I want I can say Jane.address dot street address equals uh, 124 London Road like so and if we print both uh, John and Jane uh, let's take a look at what we get so um, we should probably do like a line break just so that it's uh, neater so uh, you can see we have John lives at 123 London Road uh, here and Jane lives at 124 London Road so everything is okay so what this example kind of demonstrates is how you would actually go about copying objects if you wanted to use a single object as a prototype and then replicate it. And the problem this design pattern solves is really simple. It's the problem of duplication. If you've made the address once, maybe you don't want to modify the address. Maybe you want to keep reusing that address in other objects. Or maybe you want to keep reusing the London and UK parts but customize the street address part, which once again you can do. So you can make a copy of whatever object you have and that object will in no way refer to the original and then you go ahead and you customize the parts that you want, which is a lot easier than typing out the whole thing, because we could have typed out Jane as, you know, the full person declaration, but it's not essential here. We can simply make a deep copy. And uh, I need to explain what is meant by deep. There is also a copy.copy, .copy which performs a shallow copy. And a shallow copy, if we just run this for a second, let me just 
run this. Okay, so what's happening with the shallow copy is you'll notice that John and Jane have different names, but unfortunately they still have uh, the same address. We've assigned the same address. So what happened here is that even though we customized the name and the name didn't refer to the original, so Jane.name does not refer to John, unfortunately what happens with a shallow copy is any object that's a reference just gets copied over. So in this case it's the address. What happens when we copy John is John's address if in a shallow copy gets copied as a reference and Jane essentially refers to the same address as John. They both refer to one and single address object and that's why you have to use deep copy which performs a proper copy of the address as well. So in the previous lesson we looked at how easy it is to make a deep copy of an object using copy.deepcopy. However, one thing that we didn't mention is that it's quite often inconvenient to keep making those copies manually. For example, if you just have a few predefined prototypes in your entire application, it would be nice to package them into a factory of some kind and then provide factory methods so that nobody has to just take a prototype and perform the deep copy and perform the customization by hand. It's much easier to wrap it into a separate component. So here is the scenario that I want to show you. Basically it's similar to what we had previously. We have an employee which has a name and an address and then we have the address as just a street, city, a street address, a city and the suite number. So the suite number is kind of like the office number. It's basically the exact position where somebody works. So what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to make employees in uh, particular offices in our organization. Now let's suppose that we only have two offices in the company where people can work. So uh, with that in mind we can make an employee factory And what we can do is we can create the prototypes for, let's say, the main office employee as well as the auxiliary office employee. So main office employee equals employee. Uh, so we don't specify the name because it's just a prototype. It's something that's intended to be customized, but we do specify the address. So the address for the main office is 123 East Drive. Now the suite number, that's the second argument, we're going to leave it as zero because we don't know what office the person works at exactly. Well, we know the building, but we don't know the exact uh, suite number. And here we'll specify the city as London. So here we can have another prototype. Let's call this one the auxiliary uh, office employee. And here the only difference is we can change the address to let's say 123B East Drive. So these two static objects are going to be reused in our factory methods. And we're going to make factory methods for creating both a main office employee as well as an auxiliary office employee. So let me show you how this is done. So we're going to have a, a static method. Let's define a method called new main office employee. Now when you make a, an employee you have to specify two things. You have to specify their name as well as the suite number. That's pretty much it. And the same goes by the way for the auxiliary office employee which I can just uh, paste here. So we'll have the uh, auxiliary main office employee and that will be a similar implementation. Now the only difference between new main office employee and auxiliary main office employee is the prototype that they use. So in both cases they have to take some prototype, they make a deep copy of it and then they customize it. So for this we can define a utility method, also a static method that we're going to uh, stick in here. So I'm going to call this one new employee and it takes three arguments. So it takes the prototype that we're going to be using, the name of the person as well as the suite number. So the first thing we need to do is we need to grab that prototype and make a deep copy of it. So I'm going to say result equals copy dot deep copy and uh, stick the prototype in here. And for that we need to import copy obviously. So now we have the result which is a deep copy. So we say result dot name equals name and result dot address dot suite equals suite and then we return the result. 
So this is how you may use a prototype and you customize the prototype as well. And here in the factory methods, what we can do is we can use this uh, new employee static method to actually make things a little bit easier. So here we say uh, return employee factory dot uh, new employee and notice I'm using double underscores here it's clearly a static method that's not intended to be consumed from the outside so the client should be using these two uh, factory methods not the uh, new employee unless of course they build their own prototype in which case it's fine so here we have to specify the prototype that we're going to be using so for the main office employee the prototype is employee factory dot uh, main office employee obviously and here we simply proxy over the name and the suite so we send them over to whoever is interested and uh, the same goes for the implementation of new auxiliary office employees so let's stick this in here the only difference here is the prototype like so and we are done so our factory is complete and we can actually start using it so for example if I want to make John as a main office employee I simply say employee factory dot new uh, main office employee and here I can provide the name John and uh, suite 101 and uh, I can do the same thing for uh, Jane and Jane obviously her name is Jane that's uh, here and she can be in room 500 for example and we can actually run this and well we we need to actually print them somewhere so print John and uh, Jane and let's run this and here is the output so John works at 123 East Drive and Jane works at 123 well she has to be an auxiliary auxiliary office employee so um, new auxiliary there we go so um, something failed interestingly enough uh, let's take a look at what oh yeah the naming so it's new auxiliary there we go okay so finally we are uh, getting the right output so John works at 123 East Drive and Jane works at 123 B East Drive so uh, the takeaway from this example is whenever you have a fixed number of prototypes that you're using in your system what you can do is you can put them into a factory and then create a bunch of factory methods so that the construction of copies of those prototypes is even easier and that's what we've done here in new main office employee and new auxiliary office employee so basically if you want to uh, make a prototype you don't have to do copy.deep copy yourself if you want to copy a prototype you can have a factory method which kind of does it for you so essentially it does it in the new employee method and then it customizes it and that's what actually gets returned so let's try to summarize the things that we've learned about the prototype design pattern so in order to implement the prototype design pattern you basically uh, take a partially constructed object or indeed you can have a fully initialized object and you store it somewhere and then you deep copy the prototype whenever somebody wants to get an instance of it you allow the user to customize the resulting instance or if you are using a factory that's where it will typically be done and factories are generally a good idea because a factory provides a convenient API for actually using uh, the prototypes in your code In this section of the course, we're going to talk about what is probably the most hated design pattern of them all, the singleton. Now, when the authors of the Gang of Four book met a decade later to discuss the design patterns, they noted that when they were discussing which ones to draw up, they decided that they really liked all the design patterns anyway, except maybe the singleton, because as they said, its use is almost always a design smell. Is it really the case? Should we be avoiding the singleton? Well, this is what this section of the course is trying to explore. But first of all, let's talk about the motivation for using the singleton in the first place. So some components in your system, it makes sense for them to only be initialized once. So for example, let's suppose you have a database repository. Let's suppose that you are loading some data from the database at the beginning of the program and you're keeping it while the program runs. The question is, do you really want to do this more than once? Well, it doesn't really make any sense and you might want to prevent people from doing it more than once so that they don't 
waste memory and they don't waste processing time either. Uh, another example would be something like an object factory. Do you really need to instantiate object factories if you can just have one factory full of static methods, for example? It's really up to you, but in most cases it simply does not make sense because an object factory is typically stateless. It does not have any attributes worth assigning. It simply does things through static methods, so it might make sense for it to be a singleton, to be just a single instance. So uh, why would this be a problem? Well, typically it's a problem because the initializer call is expensive. So something happens in the initializer that you only want to do once and you don't want to ever do it again. However, there are situations where your object simply represents a resource and that resource is only available in one instance and you don't want to allow people to have more than one instance of such a resource. So uh, we only want typically to initialize a singleton just once and we don't want anybody to call the initializer more than once, we provide everyone with that same instance of the object that's been initially created. And of course, we have to deal with certain issues like, first of all, we want to prevent anybody from making additional copies of that object because that kind of breaks the whole premise of the singleton. And we might also want to take care of other things, for example, lazy instantiation, this idea that nobody really gets to instantiate the singleton until the singleton is actually needed for something. So you don't just initialize it preventatively at the very beginning. You initialize it only when somebody actually asks for it. So the singleton is quite simply a component and by component we typically mean a class in the Python setting. So it's a class which is instantiated only once and then everybody who tries to access this object basically gets to work with that one instance. So one very simple way of implementing a singleton in Python is by essentially rewriting the allocator. So let me show you how this can work. So let's suppose you have some singleton object, like for example, some database that you only want to load once. What you can do is you can define or redefine rather the allocator. So that would be the new method. And here what you would do is you would basically check whether or not some static instance has already been created. So we make a static instance, I'll stick it here. So instance equals none. So we check whether this instance has been initialized and if not we initialize it with the current object and whatever happens we return that same object. So I say if not uh, cls dot underscore instance this means it hasn't been initialized yet so we say cls underscore instance equals super database cls and then uh, we call new on it. Uh, so essentially we say dot new and here we specify uh, once again the class, the args, and the keyword args. There we go. So this is uh, how you would actually set the instance and then you would return cls dot underscore instance like so. And that's pretty much all that you would need to do to make this singleton by allocator. So essentially we're controlling the allocator here. So what does this give us? Well, it gives us the following situation. It gives us, if I make a database, let's say d1, and I uh, make d2, like so, then if I try to compare them to sort of check whether they refer to the same instance, so d1 is uh, d2, I'm going to get a value of true. So uh, this is may be good enough for some people. But this is only good enough assuming that you actually have nothing in the initializer because as soon as you start sticking things into the initializer, you're going to see problems. You're going to see problems. So for example, if I define the initializer, which by the way is called immediately after new, you're still going to see uh, several objects being initialized. So uh, for example, I can, uh, let's suppose we're loading a database from file. Loading a database from file. There we go. Okay, so I run this and you'll notice that for some reason uh, you're getting two of them instead of just one of them, uh, which is very sad. And uh, this is a byproduct of the fact that uh, init gets called immediately after uh, new whatever happens. So you don't really, you don't have any control of it unless you include some sort of guard in here inside the init to actually um, make sure that it doesn't. So these are 
distinct objects. So just to show you that uh, both of these calls happen from distinct objects, let me try to do it uh, this way. So if I get some ID, random dot random int uh, from one to a hundred, uh, let me actually import random here. Uh, so uh, I can uh, print that random value. So print um, ID equals and then uh, the actual ID. So if I do this, uh, just to kind of demonstrate and uh, what's going on here, uh, one moment, no attribute random int. Oh, okay, it's rounded. There we go. So as you can see, we get two IDs. We get two different IDs. So essentially, this is a kind of halfway approach in the sense that, yeah, it does work. In the end, you do get a reference to the same object, but unfortunately, the initializers still get called, which is probably not what you want. So one way of taking care of this problem of initializers being called is to use a different approach to implementing a singleton. So in this lesson, we're going to take a look at how to build a singleton using a decorator. So I'm going to make a decorator called singleton, uh, which is going to take a class. And what we're going to do is for every single instance uh, that we are asked for every single class, we're just going to keep them in some dictionary. Instances equals empty dictionary. So the point here is you have some sort of get instance method, uh, which takes a bunch of args and a bunch of keyword args. And the idea is that if a class that somebody requested is not in a set of instances, then we're going to add it to the set of instances and then return that, uh, that class that somebody requested. So if uh, the class uh, is not in uh, instances, and I should not have is here. If class not in instances, what we do is we make it. So we say instances at class underscore equals class underscore, and then we just call it with the arguments and the keyword arguments. And then we return it. So return instances at class underscore. So essentially we have a dictionary which basically takes care of uh, whatever object wants to be a singleton. It's just going to store its instance and it's going to return that instance whenever somebody wants to. And this approach uh, obviously prevents the whole uh, initializer double invocation thing. So um, here uh, in the uh, decorator, we return uh, get instance. So that is uh, what we need to return to actually build the decorator. And then we have a class, let's say a class called database. That's the class that we want to make a singleton. Let's just add an initializer so that we can prove that the initializer doesn't get called twice. So here I'll print loading database. Uh, like so, and of course we use the decorator, so we make it uh, singleton, and now we can test this. So now we can uh, basically make d1 equals database and replicate this and make uh, d2 a database, and once again I can, uh, just for the sake of completeness, print d1 equals d2, although uh, as you can probably guess, uh, there's no way that they'll be different. So let's run this. And the key thing here is not just that we're getting true, but also that we're loading the database only once. So the initializer doesn't get called several times, which is what the problem with the previous example was. So one alternative to using a decorator is to use a meta class, which is actually going to have a very similar implementation to a decorator. So let's have a meta class called singleton, which is going to uh, be a meta class of some type over some type. So once again, we have a dictionary of the instances, instances equals a dictionary. I'm using a single underscore here just so that just so that uh, whoever is looking at this knows that it's not intended to be consumed. And then of course we define the call uh, we define the uh, call method here. So we check whether or not the class, and I'll just call this CLS for better naming. So we check whether or not the class is in the set of instances, and if it's not, then we construct it and we, and we subsequently return it. So here I say if uh, CLS not in CLS dot underscore instances. So if we don't have this class yet, then we need to construct it. So CLS instances, um, at CLS 
equals and let's do a super call so super singleton comma cls and then what we can do is we can call uh, the actual uh, call the initializer with the arguments and the keyword arguments like so and then we return the instances so we return cls instances at cls so this is pretty much all there is to it to this meta class and now we can once again try to use it so we have a class database uh, and here we specify the meta class as singleton like so and once again i'll define the initializer so that we can print uh, that we're loading the database and then we can test this once again so i can say d1 equals database uh, i can say d2 equals database and i can print uh, d1 equals d2 so as we run this you can see that loading database only gets invoked once and of course we have the value of true here so this is how you would implement a singleton pattern using a meta class as opposed to a decorator as you can see the approach is almost identical in terms of the uh, the code that we've actually written so this code is very similar to what we had in the uh, decorator in the previous example So one particular variation on the singleton design pattern, which stands apart from the canonical implementations that we looked at, is the monostate implementation. So the monostate is a variation of the singleton where you put all the state of an object into a static variable, but at the same time you allow people to create new objects, thereby uh, making new instances which all access the same thing so let me show you how it can work so let's suppose you have a class called ceo now uh, a typical company has just a single ceo so uh, imagine you are preventing other people from uh, actually making new instances of the ceo so they can call the initializer they can construct a ceo however many times they want but they'll all be referring to the same ceo so the way this is done is you make uh, some shared state uh, which is going to be static so you can have for example the name of the CEO uh, Steve and uh, let's say the age uh, let's say 55 something to that effect uh, then you stick in the initializer here so let's uh, initialize it and here comes the interesting part so what happens when you initialize a CEO is you actually assign your set of attributes so self dict you assign it to the shared state like so so what this means is that whenever you actually construct a ceo whenever you initialize it you're actually uh, always referring to the same set of attributes let's add an str here so self name is self age years old like so and then we can see how this whole thing works so essentially what we can do is we can construct the ceo and uh, construct another ceo and see how they behave so first of all ceo1 ceo1 equals ceo uh, let's print the ceo1 to begin with and then uh, what we can do is we can construct ceo2 uh, we can set uh, the age co2.age equals let's say 77 and then we can print uh, CEO 1 and CEO 2 so let's take a look at what we get here all right so as you can see when we initialize the whole thing we get the default option so Steve is 55 years old and then of course we make CEO 2 but CEO 2 actually has uh, its attributes are referring to the same shared state as CEO1 so whenever you change it with CEO1 or CEO2 you're changing them both because there's just one static uh, shared state that they all share so this is the implementation of the monostate design pattern essentially you keep all the data in a static variable and then uh, whenever you create new objects you just make a copy or uh, rather you make a copy of the reference it's a critical part so you're not just copying the data, you're actually copying the reference to the entire dictionary. Now what we can do is we can sort of package this into a, uh, into a class, a base class in actual fact that we can inherit from there by uh, making this approach a bit more generic. So the way you would do this is as follows, you'd make a class, let's say monostate. Here you would specify some shared state 
as just a dictionary that remains to be initialized. And then uh, you can define uh, the new operation. So here what we can do is we can uh, first of all construct the object, so uh, super monostate CLS, and then we call new on it. So CLS and then args and then uh, keyword args like so and then we copy the dictionary reference so once again we say obj.dict equals cls shared state and then we return the object so now what happens is if we want a monostate implementation of some class that we're making ourselves we can just inherit from this monostate so i can make a class called cfo which inherits from monostate and here what i can do is i can make an initializer so let's put some things in the initializer, let's put in an empty name, and let's put in, well, it's a CFO, so they manage money, so money managed equals zero, and let's also uh, define str once again, so we can print this, so return um, self name, uh, managers, and then um, self money managed uh, with a dollar sign in here. Okay, so we've got the CFO. How do we actually use it? Well, we simply instantiate. We make several copies of it. So coming back to uh, the uh, main, let's get rid of this stuff and let's try out the, the new kind of base class approach, if you will. So CFO1 equals CFO. CFO1 name equals uh, Cheryl and uh, CFO1 money managed equals one and then we can print the CFO CFO one and then we can make another uh, CFO let's say CFO two and there we go so CFO uh, two dot name equals Ruth and then CFO two money managed equals 10 and then we can print uh, both CFO one as well as CFO to let's put uh, a line break uh, between them like so. So let's run this and let's see what we get. So as you can see, uh, to start with, we constructed Cheryl, but then we initialized Ruth and now both CFO1 and CFO2, when we print them, they both uh, refer to Ruth and Ruth manages $10. So the approach isn't actually a practical approach. This isn't something that I would recommend doing or this isn't something that anyone would really recommend doing. It's just too clumsy an approach and the best approach is probably the one where you use either a decorator or a meta class. Okay, so you might have heard from uh, many sources on the internet that the singleton design pattern is bad, that it's evil, that it's an anti-pattern. Even the authors of the original Gang of Four book, when they met a decade later to discuss the design patterns, they said that they would keep every single one except maybe the singleton because its use is almost always a design smell. Well, the, we're actually going to take a look at the problems with the singleton as well as how those problems can be resolved. So uh, here I'm going to be using the meta class implementation of the singleton. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a class called database. So the database is going to contain a number of capitals and their populations. I actually have a separate text file here so you can see that we have capitals like Tokyo and their populations. I didn't know Tokyo had 33 million, but that's uh, what we have. So first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, load up the database. Now, obviously, this is something that you only want to do once. If you're loading the database into memory, you don't want to do it more than once because it's just wasteful. So I'll make a uh, dictionary for keeping the population information. I'm going to open the file, uh, capitals.txt open it for reading. I'm going to grab all the lines, so f.read lines, and then for i in range, so I'm going to jump over the lines with a step of two because it's city population, city population, so for zero to length of lines with a step of two, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say self at self.population at lines i.strip, so I'll use strip so that we can actually get rid of any extra characters in there, and here I'll have uh, conversion to an integer, lines at i plus one, once again, dot strip, so we don't get any white spaces or anything. So um, this is good. 
let's put a uh, backslash here and uh, we can close the file like so. So this is how you actually load up the database. Now let's suppose that you have a high level module which actually uses the database for something. Let's suppose that you have uh, some sort of singleton record finder. So this class is useful for going over the database and for example getting you the total population of several different cities. So here we have total uh, population so you specify the cities you want the sum population for and it gives you the results. So result starts with zero but then for C and cities what you do is you increase the result by uh, database.population at the appropriate city and then you return the result. So as you can see what's happening here is we're using the database uh, explicitly. So we're calling it and every time we call it we get the same instance again and again because of the meta class which by the way we forgot to specify. So meta class equals singleton. There we go. So now it will work. Okay. So let's suppose that you decide to test the singleton record finder. You decide to write some unit tests which actually use the singleton record finder. How do you do it? Well, uh, let's first of all set up the whole unit testing thing. So first of all, I'll have a class called singleton tests, uh, which is going to be a uh, unit test dot test case. So I'm going to need some imports here. And uh, uh, let's first of all write a test to make sure that it is in fact a singleton. So def test is singleton. Uh, so I'm going to make two instances of database db1 and db2 and I'm just going to assert uh, that they're equal db1 and db2. Okay so I'm going to run the tests on the command line so that you can see them. So here in main I'll just say unit test dot main and we can run this. Okay so the test passes we get an okay. So far so good. So what's next? Well next we might want to test that the total population thing actually works. So test singleton total population. Okay so we want to make sure that the total population calculator from the singleton record finder actually works. So we make a record finder. We say singleton record finder. And now the question is, well, what data do we test it with? And unfortunately, at the moment, what's happening with the Singleton Record Finder is it is directly tied to the database. So if we want to run a test on it, we need to take some data from the database and use that data to actually test. So we go into the capitals, we look at two cities, for example, Seoul and Mexico City, and we take their populations, so 17.5 million, 17.4 million, and we make sure that if both of those are fed into the singleton record finder, then the total population is what we expect it to be. So we say names equals uh, Seoul as well as Mexico uh, City, and then we get the total population. So TP equals uh, record finder dot total population of names. And then uh, what do we expect the value to be? Self assert equal. We expect the value to be 17.5 uh, million. So 17.5 uh, 17, uh, million. Got to be careful with the zeros plus 17.4 uh, million. And that's what we expect the value of TP to be. Now this is a reasonably valid test and if we actually run this, let's actually run the whole thing. So now we ran two tests, everything is okay. So obviously this test passes but there is a huge massive problem with this whole approach and the problem is that we're testing on live data. We're testing on a live database. Now, why are we testing on a live database? Well, because the singleton is forcing us to, because here we have database. Here we have a reference to the actual database that is a live database. It could be running in production right now. So obviously this entire approach with a singleton is dangerous. What we need to do is we need to be able to inject this value and we need to be able to replace it so that instead of using values from a live functioning database, which by the way can change because these values can change and then the test is broken. So the test is a very brittle test. But we want to be able to just feed in some dummy values into the uh, dummy database and then use that instead. So how do we do this? Well, we have a better record finder. We have a uh, configurable record finder. So in the initializer, 
uh, for the record finder, you specify what database you want to operate upon, and then uh, you assign it self.db equals db. If you want to, if you want to actually use it in production, here you can say database. So you can say that the uh, default implementation actually uses a live database, but you can override it. It's really up to you how you want to do this. So we basically inject the database into the initializer. And then, of course, when it comes to defining total population, instead of being hardwired to use database here, we just say self.db. That's the only change that you really need to do. What does this give us? Why does this give us an advantage in testability? Well, because now I can make a dummy database. Now what I can say is I can say here is a class called dummy database. And a dummy database has predictable population values. Uh, it has predictable values. So for example, I have alpha uh, with a population of one. I have beta uh, with a population of two. I have, let's say, gamma. Uh, with a population of three, and this is in no way related to a real life database. And then, of course, I can define uh, get population uh, for a given name where you simply return self.population at name. And we can use this dummy database to write better tests because now what I can do is I can say, well, here in my uh, test case, I can say ddb equals dummy database. So now I have a dummy that every single test can work with. And then if I want to perform a uh, total population test, I can do it better. So let's call this one test dependent total population. So instead of using a live database, I can use this configurable record finder, CRF equals configurable record finder. I can feed it the dummy database, DDB here, and then I can perform assertions. So for example, I can assert that if I take alpha and beta, the total population is three. So here, I, uh, my expected value is three, and I can do uh, CRF dot total population with a list uh, containing alpha and beta. Let me unindent this alpha and uh, beta, like so. And uh, that is my expectation. We can actually uh, run this whole thing. And as you can see, all the three tests pass. But this test, the dependent population test, is a vastly superior test because it's not tied up to the singleton in any way. So in this lesson, what I've done is I've highlighted one of the weaknesses of a singleton, that if you take a direct dependency on it, like uh, here, then you are stuck with it. It should be possible to replace this dependency with something else by using, in this case, a value that's injected into the initializer. All right, let's try to summarize some of the things that we've learned about the singleton design pattern. So we looked at different implementations of the singleton design pattern. We looked at the custom allocator, which was a nice idea, but unfortunately still ended up calling the initializer more than once. We looked at using a decorator and using a meta class. I would say that the meta class is probably the nicest implementation that you can go for. Now we, uh, kind of grazed through the process of laziness because in all of our implementations what we did is we just initialized the singleton on the first request so whenever somebody actually called on the object we checked whether or not the instance has been created and if it hasn't been created then that's exactly where we created it so at no point did we uh, create the singleton in a preventative fashion because that would be uh, that would be unpleasant if you had once again any kind of heavy workload in the initializer for example that you didn't want to do unless it was actually necessary we looked also at the monostate variation the bizarre variation on the singleton where objects appear as normal objects but they all map to a single dictionary. And finally, we looked at the problems with the singleton, specifically issues related to testability and uh, how those problems can be solved as well. The adapter design pattern is a reasonably simple pattern which tries to adapt the interface that you are given to the interface that you actually need. So it's kind of similar to the travel adapter in terms 
of the ideology because we have different electrical devices and they all have their own power requirements and you can think of it as an interface requirement so for example you have different voltage requirements you have different plug types like Europe UK USA whatever and uh, the problem is that if you travel from one country to another you cannot just go ahead and take every single gadget that you have and modify the gadget internally modify its electrics to support every possible interface well some some of this is possible like for example if you get a shaver it can switch from 120 to 220 volts but that is the exception rather than the rule typically what you do is you use a special device which is called an adapter to give you the interface that you need from the interface that you have and it's the same idea in software so in software an adapter is a construct which adapts an existing interface x to conform to the required interface y All right, so now we're going to take a look at the first of the structural patterns, the adapter pattern. And to begin with, let me give you a scenario where you have to adapt something. So let's suppose that you are given a kind of prepackaged API, and that API consists of a point class as well as a draw point function. So we're going to have a uh, class called points. And this is going to have an initializer which just sets X and Y values x and y like so so i'm gonna just store them here and let's also define some sort of api for actually drawing a point draw point uh, p where uh, we are not even going to use p because we're not doing doing a real visual application so i'm just going to emulate this i'm going to print a dot but I'm going to print it without doing a uh, line break so that you actually get to see several of those at the same time. So the scenario is that uh, you are given this. So you're given this API, and let's suppose that you have to absolutely work with this API. There's nothing that you can do. But you actually have something different. So uh, the API that you have looks like this. So let's suppose in your application, everything is made of lines. So you have a line, and uh, that line is initialized with uh, start and end positions, which once again, fairly obvious implementation here. Now, let's suppose uh, that these lines are used to make up larger objects like rectangles, for example. So you have a class uh, called rectangle, which is a list of lines, so we may as well inherit. And here, uh, when you uh, actually initialize uh, the a rectangle you specify uh, the x and y coordinates as well as the width and the height and so what you do apart from uh, you know calling uh, the base class initializer is you actually uh, append uh, the different lines because a rectangle is made of four lines so you make every single one of them and you kind of uh, you add them to uh, the collection so it might look something like this okay uh, so that's the code that we have and now what we can do is uh, we can try to figure out how to work with all of this because let's imagine the following scenario let's imagine that y you have uh, a bunch of rectangles so I'm going I'm just going to make a list here so we'll have a rectangle going from uh, 1 1 with a size of 10 by 10 and let's have another one uh, starting at x equals 3, y equals 3, and uh, the size is going to be 6 by 6. So we have these two rectangles, and the uh, problem is we want to draw them. So we want to have some sort of drawing function. Let's have uh, draw uh, rectangles, and here uh, we want to actually draw some stuff. So first of all, I'll add a print, uh, so a couple of line breaks, uh, drawing some stuff. A uh, few more line breaks and then we want to go for each uh, rectangle in rectangles and uh, well we might want to go through every single line in that rectangle for line in RC but now we need to draw it now the problem is that our API for drawing looks like this everything is made of points and we don't have any points at the moment well we do have points in the sense that a line is defined by uh, 
the start and end points but we want every single point that is used to actually draw a line so not just the start and the end but we want all the in between points as well so the question is how do we actually jump from uh, the API that we are given how do we use it with the objects that we actually want to use it with and the answer is you build an adapter so whenever your API doesn't match uh, what uh, you are actually working with, you need to build an in-between component. And that in-between component is called an adapter. That's what you build to actually get the whole thing to work. So in our case, what we need to do is we need to represent a line as a series of points in order to be able to draw anything because otherwise just nothing will work basically. So we need to build an adapter. We need to build some sort of line to point adapter. So that's what we're going to be doing here. So class line to point adapter, which is also going to be a list, but this time around it's actually going to be a list of points. So uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to actually uh, keep, first of all, uh, the number of uh, points that are generated overall count equals zero because what we're going to be doing is we're going to be generating lots of points so if you have a line going from zero zero to ten zero for example you might be generating like 11 points if we're going discreetly not on a continuous line okay so uh we need uh, some sort of initializer and uh, uh def in it like so we might want to call uh the uh, parent uh, to begin with then I want to increment the count. This is going to be useful later because we can, might be looking at the count to see how many uh, of these we are actually, how many calls we're actually making. And now I'm going to do a printout. So we're going to print out uh, that we're generating points for the line. And I may as well just copy over all the code that is actually required to uh, do this thing. So uh, what is uh, the problem here? Well, first of all, we need to specify that we are initializing the line to point adapter on a particular line. Wh what we do then is we print out the count. So we're uh, counting the number of times that the initializer has been called. And we're saying that we're generating a number of points for a given line. And then we specify the start and end of that line. Then we uh, calculate the left, right, top, and bottom coordinates of that point, of that uh, uh, line, and then uh, we uh, append the appropriate point. So essentially for any given line, the line to point adapter generates a number of points and it stores them because it happens to be a list. And now that it is a list, what we can do is we can jump back down here and we can complete this implementation of our adapter. So here we say adapter, equals line to point adapter, like so, and then we provide the line that we want to actually adapt. And then for every uh, point P in the adapter, because remember adapter is also a list, this is where we use the API that we are given. We call draw point with the argument P, thereby drawing the actual point. So coming down here, what we can now do is we can draw the uh, rectangles that we made, so rectangles RCS like so and we can actually run this and see what we get Okay, so as you can see everything is working correctly. We're drawing some stuff. We're generating points uh, And then uh, drawing them so the dot is where you actually draw some points So we generate more points more points more points and then we draw them uh, all all over the place basically so this is just an illustration of how an adapter would go ahead and adapt one API to another API. Now there is a bit of a problem here. If I duplicate this call, if I do the drawing once and I run this once again, what you're gonna be seeing here uh, is that uh, on both of these calls, we are generating points. So we're generating points up above and we're generating points, those same points, by the way, when we call this thing again. So what is the problem with this? Well, the problem is that, as you can see, the adapter actually generates temporary objects because in order to adapt a uh, line to a point, you have to generate lots of points. And the question is, well, why do we have to keep doing it over and over again? And in the next lesson, we're going to take a look at how we can actually optimize this problem and do away with this regeneration of points for our lines.
All right, so in the previous lesson, we looked at how to build an adapter which adapts a line to a series of points. Now, the problem that we end up with quite often when building adapters is too many temporary objects. And certainly that's something that we've been seeing in the course of the previous lesson. So as I ran the program, you could see that we were regenerating points for lines, even though those points were already generated. So how can we avoid the excess generation of temporary information? Well, in actual fact, if we jump back to the source code, we can do it by building a cache. So a cache is just going to be a dictionary full of objects such as lists in our case, because we need to store lists of points. So we're going to have those. I'm going to get rid of count and I'm going to get rid of uh, the use of count anywhere because it's no longer going to be relevant. And also the line to point adapter is no longer going to be a list because all the data is now going to be stored in the cache. So there is no point in storing any uh, data of value in the current object. So the first thing that we'll do whenever somebody wants to adapt a line to a set of points is we're going to calculate the hash code of that particular line. So we're going to say self.h equals hash line. So this is going to calculate a unique value for every single line and we can use this value as a key in our dictionary. So we can say that if this hash value is already in the dictionary, then we don't really need to do anything because the set of generated points is already in the cache. So we can say if self.h in self cache, then we simply return. There is nothing for us to do because we've already generated those sets of points on a different run, so there is no point in doing it again. Now, of course, what we need to do is we need to modify the code down here because instead of appending to self, as we did previously, we are no longer a list, so we cannot append to ourselves, but what we can do is we can append to some uh, list that we build and then put that list into the cache. So I'm gonna say points equals empty list, and then we use points instead of self to append elements to that list, and then we just put it in the cache. So I here I say self cache. I use the hash value self.h, and that hash value is actually non-static, so it's a member attribute which you can subsequently use to access uh, into a particular cache value. So here we say equals points, so we put the points into the cache, and then the only question which is left is how do we iterate the line to point adapter? Because remember line to point adapter used to be a list, we used to have list as a parent, but it's no longer a list because now when you iterate you need to go into uh, this particular value. This is the value that you want to be iterating. So in order to implement this, it's actually very easy. We just define iter uh, and here what we do is we say uh, we return iter uh, and then we take self cache at self.h. So self.h is the hash code that we use to actually index into the dictionary and then uh, from the cache we take whatever sets of values are available and we sort of iterate through them. Now we can run this example again and hopefully this time around we don't see so many temporary. So let's run this and uh, we have a bit of a problem in that we are probably using count somewhere still. So yeah, here uh, we have count. Let's get rid of this. Let's try this again. So as you can see this time it's much better because uh, when we first run the whole thing, yeah, we are generating points, it says so here, but on the second run, it's this run, we're not generating any more temporaries, we're just making the output which is shown here with the dots. So this is an illustration of how very simple caching can reduce the number of temporaries which are generated when implementing the adapter design pattern. All right, so let's try to summarize what we've learned about the adapter design pattern. So implementing an adapter is actually easy because, well, first of all, you have to determine the API that you actually have as well as the API that you need to acquire. And then you create a component or indeed a set of components which aggregates or has a reference to or something to the adaptee. So it's something which takes the adaptee, it d does something on it, uh, warps the interface somehow. And in some cases, yes, you will end up with these intermediate representations as we've seen in the examples that we've built and these intermediate representations especially temporary data is generated uh, solely for the purposes of adaptation it can pile up and in this case you might want to use caching and other optimizations to make sure that you don't run out of memory and that you don't perform any extraneous operations
The bridge design pattern is all about connecting components together through abstractions. So what is the motivation for actually building a bridge in the first place? Well, a bridge prevents what is called a Cartesian product complexity explosion. So for example, uh, let's suppose that you have some base class called Thread Scheduler and then uh, the Thread Scheduler can be preemptive or cooperative and it can also run on Windows and Linux and you end up with a 2x2 two two scenario. So if you decide to implement four classes, one for you know the preemptive Windows Scheduler, preemptive Unix Scheduler and so on, you end up with a 2x2 two two scenario and the bridge pattern is precisely the thing that actually avoids uh, this whole entity explosion. So instead of having something like this, where you have, if you look at the very bottom, you have four distinct classes, what you can do is you can do it differently. So you can depend on some sort of platform scheduler where uh, there is some interface or something which is uh, implemented by, let's say, a Unix scheduler and a Windows scheduler. And you also inherit from either preemptive threat scheduler or cooperative threat scheduler. So you don't you don't rely on inheritance as much as on inheritance plus aggregation. So this is the typical implementation of the bridge. We're not going to look at anything quite so complicated, but essentially a bridge is a mechanism that decouples the interface or the hierarchy from the implementation. And both of these can be hierarchies, but they don't have to engage in one big inheritance relationship. And in this case, you can have some inheritance and also some aggregation or just keeping references to other components. All right, so the discussion of the bridge design pattern is actually going to be fairly quick because bridge is a fairly kind of obvious self-explanatory kind of pattern. So let me show you a very small scenario of where a bridge can be relevant. Let's suppose that you have a drawing application and that drawing application can draw different, kind of, uh, different kinds of shapes like circles and squares. So you have uh, two ideas, you have a circle and a square. Now let's suppose that your drawing application, in addition to many other things, it can render the circles and the squares in different forms. It can render them in raster form, meaning it's just a set of pixels, or you can draw them in vector form, which means that every single line is actually a line. So we have, uh, we have vector and uh, raster implementations of drawing of circle and square. Now the question is, how do you actually draw them? How do you actually make sure that you have a nice API for drawing them? And one approach would be to create four objects. So if you have a circle that needs to be drawn as a vector, you have a vector circle. And then you have a vector square, you have a raster circle and, and, and a raster square. Well, you get the idea. Now, the problem with this approach is it doesn't really scale. It doesn't scale to beyond maybe two or three objects because then you end up with just a complexity explosion, you end up with a huge number of objects. That's probably not what you want. What you want is to reduce the number of objects that you're making. So in this case, you would try to somehow split the concepts into uh, the different shapes as well as the different renderers. Now, this is, um, uh, this is possible, but uh, the problem is how do you make the connection between the shapes and the uh, renderers which I used to draw those shapes and the answer is that you do this by using the bridge pattern which is uh, fairly obvious stuff. So let's begin by making the actual renderer. So I'll make an abstract base class called renderer. So a class renderer, it's just going to be an abstract base class and uh, it's going to have a uh, method, let's say for rendering circles, render circle. Uh, of a given radius. So you have a circle of a given radius and a renderer is supposed to be able to know how to render it. Now in a similar fashion you might have um, an API for uh, rendering a square. So here I'm not going to uh, actually implement this but I'll, I'll leave it as a comment that you can also have uh, uh, you can also have methods for rendering other types of shapes. Okay, so now that you have this renderer, you can have concrete implementations which actually render a particular shape in a particular way. So for example, if we're talking about a uh, vector renderer, which is a renderer, uh, then uh, when overriding the uh, render circle, what you can do is you can just, well, in our case, I'm going to just say uh, that we are drawing a uh, circle of radius and then specify the radius here. So that's our implementation of the vector renderer. And in the raster renderer, which by the way, I can probably just uh, 
copy and change things around a little bit. So this is going to be a raster renderer. In the raster renderer, uh, we um, we can say that we're drawing pixels for a circle of radius, so and so. So you can see these two implementations are different. Now we can define the hierarchy of shapes. So once again, this is something that uh, can be done using inheritance. We're going to have a base class called shape. And here in the initializer, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take the renderer as the argument. And this is the core of the bridge design pattern. So the question is, how do you connect one hierarchy with another? Well, the answer is that you simply provide it as an argument to the initializer. And that way you can you have an instant connection because you, you save the renderer. So you say self.renderer equals renderer like so and that's pretty much it so now uh, the uh, shape class can also define a couple of uh, different methods for actually like drawing a shape or resizing the shape so you can do those so def draw self let's just put pass in here because we are going to actually implement this in a real shape and we're going to have resize uh, which is going to resize by a particular factor for example once again I'm not providing the implementation here so uh, we can now build a concrete shape like a circle a circle is a shape now what we need to do is uh, the circle has an initializer and that initializer has to call the base obviously so you have to have something like this super init renderer so so that you assign the uh, renderer accordingly and do whatever additional stuff actually happens in the base class initializer so after you do that you might also provide other arguments like you might for example specify the radius and then we can uh, we can add this as an attribute here as well so uh, we also need to implement the other methods so draw and resize in the case of drawing uh, we We'll come back to that in just a moment. In the case of resize, that's easy. We can just multiply uh, the radius by uh, the factor that's provided. The, the case of drawing is the one that's interesting because this is where we actually use the bridge. So remember, we constructed the bridge right around here. Uh, we started, uh, so we effectively saved the renderer as self.renderer. And now here we can access it to actually render the circle. So here we say circle render circle and we provide our radius for the actual rendering so this is how we use the bridge to actually make the connection to the render and actually draw something while at the same time providing a nice api because you don't want to be using the render all the time to render circles you just want to grab a circle and say circle.draw that's that's the most natural way of using an api so uh, having made all of this we can now and try uh, using all of this. So let's uh, stick it in here. So I'll make some renders. I'll have a raster renderer uh, and I'll make a vector renderer. So we can try both of them. Then I'll make a circle. So circle equals uh, circle let's start with a vector render with a radius 5 and then I can take the circle I can draw it I can resize the circle uh, so resize by a factor of 2 that should be a resize by factor of two and then I can uh, draw it again. So with a vector render the output would look something like this. So we're drawing a, a circle of radius five then we're resizing it sort of doubling the radius and we're drawing a circle with radius 10. Now if I use a, a raster render here instead we should get different output for the rendering so if I run this you can see that we're now drawing pixels for a circle of radius 5 and then subsequently for a circle of radius 10 so th the bridge pattern is actually a very simple pattern the goal of the bridge pattern is to escape the complexity explosion as you get more combinations of different classes so a bridge simply connects two hierarchies of uh, different classes with a parameter just just add a parameter to let's say the initializer just store it somewhere and then you have a connection between one and the other of course you are not free from uh, having to implement your own API for whatever uh, types are actually required which is once again a violation of the open close principle because you'll notice that renderer here is tied directly to the objects it renders so if I now introduce a triangle for example I'm going to be implementing uh, the triangles draw method and this is the point where I'll suddenly realize that oh my god I 
have a renderer which doesn't know how to do this, doesn't know how to render circles. So I have to jump into the render and I have to add a new render triangle method. But unfortunately, the problem doesn't start there, it doesn't stop at this point particular junction because now I have to go into the different renderers and for every single renderer I have to add a render triangle there as well. So in terms of the open close principle it's not so good but uh, once again there isn't much that you can do about this because essentially the whole point of this construction is to avoid a complexity explosion and the fact that you're still keeping some complexity is just a byproduct of the fact that you've got two hierarchies and you know you have to deal with them. It's the same situation if you were to add a third renderer like a GPU renderer. For that renderer you would have to implement every single render method as well. So this is just the price to pay for the additional flexibility. So let's summarize what we've learned about the bridge design pattern. So the idea of the bridge is to decouple the abstraction from the implementation. And both of these can exist as hierarchies if you want them to. Essentially, you can think of a bridge as a stronger form of encapsulation. The goal of the composite design pattern is to treat individual components and groups of objects in a uniform fashion, so to provide an identical interface over both aggregates of components as well as individual components. So what is the motivation for having this? Well, imagine you have objects which use other objects' properties or members through inheritance and composition. Now, composition allows us to make compound objects. So for example, you can have a person class which is composed of name, which is a string but also address which is its own object and so on and so forth. So essentially, uh, well another example is for example you could have a mathematical expression which is composed of either simple expressions or uh, you could have like a drawing example where you have a grouping of shapes that can consist of several shapes. Now the composite design pattern basically says that uh, in some situations we want to treat both single or scalar objects as well as composite objects in exactly the same way. So for example if you have an object of type foo and you also have a sequence which yields objects of type foo, you want both of these things to have common APIs and that's what the composite pattern is all about. So essentially it's a mechanism for treating individual or scalar objects and compositions of objects in a uniform manner. The first example of the composite design pattern that I want to give you is an example related to geometric shapes. If you think of any drawing application, you know that you can uh, drag and drop uh, shapes individually, but you can also group several shapes and then drag and drop them together as if they were a single shape. So we're going to be doing something similar. We're going to be defining a base class for some sort of graphic object and then uh, inheriting from that to build our actual shapes. So let's suppose that we have a, a graphic object base class. Now this class can either serve as a base class for a single shape like circle or square or this same base class can be used to actually hold a group of objects together. So it's kind of do use functionality. Let's define the initializer for it. I'll define an optional color here. Uh, so color equals none. We're going to add this attribute. In addition, what I want is I want a, a set of children, just in case this is a container. And I'll also give this a name. I'll use the underscore. Let's have underscore name equals group. Now, the reason why I'm using an underscore is because I want to expose the name through a property just to show you that you can override this in the inheritance. So here I'll define a property. This is going to be called name, and I'm just going to return self dot underscore underscore name like so, and we can perform operations on the inheritance that, that return a different kind of thing. So what do we want? from uh, a graphic object. Well, we want to be able to draw the graphic object, but in our case, since we're working in text mode, I'll just define it as it would be output to the command line. So uh, we'll have str here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, just collate a number of items that I want to print with the right indentation and everything. And for that, I'll use a utility method underscore print, which I'll just going to paste in here. So this is a utility method which basically determines whether or not uh, 
what we actually need to print because essentially we don't know if we have any items. If we do have items, then uh, we do need to uh, print every single one of them starting with an asterisk. Otherwise, we just print ourselves basically. So that's a do use functionality right inside that utility method. And then of course, uh, we set the set of items that we want to collate. That would be uh, a set of strings that we want to print. Then we call self underscore print so we can actually get all the items at a particular level of depth. Notice this is why we have that uh, pseudo internal method because we want to provide a depth and this is a recursive operation and then we return just empty string join all the items together so this is how you can print a graphic object now of course uh, a graphic object by itself is just a container for other objects but we can also inherit from it to actually have concrete classes so you can have a class called circle which is a graphic object and here uh, to show that it's a circle, what I'm going to do is I'm going to override the uh, name getter. So here I'm going to override name and I'm just going to return circle and let's do another one. Let's do a square. Uh, square is also a graphic object. Once again, I'll do uh, the override here to uh, generate this and I'll return square. Okay, so with all of this done, what we can do is we can construct both groupings of objects as well as individual objects. And we can also have groupings of groupings because remember this is a recursive structure. So a graphic object can contain more graphic objects. So uh, let's do that. Let me just show you how this would work. So let's make a drawing. Uh, I'll make a graphic object. I may as well give it a, a better name, drawing name. I know it's underscore, I'm not supposed to be touching it, but but maybe that was a bad idea. It's just it, for illustration purposes, we have that underscore. So my drawing is called my drawing. I know it's not very original. And then we can add a couple of shapes to that drawing. So drawing.children.append uh, square that's red. And let's duplicate this and let's also have uh, a yellow circle. Circle yellow, there we go. Okay. So uh, having set this up, we can also make a group and add that group to the drawing. So let's have a group equals a uh, graphic object. So this time around, I'm not going to give it any uh, special name. It's just going to be called group. And then I can say group.children.append. And once again, let's have a blue circle, circle blue. And let's also have a blue square. And I can then take this group and add it to the drawing. So I can say drawing.children.append group. There we go. So uh, if I now run this, let's actually take a look at the result. Well, there is no result. It doesn't really print anything, which is weird because we should be uh, we should be printing something. Ah, of course, we're not actually. We don't. We haven't written anything to uh, to print. So, so let's do it like this. Print drawing. There we go. Okay. So as you can see, what's happening is at the root level we have the drawing, and everything that is contained is contained within that drawing. So we have the red square and the yellow circle, which are the two kind of concrete members of my drawing. But then we have a group. So my drawing is a group, and it also contains a different group, which in turn contains a blue circle and blue square. So what we've done here is we've used the composite design pattern by making sure that the graphic object here gets to pretend as being either a scalar base class for something like a circle or a square or indeed a collection by keeping a set of children and then printing those children whenever somebody asks you for them. All right, so in a previous example where we looked at geometric shapes, we looked at a very simple scenario where we basically uh, grouped shapes together and then got a base class to act as either a single element or a collection of elements. Now we're going to take a look at a different scenario. We're going to talk about neural networks and we're going to look at a scenario where a scalar object can masquerade as a collection and what benefits this actually gives us. So as you probably know, machine learning is really popular nowadays. Part of machine learning is the use of neural networks and that's what we're going to model. So we're going to start with a class called neuron. So a neuron is kind of like the building block of a neural network. 
let's define some sort of initializer for it. So in the initializer, we're going to specify the name of that neuron, which we're going to uh, save in an attribute. But in addition, neurons are characterized by their connections. So a neuron connects to other neurons. So we want to have two lists. We want to have a list of inputs and a list of outputs. So self inputs equals empty list, self outputs equals empty list. So essentially neurons connect to other neurons and thereby they keep the inputs and outputs list so that they connect to one another. So this is our neuron. We can actually uh, define str so we can print the, uh, uh, the state of the neuron. So here I'm going to return. Uh, well, first let's put the name of the neuron and then uh, let's uh, specify the length of the inputs and the outputs. So how many elements are going in and how many elements are going out. So here I'll say a length of uh, self inputs and this is how many inputs we have. And then let's do the same for outputs. So length self dot outputs and specify uh, that this is how many outputs we have. Okay, so that's the neuron done and you can work with a neuron and you can connect two neurons together. So for this we can define a connect to method which would actually um, allow neurons to be connected. So here you have self and other and uh, here you just add the appropriate elements to the inputs and outputs. So you add self.outputs.append other. So you add other to your own output but then you take others inputs other dot inputs dot append and you append self and that way you make a two-way connection between two neurons. So far so good. This this code will actually work. However, let's decide let's imagine that you decide that having single neurons is a bit too cumbersome and you want to make uh, large groups of neurons. Let's say you want to have something called a neuron layer. And the layer is a list of neurons, so let's inherit from list. And this is where you can uh, for example, specify uh, both the name of the layer as well as the number of neurons you want in that layer. So here what we would do apart from uh, doing the super init call of course is you would set the name and you would also initialize the neuron layer with however many neurons were actually asked for. So we can say 4x in range from uh, 0 to count. What we can do is we can say self.append and here we can make a new neuron for every single iteration and we can give that neuron a meaningful name like uh, let's say the name of uh, the layer dash and then its index. So this is how you would make a whole layer of neurons and once again we can define str so we can print the neuron layer. So def str and here uh, we return uh, self name with uh, length of self uh, neurons. There we go. So this is how you would define a neuron. Now we have a very big problem. We want to be able to connect neurons and neuron layers. Let's actually flesh out all the scenarios that we want to support. So uh, imagine that you have, uh, let's say two neurons. Uh, let's call uh, neurons N1 and N2. And let's imagine you also have two layers. Uh, so you have neuron layer called uh, L1 with let's say three elements and you have uh, layer 2 uh, called L2 with four elements. So what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to say neuron1.connect to uh, neuron2 but you've already got support for this. So this is something that will actually work already but what you also want to do is you want to be able to connect uh, neuron1 uh, to layer1 and you want to be able to take layer one and connect it to uh, let's say neuron two and you want to be able to connect layer one uh, to layer two. So uh, this might end up uh, causing us to write four different methods or four different functions but we don't really want to do that. We want a single function which actually takes care of all of these four cases. So the question is how can we actually do this? How can we write this function? Well we could write it if we could for example iterate both the uh, ne uh, neurons in a layer as well as the neurons in a neuron. And in actual fact it is possible to do exactly that. So how would you do this? Well uh, the simplest way of going about this is just writing some sort of function here. So we're going to write a, a connect to function here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to comment out the one that's uh, sort of inside the neuron itself because we're going to uh, write it here. So 
connect two. So we're connecting uh, two elements together. Let's call them self and other uh, for a lack of better terminology. The self here doesn't mean the self of an object of some kind, but I'm just going to keep it anyway. So if uh, self is uh, other, then we just return. You can't connect to yourself. But then we do the following. So for S in self and for O in other, uh, we just uh, make the connection. Effectively, we connect the, the neurons together. So we say S dot outputs dot append O and O dot inputs dot append S. So this would work, uh, and we could uh, we could subsequently call connect to on uh, neuron one comma neuron two and whatever. Th this would actually function, and we could also take this entire definition and just imbue it into both neuron as well as neuron layer. So let me show you how this would work. So you would say neuron dot connect to equals connect to, and uh, I'll neuron layer connect to equals connect to. Now this would actually function except that there is a bit of a problem. Let's actually run this to get the error. So as you can see the error here is that uh, we cannot connect a neuron uh, to a neuron because guess what when you say for O in a single neuron you cannot iterate it because a neuron is just a scalar value but it's very easy to turn a scalar value into a collection into something that's actually iterable and this is done uh, using uh, the iter uh, definition like so probably writing it in the wrong place iter there we go so uh, here we go and guess what you put here you simply yield self this is how you turn a scalar value into a collection of one element and guess what if I now run this you'll notice that everything works let's actually print out a few of these elements so I'm going to print uh, neuron 1 and uh, neuron 2 and I'm going to print layer 1 and layer 2 as well. So is I, if I print all of this you can see that we have a neuron 1, 0 inputs, 4 outputs because one of them goes to the other neuron, 3 goes to L1 and then N2 with 4 inputs, 4 outputs and then L1 and L2. So everything works correctly. Now there is a slight bit of inconvenience in that the connect to here is actually defined as a kind of freestanding function. What if it were possible to just introduce some sort of base class so that connect to would be uh, directly tied to neuron and neuron layer? Well, it is in fact possible. It's in fact possible to make such a base class. So if you wanted to make such a base class, you would call it maybe connectable. And this class uh, would actually uh, have two interfaces so it would implement iterable and it would be abstract so let's import both of these things so we'll import uh, ABC and we'll also import iterable uh, which is in uh, collections.abc so from collections.abc import iterable there we go so this is going to be a base class and it's going to have that connect to method I'm actually going to take it from here, so that should explain why I used self as the argument name here, so I can uh, cut it from here and I can stick it in here. There is uh, no change that is required, it just works out of the box like this. And then what we can do is we can obviously get rid of these assignments, there is no need to imbue the classes with uh, these additional methods. But now uh, I need to specify that both neuron as well as neuron layer actually inherit from this. So neuron inherits from connectable and a neuron layer also inherits from connectable. There we go, so that's all that you would need to do. And now, of course, both neuron as well as neuron layer, they both implement connect to as uh, their own methods. And so you, when you're calling connect to, it's not something that's been defined globally, it's something that's been defined in the connectable base class up here. So as we run this, we get pretty much the same output because nothing has really changed. We've just introduced additional semantic convenience so that uh, the syntax is a bit nicer. So this is how you implement uh, the uh, composite design pattern. Once again, in this example, what happened is we have a uh, scalar element, a single element masquerading as a collection. And the way you can do this is by defining iter, the iter method, and simply yielding self whenever somebody asks for the iteration.
All right, so let's try to summarize what we've learned about the composite design patterns. So we know that generally objects can use either objects via either inheritance or composition. And to be honest, in this particular case, in the case of the discussion of the composite design pattern, we're more interested in composition. Now, some composed and singular objects, they actually need to provide similar or identical behaviors. So there are situations where, for example, you want to be able to treat a group of objects using exactly the same interface as a single object. And in this case, the composite design pattern comes to the rescue because this is what it's all about. The composite design pattern allows us to treat both types of objects, so both scalar objects as well as collections, it allows us to treat them uniformly. Now Python supports iteration and iteration is typically the main thing associated with something that's composite, being able to iterate it from start to end. So in Python you support iteration with the iter method and there is also a base class, an abstract base class called iterable which you can use as a kind of additional guide to specifically require somebody to implement the iter method. And then of course we resort to a simple trick of turning a scalar object into something that's iterable and that is very simple when you go to implement the iter method of a scalar object you simply yield self. And that's basically all that you need to do in order to turn a single object into what's effectively a collection or at least something that masquerades to be a collection. In this section of the course, we're going to talk about the decorated design pattern. Now, the decorated design pattern exists so that you can add additional behaviors to particular classes without either modifying the classes themselves or indeed inheriting from them. So let's take a look at the motivation for using the decorator. So sometimes you have a class and you want to augment this class with additional functionality. You want to have an object have extra features. So the question is, how do you add those features? Now, uh, one thing you can do is you can jump into the existing object and you can just rewrite the object, add additional methods, add additional attributes, uh, change some of the internal operations and so on and so forth. If you can afford to do that, if you're okay with that, then that's fine. But this breaks the open close principle, which I've been talking about throughout this entire course. The open close principle basically states that once you've written and tested your code, you shouldn't be jumping into it and performing modifications. And sometimes those modifications are not even your own code. Maybe your colleague is, is responsible for this code. So you shouldn't just be jumping in there and changing all of their stuff because then they would get into their own code and not really understand what's going on. So uh, you want to keep the functionality separate. You want the new functionality to be a separate component, typically a separate class, so as to adhere to the single responsibility principle instead of uh, adding additional responsibilities to the underlying object. So what we need to be able to do, in spite of all of this, is we need to somehow be able to interact with uh, existing data structures. So if you are making a uh, decorator around something, you still need to be able to interact with uh, the decorator, interact with perhaps the underlying object, and we're going to take a look at how exactly this is done. Now, there are generally two options here that you can follow. So the first option, and the most obvious one really, is to simply use inheritance. You simply grab the uh, class that you want to augment and you inherit from it and you add additional features to it. So if this is a possibility, once again, it's probably the simplest possibility there is because well, you simply get all the attributes and all the methods of an object automatically. So why not go for it? But if for some reason that is not what you want to do, then you build a decorator. And a decorator is simply a class which references the object you want to decorate. So you have a reference to that object and then uh, you offer some additional operations on top of that object. So a decorator is simply a component that facilitates the addition of behaviors to individual objects without necessarily inheriting from them. One of the design patterns that are built into Python is the decorator pattern, but the implementation of decorator inside Python is very specific. It's not the general purpose decorator you'll see in books. Instead, it is what is known as a functional decorator. So let me show you how functional decorators work in Python. Let's suppose that we have some operation, which let's say it takes a long time. So I'm going to define some operation, some op, and this is going to be just a function. We're going to do a few printouts, so we're starting the operation, 
starting the operation then we perform some work I'm just going to simulate it by sleeping for one second and then uh, we're going to print something else we're going to print uh, we are done and I'm going to return some value 123 for example I don't really have to return anything but it's just a good extra illustration so having made this operation what we can do is we can run this operation so we can say sum op and if I run this what you're going to see is that we're starting the op then one second passes and then we are done so it's a good simulation of some work that gets happen that gets done in time.sleep uh, that's what we're trying to show here. So let's suppose that, for example, you decide to measure the time taken to actually um, uh, perform this operation. So uh, what you can do is you can write a functional wrapper which takes some op as a parameter and then uses this uh, to perform time measurements. So let me show you how this can work. You can define a new function called timeit, which takes a function and basically what it does is it builds a new function which is a wrapper of the original. So I'm going to define wrapper. Okay, so how does this work? Well, first of all, you measure the starting time. So you say start equals time dot time. Then you actually call the function and store the result. So you say result equals func. So if we are calling some op here, uh, then result would be the value of 123 because that's what gets returned from the function. Then you record the end time, so the terminating time. Once again, I'll just do time.time. .time. And then you can, for example, print out some diagnostic information. So you can print, for example, the name of the function that we just called. So we can say func dot underscore underscore name, but obviously in curly braces, uh, func underscore underscore name, like so. And then we could say that this function took uh, the, so many milliseconds. And to calculate the milliseconds, I will do an int conversion where we basically take end minus start, and that's in milliseconds, so we multiply it by 1,000. We turn it into an integer for easier readability, and I say this is how many milliseconds the function actually took, and then we can uh, also return the result because that's the result of the uh, the invocation. So here what we can do is we return the wrapper and uh, therefore what happens is time it is actually a function that returns a function. So time it takes whatever function you give it, it builds this wrapper around it and the wrapper just does time measurement and calls the function as the underlying and returns the result of that function and it returns that wrapper. So now what we can do instead of just calling sum of is we can construct this object so essentially we can say that we're going to time it. Here the argument is the function that we want to time in this case sum op. Notice we're not putting the round brackets here. These are not required. We're just passing in the function. And so time it sum op just gives us a brand new wrapper function, which we then call with no arguments. And this way we can measure the time taken by sum op. So let's run this. Let's see what we get. Okay, so as you can see, what's happening is we are starting the operation and we are done with the operation. And then we have this printout from the wrapper that we built saying that sum op took 1000 milliseconds. So in Python, what you get is you get special syntax to apply this entire wrapper to the function every time it gets called. So what if we want to always apply time it to sum op? Well, in actual fact, you can have your cake and eat it too because this is done using Python's functional decorators. And what you do is you put the at symbol here followed by the name of the wrapper. In this case, it's called time it. So this is a Python decorator. This is essentially a function which wraps this function and performs the appropriate operation. So now if we go ahead and if we run sum op, what you're going to see is you're going to see exactly the same output. So we are starting the operation, we are done, and then the printout from the wrapper occurs. So decorators in Python are very useful for performing something around a function. So you take a function or indeed a method, and what you do is you use the decorators to actually say perform some initialization code, perform some termination code, even store some values if you want. So it's a built-in mechanism in the programming language and a good example of how design patterns can actually creep right into the language design.
The most classic implementation of decorator is one where you build a class that kind of augments the functionality of an existing class. So let me show you how this can work. Let's imagine that we have an abstract base class called shape. So that's going to be an abstract class and we're going to have concrete implementations like square and circle and whatnot. Let's suppose that the shape itself doesn't really have anything in it. We might define str to just return an empty string, but that's pretty much all that we would want to do. Now we can have concrete implementations of shape. For example, we can have a circle. So we can say that we have a class called circle, uh, which is a shape. And uh, we can initialize the circle with a certain radius. So radius here. Uh, so let's just, um, let's assign that. And then we can have some sort of methods for, let's say, resizing the circle. Uh, resize the circle by a particular factor, for example, where you simply multiply uh, the radius by that factor, like so. And then you can also implement str, uh, where you print uh, some information about the circle. So we can say that this is a circle of radius and then specify self.radius. Okay, uh, so far so good. Now what we can do is we can similarly define a square, so class square. Also a shape. By the way, this base class business is not strictly necessary, but I'm doing it for completeness so that you can see how uh, things can propagate later on. So we have a class called uh, square. And once again, let's define the initializer here. We'll specify the side of the square. So let's just assign that. And once again, I will define str to print some info. So I return a square with side self.side. There we go. So we now have a circle and we now have a square. So we can operate on these objects, but we can also decorate them. We can, for example, make a colored shape, which takes a shape such as a square or a circle and gives it additional color. So here we can have a class called colored shape. Notice we can only have it inherit from shape. If anything, we cannot make it inherit from square or circle because it has to work with both squares and circles. So let's initialize it. Uh, in order to initialize it, we specify the shape that we are decorating as well as the color that we are applying to that shape. So uh, here what we can do is we can say self.shape equals shape and the same goes for color. Let's do it automatically. There we go. So now we can define, a, make a new definition of str where we print the shape including the fact that it has a particular color. So we return uh, self.shape has the color uh, self.color. There we go, we have a decorator and we can start using this decorator for something. So let's put it down below. So essentially what I'm going to do is first of all I'll just make a circle and show you that it does print. So circle equals circle of radius 2 and let's just print a circle. So if I run this you can see that we have a circle of radius 2. Uh, then what I can do is I can use that decorator to add color to the circle without modifying the circle itself. So notice we're sticking to the open close principle. We're not jumping back into the circle and adding that functionality because strictly speaking, you wouldn't just jump into a circle. You would jump into uh, the shape base class, assuming you had a base class. So here you can uh, just make a red circle. So to make a red circle, uh, you make a colored shape uh, for the circle and give it a color like red for example and then we can print the red circle and predictably enough this would actually uh, reuse the underlying so we have a circle of radius 2 that's the underlying part and then we have the color uh, red as well. Now I want to show you that you can actually combine several decorators on top of a particular class so uh, we can have, uh, let's say, a transparent shape. So this is where we can specify the transparency of a particular shape. So in the initializer, we specify the shape as well as transparency, let's say a transparency value, and we can do something to that value. Let's suppose we take a value from 0 to 1, and we want to show it as a percentage, in which, in which case we would, uh, we would show str as follows. So we would implement str we would return uh, self.shape has self.transparency maybe multiplied by a hundred uh, percent transparency there we go 
So uh, this is uh, how we can uh, implement the whole thing. And now we can apply both of these at the same time. So we can have a red half transparent circle. Red half transparent circle equals uh, transparent shape. And then uh, as an argument, we can provide the red circle like so. And uh, we can print that as well. There we go. So let's run this and let's see what we get here. So we seem to be getting an error. We are missing an argument because you have to specify the transparency. So here let's specify 0.5 for being half transparent. And we get the output that this circle of radius 2 has the color red and has 50% transparency. So the, nothing prevents you from applying the same, uh, the same decorator twice. So this is one downside of the whole thing. So for example, I can apply a colored shape twice. So I can apply a colored shape to a colored shape to a uh, square of side three, and I can apply first red and then uh, green, for example. And this would actually uh, give us uh, predictable results. Let me just run this like so. So a square with side three has the color red, has the color green. Obviously this is incorrect. This is uh, excessive because essentially you have two incarnations of color. You have the red color and the green color both being kept next to a shape which might not be what you want so you can you can handle these kinds of situations. So um, for example here you can say if is instance uh, shape colored shape then we don't allow to do this. We simply don't allow. We maybe raise an exception uh, that cannot apply same decorator twice and we can uh, we can try this so as I run this you can see that we get an exception here so the exception actually uh, gets thrown of course what you can do is you can uh, go even further you can for example apply a transparent decorator to a color decorator to a transparent decorator to some shape that's currently not going to be caught and it's actually very difficult to catch this if you want to uh, handle these kinds of situations but this is this is basically how you implement a decorator. So in, in typical object-oriented programming, a decorator is simply a class which takes the decorated object as an argument. It takes uh, some additional values and it simply provides the extra functionality. You'll notice, however, that the decorator doesn't allow you access to the underlying object, which means if we remember circle, remember I added a resize method to a circle. But you'll notice that we cannot actually use it. We cannot use it on a decorated shape. So here, if I try red circle, red circle dot resize by a factor of two, that's not valid code because the decorator that we get, the colored shape decorator, and you, you can sort of see the, uh, the error output here, but the colored shape decorator is a shape. It's not a circle. Therefore, it doesn't really have a resize method, and so you cannot call it, unfortunately. So that's one additional implementation uh, detail, shall we say, of the decorator. So one of the examples that we uh, saw previously was an example of a decorator around the geometric shape. And the problem with that decorator was that the API of the decorator didn't allow access to the underlying shape. So even though the circle had a method called resize, the circle decorators like, for example, colored shape didn't allow you access to resize that shape, which was a bit annoying. So the question is, how can you actually implement this? Now, one approach would, of course, be to replicate every single interface member inside the decorator but that's not really practical. We want something that's a bit more automatic. So here I want to show you an example where that's exactly what we're going to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to write a decorator around the idea of a file. So a file can be written somewhere and whenever you write several lines to a file we want to perform additional operations like for example do some logging. So I'm going to call this class file with logging. I'm going to initialize it uh, with a uh, the file and I'm going to store that file in an attribute and subsequently I want to treat file with logging as if it were a file. This is important and uh, in order to do this I want to, well, 
it, typically you would have to redefine every single method on file and have it uh, be proxied over to self.file, but we're only going to do one. So we're going to do a method called write lines, which takes a bunch of strings, and that's where I want to perform certain logging after the underlying operation. So what I want to do is I obviously want to uh, use the underlying uh, that would be uh, self dot file dot uh, whatever just just write the lines uh, one after another so write lines uh, strings but afterwards I want to perform some logging so for example I want to print how many lines I wrote so I wrote uh, length and that should be an f string so I wrote length of strings um, files or lines rather that's how I would implement this. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm trying to get uh, the file with logging class to masquerade as if it were a file, and it's not a file, but I want all the requests, uh, all the attribute requests, to basically be redirected uh, into uh, the uh, uh, into the underlying file. So, how can I get this? Well, it's actually rather easy because what you do is you override the get attr, set attr, and del attr members to actually point into that file that we're storing. So, in the case of the getter, uh, get attr, I have the ID generate the signature for me. What I'm doing is I'm calling get attr, but the dictionary I'm getting is the dictionary of that file. So, I'm saying self dot uh, underscore underscore dictionary. Uh, for the file that I'm storing and uh, specifying the item that I actually want to get. A uh, similar thing for the setter, except, well, in, in the case of the setter, for example, I can determine whether or not I do want to actually access the underlying because maybe I want to change the underlying file handle, in which case we, we can perform additional checks here. So I can say set attr and what I would do here is I would first of all say that, well, if uh, key is... Uh, equal to file, then obviously we are trying to access the file, we are trying to override the file handle, so here I would say uh, self uh, uh, underscore dictionary uh, by uh, key and just set the value, otherwise what I would do is I would go into the file obviously, so in the else clause I would say something like set attr and here I would get uh, the dictionary of that file, uh, the, the file uh, value and just, just set the name there. So this is how uh, this would work, although this has to be called key uh, in the generated code. And similarly for the deleter, of course. So here I can say def uh, del attr, and here I can just delete the attribute of whatever it is that's on the file. So self underscore underscore dict uh, with the uh, file and just specify the item here. So this is how you proxy over most of the things. Uh, the other two things that are probably worth adding are the iteration and next methods because they are obviously also going to be uh, sent over uh, to the file and it's very convenient to have them uh, work as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to define uh, iter and here I'm just going to say self.file.iter and the same goes for a next. So here I'm just going to return self.file.next, uh, like so. Uh, so now that we've got the setup, what we can do is we can start using it and we can actually uh, wrap an ordinary file uh, with this implementation. So what I mean is the following. Let's suppose that we make a file. So that's going to be, typically you would say something like open hello.txt for writing. But what we can do with the decorator is we can take the decorator and we can say file with logging uh, around uh, the open call. So this basically passes the file as the initializer argument in here and then uh, some of the operations on file with logging because of the way that we've set up all the ATTR methods they're going to get sent to the actual file. So now that we have this file what we can do is we can say file.write lines and this is going to use the write lines that is up here the one that has the diagnostic printout so we can do that. So let's do file.write lines with um, uh, hello and world, for example. Hello and world, a little bit banal, but we can also use the underlying method. So I can say, for example, file.write testing, and that's going to work as well because uh, file.write is just going to get us into the get attr. We're going to get the, the underlying stuff from the uh, file itself. 
and call file.write on the underlying. And then we can do file.close, which is once again going to uh, be called on the underlying. I can run all of this, and you can see that it's uh, working correctly. We wrote exactly two lines of the text uh, using the diagnostic printout that we have in the decorator. And whatever other calls we did, they were essentially proxied over uh, to the underlying file using all of this dynamic uh, magical processing that we've added down below. So this is an improvement upon on the uh, original decorated design pattern that is of course going to have a certain performance penalty because obviously as you go into every one of these methods it's not a free call here it's going to cost some performance but uh, hopefully not a significant chunk and the flexibility it affords allows you to very easily build decorators over types with large APIs that you don't want to proxy over yourself because otherwise you would have to implement things like file.write for example. So you would have to say uh, def uh, write uh, item uh, and then self.file.write item and you'd have to do this for every single method inside the file which isn't practical. So here we saved some time by using some dynamic programming. All right, so let's try to summarize some of the things that we've learned about the decorator design pattern. So we saw that a decorator is typically a class that keeps a reference to the object it actually decorates. And then what it does is it adds certain utility methods and attributes to basically increase the set of uh, the object's functionality without modifying the underlying object, without going into the object and actually changing the original class's source code. You have an extra class which performs those additional objects operations. Uh, you may or may not forward uh, the calls to the decorator to the underlying object. This is really up to you. And I've shown you some of the ways that you can do this, some of the ways that you can automatically set it up so that whenever you try to access a particular member of uh, the decorator, uh, provided you allow this, it can actually go to the underlying object and call that method for example, or get that attribute from the underlying object. Uh, we saw that the proxying of those calls can be done dynamically as opposed to just copying every single method by hand and replicating it because that is rather tedious. And we also looked at a kind of parallel reality. We look at, at Python's functional decorators. Now these decorators are not directly related to the gang of four decorator pattern because that is typically a pattern related to classes, but we do have this idea of a functional decorator or a wrapper, basically a function that simply wraps an existing function. And that is something that Python uh, provides intrinsically via the use of decorators. And we have looked at how to write those decorators and how to apply them to existing functions. Now let's talk about the facade design pattern. So this facade design pattern is the idea of exposing several components through a single easy to use interface. Now the motivation should be fairly obvious. I have a picture of a house here and the idea is that you typically want to balance complexity and presentation or usability. And certainly if you think about a uh, typical home, for example, there's lots of subsystems in a typical home. You have the electrical subsystem, you have sanitation uh, and lots of other things behind. The structure of the house, a typical house is actually quite complex. Like the floor is composed of several layers, including insulation and whatnot. It's all very complex, but the end user, that would be you or me if we're buying the house, we're not really exposed directly to those internals. So the same goes with software because sometimes you get uh, lots of different systems working together to provide the absolute flexibility, but you just want a very nice and very restricted API for consumers who just want to, you know, write one or two lines of code and have the whole thing just work. And so this is where uh, we build a facade. And by the way, that C uh, with the lower part, that lower part is called a cedilla. So this is a uh, kind of French letter C and it's pronounced S instead of K. So we don't say facade, we say facade. So the facade design pattern provides a simple and easy to understand uh, API over a large and sophisticated body of code that may involve, for example, several classes being exposed as just one single function that you call to have lots of things happen underneath.
In all of the examples in this entire course, we've been looking at things that we ran in the text console. Now, a text console might seem like a very simple kind of construct, but behind the scenes it can actually be quite sophisticated. The console can consist of buffers, which are simply areas of memory where you put the characters that you're subsequently going to print. It can also consist of viewports, which are effectively views into those buffers, showing you just uh, a chunk of all the buffer information that you actually have stored because obviously if you have a huge buffer you only want to show the last few lines because that's how much space you have and then you might have a console class which actually allows you easy manipulation of those elements and the console here would be a facade in actual fact so let's take a look at how this can look so somewhere behind the scenes you have something called a buffer now a buffer can be a two or one dimensional uh, chunk of memory so it can be a list for example full of characters that you want to output as you use the console so you might initialize uh, the buffer with a certain width and height giving it sensible defaults something like this you uh, store both uh, the width and the height like so and you might also want to specify that you have a buffer which is just uh, let's say the empty space character and it's repeated uh, and the number of times it's repeated is with times height. So this is how you would uh, set up the actual buffer as in a list of characters to be output. And then what you can do is you can, for example, uh, provide certain APIs for writing to that buffer. So you can have a uh, method called write, which just takes some text and adds it to the buffer. Uh, like this for example you might also have uh, support for indexing so you might want to support somebody getting a character at a particular location in the buffer in which case you'll define something like get item and here you would just go into the buffer and you would call uh, get item on that element so this is a fairly low level construct the buffer is not something that most of your clients really want to work with they want to have a high level interface however we're still not doing uh, we're still not done with the uh, low level stuff because now we want to show that buffer now we don't just show that buffer in the console because you can have uh, many buffers being shown in different locations and any one of you who has ever written a trading terminal would know how that looks like but we're going to build something called a viewport so a viewport shows a chunk of the buffer on screen somewhere. So in the initializer for the viewport, you might want to specify what buffer it's attached to. And if it's not attached to anything, we can provide a sensible default, which is just a, a default constructed buffer here. And uh, let's initialize that. In addition, your viewport can be offset against the beginning of the console. So you might have some sort of offset. Let's just give it a value of zero. So what can a viewport do? Well, it can get you a character at a particular location. So you might have uh, some sort of uh, low level method like get character at, and you might specify the index of the character and then you just return self.buffer, uh, self.buffer at uh, index plus uh, self.offset. So getting the appropriate character. Now this is just, a bit, a bit uh, iffy code in the sense that I'm simulating things that you would uh, write in a much more conscientious fashion. But in addition, a viewport might also have an append method which would simply, uh, whenever you are, you've got a viewport focused and you're typing some text, you want to append that text to a buffer. So you might have some sort of append method which takes some text and just uses the buffer, uh, sort of self uh, dot buffer plus equals text, or you might have uh, self.buffer.write text, something like that. So uh, finally, uh, as you can see, we have plenty of low level constructs. And if you're working with just a single console with a single buffer and the size of the buffer is the size of your console, for example, you don't really want to be dealing with any of these low level structs. You just want some class called console and a very simple way of manipulating that. So let's build our facade. So a facade is going to be called console. In the initializer, you might set up a default buffer and a default viewport attached to that buffer. And you might want to keep both of these as a list so that subsequently, if somebody wants to do some low level work and add additional buffers and additional viewports, that's actually possible. So you would make a buffer, uh, you would set the current viewport, uh, current viewport 
to uh, the viewport that's attached to the buffer. Once again, I'm constructing the viewport here. And then you would uh, have a list of buffers uh, with uh, buffer B to begin with, and you would have a list of viewports uh, with a list containing just the current viewport. So this is how you could set up the console. And then uh, on the console, you could provide both high-level methods, meaning methods that you would use as part of a facade to kind of hide the user from all the complexity. So for example, if somebody wants to write to the console, it's obvious that they want to write to the currently selected viewport and specifically to the buffer attached to that viewport. So you could have a very nice, very useful method called write, which takes a chunk of text. But what you're doing behind the scenes is you're taking the current viewport, you're taking the buffer of that viewport, and you're using its write method to write some text. So you can see we're sort of hiding all the complexity behind a very nice to use interface. But if you want to, uh, you can expose low level functionality from the facade as well. So here we have a console, which is a very nice uh, user friendly facade, but it has attributes such as buffers and viewports. And if you want to, you can use those classes directly and you can uh, access all sorts of low level APIs directly. In actual fact, the console can also have low level APIs of its own that are available to power users. In case you know exactly what's going on with the whole buffer viewport setup, if you are familiar with those constructs, then we can offer low level APIs. So I can, for example, offer a method called get character at if you want to get a character at a particular position with a console once again uh, what this would do is it would go into the uh, current viewport it would get a character at a particular index so this is an ability to sort of get down and dirty with the console specifics so effectively, we're offering two realities. We're offering the nice facade, which has user-friendly methods like write, for example, but we're also offering some uh, low-level stuff. And it's certainly possible to just manipulate buffers and viewports and work with uh, the viewport class and the buffer class directly if you're a power user. So this is a kind of multifunctional facade. And the way you'd use it is very simple. So you can make a console and you can just take a console and write a uh, single line of text to it. And this is the high level manipulation. So this is something that the, uh, the facade is actually designed for. It's designed to hide all the complexity. So when you create the console, you just call the initializer with no arguments, but plenty of other subsystems are coming into play there because in the constructor here in the initializer, you can see that there's a buffer being created. There's a viewport being created. They're being put into respective uh, lists. And in addition, you know, everything is set up just as it should be. And you can just work with a high level API. But if you want to, you can go ahead and take the console and uh, use the low level API, for example, getting a, a character at position zero and storing it somewhere. So this is something that we have deliberately exposed uh, the client to. So if they want to, they can get uh, they can get some sort of low level functionality there. But the key aspect, the key uh, reason for the existence of a facade is this part. It's the part that makes everything usable. It makes everything very nice and neat and concise without having to fiddle with the internal mechanics of the subsystems which actually make the console work. So let's try to summarize the facade design pattern. So you typically build a facade to provide a simplified API over a set of classes. And you may wish to optionally expose those internals through the facade. So it's really up to you. So for example, for power users, it might make more sense to expose both the facade, but also allow them to use the low level classes if they want to. So this would be a typical kind of escalation of policy. So typically you want people to use the facade because it's so easy and understandable, but you might want to allow the power users to access the complex APIs if they need to for some fine tuning, for example. In this section of the course, we're going to talk about the flyweight design pattern. The flyweight design pattern is essentially a space optimization technique. So it's something that tries to save you memory. Now let's talk about the motivation for using this design pattern. Now the goal of design in this particular case is to avoid redundancy when storing data. So if you think about some sort of massively multiplayer game that you have 
uh, with millions of users online, well, typically you have very similar concerns. So you might have plenty of users with identical or very similar first and last names. So you might have lots and lots of people called John Smith, but you might also have people called Jane Smith or John Doe or something like that. And it would be wasteful to replicate all this data. There is no sense in storing the same first and last name combination over and over again because you're just wasting memory. So in this case, what you might want to do instead is you might want to store a list of names somewhere else and then store just the references to them for each individual user. This reduces you to just storing two numbers per user as opposed to storing lots and lots of byte for every user's name. Another example is something like text formatting in a typical text editor. So you have text and you want to make chunks of text bold or italic. Now in this case, you don't really want to take each individual character and give them an additional formatting character or some sort of additional formatting flag. What you want to do instead is you want to operate on the idea of ranges. For example, defining a range as a line number and the starting and ending positions and then saying, well, this range is going to be bold and this range is going to be italic. And obviously, if the two ranges intersect, then you have a chunk of text in the middle, which is bold and italic at the same time. So the flyweight design pattern is quite simply a space optimization technique that allows us to use less memory by storing the data externally. So not storing it right in the attribute where you'd expect it to be, but you store it externally and then you refer to it. So you make an association to that data from your attributes or from wherever you actually need to use it. And that way you get to save a lot of memory. Let's take a look at a very simple example of the flyweight pattern being relevant. Let's suppose that you have a multi-user game, for example. You have a class called user. Now that class has, uh, let's say, it stores the name of the user. So you have name and you simply store it like this. Now it might seem like a sensible thing to do. You just simply stick the name in here. Let's suppose that this name is actually the full name of a person. However, uh, w the real problem with this is that you're also going to have lots of people with similar names, like you'll have lots of uh, John Doe's or John Smith's or um, I don't know, Sam Smith's and, and, and similar names. And you might want to avoid allocating so much memory for every single name, especially if they are similar. So putting everything, putting like the first name and the last name into uh, the same, uh, uh, into the same string is not, probably not the best idea. We can actually write a kind of simulation of uh, how, um, how exactly this would work. So uh, let's suppose that uh, we decide to just make names as random characters. So I'm going to define, um, I'm going to define a function for making a random string. Uh, that's going to emulate people's names. So here we'll say chars equals, and we're, we're going to be b basically building everything out of uh, ASCII uh, lowercase uh, characters. So for that, we need a couple of imports. Obviously, we need to import string, uh, and we also need to import random. So uh, we add the uh, characters. So we return empty string dot join. And here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just allocate, let's say we're going to have strings of length eight. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say random uh, choice out of all those characters, which are the lowercase ASCII characters for X in range eight. So we're going to have uh, eight letter uh, first names and last names again for random choice. I probably need um, uh, import. So I'll oh, wait, it's random dot choice, random dot choice. There we go. Okay. So having set all of this up, what we can do is we can, for example, uh, make a huge number of users. We can make, let's say, a uh, hundred by a hundred uh, first name, last name users. So let's have users equals empty, uh, empty list. And then I'll make uh, some first names. So that's going to be random string for x in range 100. And then I'll duplicate this and I'll say 
last names. So now we can do like a Cartesian product of them. We can essentially uh, define users as a combination of uh, first and last. So for uh, first in first names, for last in last names, what we can say is users.append. I'll make a user where uh, you basically have uh, uh, the uh, first uh, name and then space and then last name. There we go. So this is how you can uh, make a huge number of users, 10,000 users in actual fact. Um, and uh, having set up all of these users, you can probably imagine that at the moment, as things stand, we are going to have uh, 100,000 strings effectively, because every single string is unique and every single string has to be created and stored somewhere. So this is going to work. It's not really not really such a terrible thing. The only problem is that we're wasting memory that shouldn't be wasted, because remember, there is only 200 unique strings. There's 100 here and 100 here, so we shouldn't spend 10,000 pieces of memory just doing that. We should spend only 200 uh, chunks of uh, eight character strings doing that. So this is where the flyweight pattern can come in. So essentially the user class is a very nice looking class, but it's not very efficient. And you might want to build a flyweight. So you might want to build a user class, which is simply a pointer into some common store. So how would you do this? Well, instead of doing this, you'll define a new class. Let's go with user2. And user2 is going to have a static list of all the common first and last names. So here you would have uh, strings equals empty list. And then when you go and you initialize uh, the user uh, with a particular name. Remember, a name is a combined uh, combined kind of um, thing, so it's a full name. It's first and last name with a space in between. What we can do is we can uh, split the username into the first and last parts and simply store their indices inside uh, this entire setup. So let me show you how this can work. So we say um, self.names now self.names is going to contain a set of indices and we're going to get these indices by calling a function called get or add for x and we're going to call it uh, for uh, x in full name dot split. So we're going to split everything by space and then we're going to uh, call every single uh, call get or add on it on every single element and get or add is something that we can stick as an inner function here get or add s so here we want to check if the string s is in fact in strings so if s in self strings then we simply return the index self strings index at position s. Otherwise, uh, we add it. So we say self strings dot append s and we return length minus one. Self strings minus one. There we go. Okay, so uh, we have, uh, uh, we have more or less set this up. In actual fact, let's just be explicit and say that this is the full name here. So this setup is now going to return us indices. So self.names returns us the index. The question is, how do you actually get the, uh, get the actual name? Because at the moment, even though we are storing all those strings, the name itself is not printable. And we cannot reliably print the name. So if we define str here, what we need to do is we basically need to combine every single uh, element from the strings array using uh, self.names. So uh, we use a space uh, to, now oh, that's weird. I'm getting funny looking spaces all of a sudden. Let's try this again. Empty space join. There we go. That was very weird. So what we need to do is we need to go into our static strings list and uh, we need to grab every single uh, every single string that corresponds to uh, self dot names. So um, here we say uh, we need to get strings at x for x in self dot names. And let's not forget the, the self part.
there we go. Okay, so we've now set up a string representation, which means that we can also uh, print things. And by the way, I forgot the access here. You do need some uh, variable name. So uh, having set up uh, all of these, we can now have user2 instead of the user. And that's going to be a huge memory saving exercise because instead of allocating 10,000 unique strings, we're going to be allocating just 200. Remember, we have 200 unique first and last names. So it's quite a saving and we can just verify that uh, this works in the sense that um, uh, the user gets printed correctly by printing, uh, let's say, users at uh, position 0, for example. So let's run this. And we have an error, str returned non-string. How interesting. So um, let's, uh, let's see what's going on here. Oh, yeah, we forgot the return statement. Let's try this again. All right, so as you can see, we have... Uh, rather long string except yeah there should be a space here let's try this again there we go so as you can see what's happening is we're storing not the strings as such but we're storing indices to parts of the string and then the parts of the string actually get kept into a static variable and then uh, to actually get the full name we, we simply take the elements from the strings for every single index, we only store the indices, so we store integers effectively, and we join them together, and that's how we synthesize the full username. So the first example of the flyweight design pattern that we're going to take a look at is going to do with text formatting. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a chunk of plain text and we're going to apply some formatting to it. And we're going to take a look at the different ways that you can actually do that. So I'm going to have a class called formatted text. And in the initializer, we're going to provide it with some plain text that we're going to store. And in addition, we're going to specify formatting. So let's suppose, for the sake of simplicity, that we want to capitalize certain letters in the plain text. Now, the question is, how do we specify which letters? And the most kind of obvious, but uh, the kind of brute force approach would be to simply make a Boolean array of the same length as the input text and simply specify the letters to be capitalized with true as opposed to false. So here, what I can do is I can say self.caps equals, so we'll grab a false, and we'll turn it into an array of length uh, plain text. So this way we'll actually have an array of false values, which we can subsequently flip to true whenever we want some letters capitalized. So then we can define a method called capitalize, where you specify the start and end positions of the letters you want to capitalize. And then for each of the positions, uh, so for i in range from start to end, what you can do is you can simply say self.caps at position i equals true. There we go. So this is how you would specify that you want to capitalize particular letters in the word. And now we can define str, which is actually going to print the word. So here I'll make a result list that will subsequently fill up. And then for uh, each uh, position i in the range of length of self.plaintext, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, grab that letter. So we're going to say c equals self.plaintext at uh, position i. And then we're going to append this to the result, but we're going to append it capitalized provided we have specified that we want to do so. So result.append, and here I'm going to append uh, c.upper uh, if self caps at position i, otherwise just append c, just append the non capitalized letter. And then I'm going to uh, return empty string.join the whole result. So this is how you would actually. Uh, get the uh, formatted text as opposed to the plain text. So let's take a look at how this can be used. Let's suppose I define some text. This is a brave new world. Let's suppose I want to capitalize the word brave. So what I do is I make a formatted text. Uh, I provide the text as the input and then I say ft.capitalize and I capitalize from 10th to 15th. Uh, position and then I can uh, print FT and if I run this you'll see that well we are getting the right output here we're getting this is a brave new world so everything is fine but the real problem here is if you imagine that instead of the sentence I have war and peace loaded up then I would be allocating far too many boolean values because here in self caps we are basically making a list of a particular size and that size relates to 
the size of the plain text. So maybe we don't want to be doing that because if if the size of the text itself is massive, then we're going to be allocating lots of data that uh, we mostly do not need. If you want to capitalize one word in a million words, it doesn't make sense to allocate a million boolean values. So let's let's do something different. And this is where the flyweight pattern is going to come in because we're going to uh, build a different formatted text. So let's have a class called better formatted text. So inside better formatted text, let's define the initializer once again. It's going to be very similar. It's going to have uh, uh, plain text as uh, the only input, which we're going to store. But in addition, we'll specify formatting as just an empty list. Now, you might be wondering, well, a list of what exactly? And the answer is that we're going to build a flyweight class called text range that's going to specify the range of characters, like the start and the end, as well as various uh, uh, formatting options. So uh, let's have an inner class called text range. And in here, in the initializer, what we can do is we can specify, obviously, the start and end positions. And we can also specify the various formatting, whether it's to capitalize or to make things bold, italic, whatever. So whatever options you want, you would add them here. I'm just going to add capitalize. So by default, capitalize is going to be equal to false. And then we can sort of uh, assign all of these effectively. So let's just uh, assign all of these, let's stick them into text range as attributes. And then we're going to have a utility method called covers, which determines whether or not this formatting covers. So this range, whether or not it covers a particular position. So def covers uh, position. And here, all I need to do is I need to check that position is between the start and the end. So I'm going to return uh, self.start uh, less than or equal to position less than or equal to self.end. There we go. So this is how you would uh, check whether or not uh, this text range covers a particular point. Now coming back to uh, the better formatted text class, so let me unindent it here, uh, we're going to have a utility method for actually getting a range. So for manufacturing a range, but also adding it to the formatting, because remember we have this list of all the formatting that's been added. That's the essence of the flyweight pattern. So essentially you return the flyweight, but you can also store the flyweight internally so that you know about it. So we'll have uh, a method called getRange where you specify uh, the start and end points. Start and end like so. So we make a range. So that's self.text range with a start and end. What we then do is we add this range to the formatting. So self formatting dot append uh, range. And we also return it. So we return it so that people can subsequently modify it. Like, for example, you can change capitalize there by capitalizing a chunk of text. And now, of course, when it comes to implementing STR, you have to take into account the formatting options that you have in this list. So you have to take every single one of them into account. Now, we only have uh, capitalization, but you could have other options here. So once again, we'll have a result as an empty list. And then we're going to go through every single position in the uh, in the overall uh, string. So for i in range length of self plain text. So here I'm going to say c equals self self plain text at position i. So we get the uh, we get the letter, and then uh, for every element in the formatting, for every um, range in self.formatting, we need to check whether or not somebody actually wants this particular letter capitalized. So we say if this range covers the position i, remember we have i as the index, and it wants to be capitalized, so and r.capitalized, then we change c to uh, c.upper, like so, and then of course we append uh, the letter c to the result, so result.append C and then of course we return empty string dot join result. So this is how you would uh, do the same operations using a flyweight. Let's actually uh, take a look at how this would work. So we make a better formatted text uh, where we specify the text and then we simply grab the range. So we say bft dot get range from 10 to 15. So that's our flyweight and then we uh, take it and we well let's capitalize a different word. Let's have 
uh, the word new capitalized. So from 16 to 19, uh, we say dot capitalize equals true, and that would capitalize that word, and we can print uh, BFT uh, once again. So let's run this. And as you can see, we have a capitalization in the right place because now we get this as a brave new world. So this has been an illustration of how you can use a flyweight to uh, save on memory as well as provide a more convenient API as well. All right, so let's try to summarize what we've learned about the flyweight design pattern. So the idea is fairly simple. We store all the common, all the repeating data externally. Then we specify some sort of index or reference into that external data store. And uh, we can also define this idea of ranges. So for example, if you need to refer not just to a single element, but apply something to a set of elements, you can define this idea of a range as uh, the starting and ending positions within some collection. And then you can apply this construct to an entire range, which once again saves a lot of memory. All right, now we're gonna talk about the proxy design pattern, a pattern which has many different incarnations. So what is the motivation for using the proxy? Well, let's suppose you are calling something simple, like you're calling foo.bar, for example. So this makes a lot of assumptions. For example, this makes the assumption that foo is in the same process as the function bar. And this might not necessarily be the case because sometime later on, you might decide to put all the foo related functionality into a separate process. So you now have have two processes running on the computer and you are calling uh, this function cross process. So you're marshalling the arguments from one process to another. And the question is, can you actually avoid changing the code that you wrote? So this is where proxies come to the rescue because a proxy typically provides the same interface that you're already used to, but the behavior underneath can be radically different. And this is an example of the so-called communication proxy, but in actual fact, there are lots of different proxy types. You can have a logging proxy, a virtual proxy, a guarding proxy, and so on and so forth. And we'll take a look at some of them in this section of the course. But essentially a proxy is a class which functions as an interface to a particular resource and that resource can be remote, it can be expensive to construct, or it may require logging or some other added functionality. And the way that the proxy adds it is such that your interface is typically unchanged. One of the simplest proxies that people build is a protection proxy. Now, a protection proxy is basically a proxy class that controls access to a particular resource. So let me show you how this can work. Let's suppose you have a car. So you have a car and you also have a driver. So let's start with the driver. Let's suppose that we just uh, initialize the driver to specify their name and age. And I'm just going to have these attributes like so, and then you uh, define the car. So you, you say that uh, whenever there is a car instantiated, you have to specify the driver of the car. And then uh, let's suppose that you have a method called drive. So you have a method called drive, and here we're just going to print that uh, the car is being driven. Uh, let's put the F in here so that we get the, uh, get the formatting. Car is being driven by, and then self driver dot name. There we go. So this is a scenario that we can already use. So uh, here we can uh, set up a car. Well, first of all, we can set up the driver. So driver equals driver uh, John uh, age 20. And then we can set up the car. So car equals car with the driver. And then we can say car.drive. And this gets the car to go somewhere. And if I run this, you can see that the car is being driven by John. Okay, so far so good. So what we can do now is uh, we can, for example, decide that we want age control. So we don't want to allow people who are too young to drive the car. Now, one option 
as always, would be to go back into the drive method and modify it so that it checks for the age. However, that violates the open close principle because you're not supposed to be modifying things which are already working. So it's certainly a possibility to go back into the drive method. And in some scenarios, that's exactly what you would do if you want to add additional functionality. But if you already, uh, if you're already committed to using uh, the underlying card functionality and you don't want to modify this functionality necessarily, what you can do is you can build a proxy which simply uh, changes the semantics of the drive method while having the same interface as before. So that's what we're going to build here. So uh, we're going to build a car proxy and this car proxy is going to act in a similar fashion which means we need the same interface. So we need the same initializer which takes a driver and here we do two things. So first of all we add the attribute for the driver as before. But in addition, what we can do is we can construct the underlying car right here in the car proxy. So we can say self.car equals car and provide the car the driver. So here we specify a fully initializing car effectively that we can uh, keep behind the scenes. Now, in, if we want to keep it behind the scenes, we can also make it somewhat less accessible by putting an underscore in here. That's kind of a hint that you shouldn't be accessing this car directly. You should only be using it uh, through the proxy. And now what we can do is we can define the drive method once again. But this time around, what we're going to do is we're going to check the age. So if self.driver.age is greater than or equal to 16, then everything is okay. The, uh, this person can drive the car, so we say self.underscore.car.drive. Otherwise, uh, what we do is we print some sort of error message. So we print uh, driver too young. There we go. Okay, so now coming back to our code here, what do we have to modify? to get this proxy to work. Well, in actual fact, the only thing we modify is this. So instead of using the car, we use a car proxy. But apart from that, no other change in code is required. And we can run this. And for now, we're getting the same result, obviously, because John is 20. But let's modify it. Let's put 12 here. And let's run this. And now we're getting a different message. We're getting a message that the driver is too young. So essentially, a protection proxy is a proxy which is used for access control. So it, it adds various access control functionality. For example, you can have a, a proxy that checks that the user has logged in in order to be able to use a particular feature. And that's something that you can add after the fact. So you've designed the underlying system, but then you want to have additional functionality. And so you build a proxy on top of that, maybe encapsulating the underlying object as an attribute, as we've done here, and then expose the same API or indeed parts of the same API in order to get that additional functionality. Another kind of proxy is called a virtual proxy. Now, a virtual proxy is basically a proxy that appears to be the underlying object, appears to be a fully initialized object, but in actual fact, it's not. In actual fact, it's masquerading the underlying functionality, and maybe it doesn't have the underlying functionality yet. So by virtual, what we mean is that for all intents and purposes, it appears like the object it's supposed to represent, but behind the scenes, it can offer additional functionality and behave differently. So I know it sounds a bit cryptic. Let me show you a, a concrete example of this. Let's suppose that you have some application where you manage people's photos, and so you have bitmaps of uh, whatever images you're storing, and uh, you have a class called bitmap. So a class called bitmap gets loaded from a file name. So let's suppose that somewhere in the initializer you specify the file name and then uh, you might, uh, let's say, store the file name. But in addition, you actually load the image from that file. So here I'm going to emulate it by basically writing that we are loading uh, the image from file name. So this is where you would load the image. And then when somebody wants to draw the image, uh, you have a method called draw and that is precisely what draws the image. So here we'll say drawing uh, image uh, self .file name as before. Okay, so uh, this looks like a, a nice little setup, but it's uh, it's a bit problematic. Let, let me show you why. Let's imagine that you have a, um, a function for drawing an image. Draw image. So you want to draw an image and you provide that image, which can be a bitmap, 
uh, at some point in time. Now let's also add additional diagnostic information. So I'm going to print about to draw image. I'll duplicate this and I'll say uh, done drawing the image, done drawing image. And in between these two printouts, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to call image.draw. So this is uh, a, just an ordinary piece of API, the kind of thing that you might want to write. And then let's see how you would use the whole thing. So you make a bitmap. Uh, uh, you make a uh, well. Let's let's start with an ordinary bitmap. So you make a bitmap and you uh, specify some uh, image uh, that you actually want to draw, and then you say draw image uh, BMP. So let's run this and let's see uh, what's going on and what, what exactly the problem is. So we're loading the image uh, in the initializer from facepalm.jpg. Uh, we're about to draw the image. We draw the image and then we are done drawing the image. So you might think, well, hold on, Dimitri, this is completely valid code. Why would you want to do anything with it? And the answer is that uh, what if you don't call draw? What if you don't actually draw anything? What if you just, uh, you know, just, just, comment this line out and not do anything. Well, if we run this, you'll see that we're still loading the image. And loading the image could be an expensive process. So the question is, well, how can we actually avoid loading the image if we're not drawing it? Now, uh, one approach would be, of course, once again, to go back into the bitmap class and modify it so that it doesn't actually load the image here, that it loads the image whenever you need to draw the whole thing. But let's imagine that uh, we're sticking to the open close principle. We're not modifying an existing bitmap class. Maybe it's a complicated class. Maybe we don't really understand what's going on there, and we still want uh, we still want uh, the underlying bitmap class to work as it is right now. So what can we do in order to get the API that we want and also the behavior that we want, meaning that the image gets loaded only when we actually draw it? And the answer is we build a virtual proxy. So a virtual proxy would lazily load the image. Let me show you how this can work. It's going to be a lazy bitmap. So a lazy bitmap, just like the underlying bitmap, takes a file name file name. There you go. And then what we do is we uh, store the file name. So we uh, stick it as an attribute. And in addition, what we're doing is we set self.bitmap. Let's actually put an underscore here just so that it it's obvious that it's not intended to be used directly. So self.underscore bitmap equals none. So as you can see at the moment, uh, we have an inner kind of uh, internal, shall we say, attribute called underscore bitmap, which is set to none. Obviously, this is something that we're going to assign, but we only assign it in the draw step. So when you go to draw the image, what happens is uh, if you have not set this underscore bitmap, that's when you initialize it. So on the first run of draw, that's when you actually initialize the image you loaded from a file into memory and not earlier than that, not in the initializer. So we say if not self dot underscore bitmap, then we can set it. We can say self dot underscore bitmap equals bitmap uh, self dot file name. So we're using the underlying bitmap as uh, well, the bitmap initializer in this case to set this particular attribute. And then, of course, we say self dot underscore bitmap dot draw. OK, so with this setup, we would have to go back here and we would have to change our code from bitmap to lazy bitmap. That's pretty much the only change that we would have to do here. And now what we can do is we can uncomment draw image and we can run this and just see the sequence of steps. So you'll notice that we're about to draw the image. So we're inside the draw image function and then we load the image from uh, the bitmap and then we draw the image and then we are done drawing the image. In actual fact, what I can do is I can sort of jump back into the code and let's duplicate this twice. Let's duplicate draw image twice and let's run it. And uh, as you can see, what's happening here is the loading only happens once. So we're drawing several times. We have all the output uh, done several times, but the loading happens only once. The virtual proxy only loads the image on first invocation. And subsequently, whenever somebody wants to draw something, it no longer performs the initialization. It just takes the bitmap it already has and uses it to actually draw something. So this is the gist of how you implement a virtual proxy.
So one of the things that's worth mentioning, since a proxy looks a lot like a decorator, is what exactly is the difference between the two. So the differences are as follows. First of all, typically proxy provides an identical interface to the object that it's proxying things to, whereas the decorator provides an enhanced interface. So the decorator, it decorates an object, it may replicate some of its APIs or indeed all of its APIs, especially if you're using reshopper, you're gonna get that uh, delegating members generated for free basically. So why not have the entire interface? But in addition, the decorator is designed specifically so that it adds additional functionality so that it adds additional operations, additional traits and so on and so forth. Now the decorator typically aggregates or has a reference to what it is decorating. So it typically takes uh, the decorated object as a constructor argument. That's certainly the implementation if you have a dynamic decorator. Now the proxy doesn't have to do this. And in actual fact, the proxy doesn't even have to uh, work with a materialized object, an object that exists. So for example, you could have a proxy providing an interface over an object that hasn't been constructed and that is being defined as a purely a lazy object which will only be made whenever there is a first call to that particular object. So you can think of a proxy in this way as a kind of implementation of lazy over the whole type, for example. All right, so let's try to summarize what we've learned about the proxy design pattern. So we saw that the proxy has the same interface as the underlying object. And to create a proxy, you simply replicate the existing interface of an object, and then you add the relevant functionality to the redefined member functions, for example, so that the behaviors you want are actually available on the proxy that somebody constructs. Now, there are lots of different types of proxies, and we've looked at some of them, but essentially their range is is unlimited and there are lots of uses for proxies in the real world. All right, let's talk about a design pattern called the chain of responsibility. So what is the motivation? Well, think about uh, a situation where you have unethical behavior by an employee of the company. And the question is who actually takes the blame? So in some cases, it might be just the employee. I mean, if it's something minor, then why not just blame the employee, maybe fire them or fine them or something like add a note to their record or something to that effect. But if this uh, unethical behavior was actually sponsored by the manager, if this is an institutional practice, you might want to blame the manager. Or if this is a company policy, then you could even go so far as to blame the CEO. So essentially we have this chain of responsibility which functions depending on how grievous the error is and how institutional the uh, unethical behavior actually is. Another example is, let's suppose you click an element on uh, a form. So you have a window and you click some graphical element like you click a button, for example. So uh, you might click a button and the button can handle uh, the event of you clicking and any further processing stops. But also let's suppose the button is on a group box. So if the button doesn't handle the event, maybe the underlying group box wants to handle the click or maybe the underlying window wants to handle the actual click. Here's another example. Let's suppose you have some collectible card game and you have uh, lots of creatures with attack and defense values. And these defense and attack values, they can be affected by other cards. And so you have this chain of responsibility where uh, one card can actually be boosted by other cards. And once again, this is the uh, situation where you would have the chain of responsibility design pattern. So essentially chain of responsibility is all about chaining several components which all get a chance to process something. So they get to process, for example, a command or a query, for example, and they also have uh, an optional way of providing some sort of default processing implementation as well as an ability to terminate the entire processing chain. In actual fact, we're going to see how a part of chain of responsibility can actually stop further processing. Let's imagine that you're programming some sort of uh, multiplayer game where all sorts of creatures are roaming the grounds and attacking one another and whatever, and you decide that you want to modify those creatures. So for example, a creature picks up a sword and suddenly gets a boost to attack or something. Let's see how we can model this scenario using the chain of responsibility design pattern. So first of all, I'll define the creature 
Uh, let's put uh, in the initializer the creature's name, its attack and defense values, and I'm simply going to uh, keep all of these like so. And uh, let's have some sort of string representation for the creature. So here I'll return uh, the creature's name. And in round brackets, I will return its attack and defense value. So self attack and self defense. Uh, defense. There we go. Okay, so let's imagine that as the creature walks around, it gets modified. So it gets these modifiers to its abilities. For making a modifier, we can define a base class. So let's have a class called creature modifier. So in the initializer, obviously, we need to specify the creature we're applying the modifier to, and we can store that, so we can store the creature, uh, and we can also specify what the next modifier in this chain is. Self next modifier equals none. Okay, so this part might be a little bit tricky. What's going on here? Well, the idea is that you can modify a creature more than once. You can have several modifiers on a creature. So, for example, a creature might uh, pick up a magic sword, but then a creature might eat a mushroom that actually decreases the value. So you want to apply those one after another. And so we build a modifier chain. And the way we're doing this is by effectively using methods. So effectively, next modifier is a function pointer. It references a function which we are going to call after this one. So now what you can do is you can build up this chain of modifiers. But before you do that, we also need to have some sort of handle method. So handle is uh, the location where this modifier gets applied to the creature. But of course, it might be only a single uh, modifier in this large chain of responsibility. That's the name of the design pattern. So uh, you have uh, creature modifiers which form this chain and every single one applies after another. So after this creature modifier, you might want to add another modifier. So def add modifier. So we have another modifier here and we need to add it to the chain. Now remember our chain is implemented using simply a reference to whatever the next element is. So if we already have the next element, of course, so if we already have uh, some sort of next modifier, then we call add modifier on the next modifier. So we say self dot next modifier dot add modifier and we specify the modifier. Otherwise, yes, that's where we actually store it. So we say self next modifier equals modifier. There we go. And now when it comes to actually applying the chain of responsibility to our object, we say if we have a next modifier, uh, then we call that modifier's uh, handle. Uh, self next modifier handle. You'll notice that because we're building a base class, our own handle method does not do anything by itself. It's up to the inheritors to actually uh, add particular value here. So how do we do this? Well, let's, uh, for example, double the creature's attack. So we'll have a modifier called double attack modifier, which inherits from creature modifier, like so. And here we can override the handle method. And inside here, what we can do is, uh, first of all, let's print some diagnostic information. So we are doubling the uh, creature name apostrophe s attack we're doubling the creature's attack and then we take self dot uh, creature dot attack multiply assign by two and then one critical thing here is that you have to call the base class handle because remember the base class as handle is the one that propagates the chain of responsibility it actually gets the other modifiers on the creature if there are any to work on it as well. So here we simply say super uh, dot handle and that takes care of this particular problem. So we can already start using this. Uh, so let's make a creature, say a goblin. Goblin and it's going to have uh, attack value of one and uh, defense value of one. Uh, we can print the goblin and then uh, well, we can uh, build the different modifiers. So here's the idea. You have a modifier root. So for this chain of responsibility implementation, you have a top level element. You have a root and that's a creature modifier. The class isn't abstract, so we're allowed 
to a build one, we provide the goblin as the subject, but this modifier doesn't do anything because we're using the base class. And remember, the base class handle doesn't really do anything at all. But what we can do is we can apply modifiers under the root. So we can say root dot add modifier and we can add that double attack modifier, double attack modifier goblin. And then uh, we can uh, invoke handle, of course. We can say root dot handle, this applies the modifiers and then we can print the goblin once again once the modifier has been applied. So let's see what we get here. Okay, so we're starting out with the goblin being a 1-1, one, one. then we're doubling uh, the goblin's attack. Where's my apostrophe? I lost the apostrophe. There should be an apostrophe here. And then uh, we are printing goblin as a 2-1 because we just doubled its attack. Now what you can do is you can apply a particular modifier more than once. For example, I can duplicate this and apply the double attack modifier twice. And if I run this, you can see that the goblin is now a 4-1. Uh, we can write additional modifiers, of course. For example, we can increase the defense of the goblin. So increase defense modifier, uh, creature modifier. Okay, so here once again we override the handle method. And, uh, well, I guess l l let's try to only increase defense if the creature's attack is less than or equal to 2. So it can be conditional. So if creature... If self.creature.attack is less than or equal to 2, then uh, we print that we are increasing uh, self-creature name uh, defense. And uh, uh, when then we actually do it. So self-creature defense plus equals 1. Let's increase it by 1. And then let's not forget calling super.handle. That handles the chain of responsibility for us, applying every single modifier inside this chain. Okay, so we can uh, we can use this uh, increase uh, defense modifier. So if I stick it in here, so if I stick it in here, it's actually not going to work. If we run this, you see that oh wait, no, it did work. So the goblin is now a four two. Why did it work? Well, because we're checking that the attack is less than or equal to 2 and the thing is at this point it's not yet so uh, if we were to relocate this let's sort of remove it from here and uh, put it here and then hopefully it would work this time round or maybe not yeah it works this time round so you can see it, goblin is now a 4-1 because the increased defense modifier uh, assumes that you need an attack value less than or equal to 2. So in the middle of these two double attack modifiers, it would in fact apply, but after Goblin's attack has been increased to 4, it no longer applies. Uh, one final thing I want to show you is, what if you want to disable all the bonuses? So for example, let's suppose the Goblin walks around, eats a mushroom, gets poison. Then you can build a no bonuses modifier. No bonuses. Uh, which is a creature modifier. If you apply this modifier, then no other modifier can be applied. And the way this is done is by implementing handle and then not calling super handle because uh, calling super handle is exactly what applies the entire chain. So here we can simply print no bonuses for you. And of course we can actually apply it to the goblin here. So I can say root dot add modifier, uh, no bonuses modifier. Uh, goblin and that's that's pretty much it so now if I run this you'll see that goblin is still a 1-1 one, one. none of the bonuses have been applied because we are not calling the base class handle like we do here or like we do here if we're not calling the base class handle it means we're not applying the chain of responsibility we're not applying all those modifiers and therefore the, the goblin can never actually be modified no matter how many modifiers you add to it So one thing worth mentioning is something called command query separation, a very well known and uh, popular idea. So the idea is that whenever we operate on objects, we separate all of the invocations into two different concepts, which are called query and command. So a command is something that you send when 
you are asking for an action or a change. So for example, you want to uh, set the attack value of a creature to two. So you're sending a command uh, which specifies that you need to modify. The thing you need to modify is the attack value and the new value you want to set it is equal to two. Another thing is query and query is asking for information without necessarily changing anything. So you're simply asking for uh, the system to give you a particular value, like please give me your attack value. And so we have something called CQS, which means that you have a uh, separate means of sending commands and queries. So instead of, for example, directly accessing a field of a particular class, what you do is you send it a message, either you send it a message telling it to please give me a, the contents of the field or you send a command which states please set the field to this particular value and thanks to the chain responsibility you can also have other listeners to this command being sent and they can override the behavior of the actual command or indeed the query In the previous example, we looked at how to apply a series of creature modifiers to a creature by invoking the base class handle method, which actually propagates the entire chain. Now, what if we wanted to have the uh, attributes applied immediately without having to call a handle and without any kind of action? What if we just wanted to apply modifiers as soon as a modifier entered the game, so to speak? Well, we can have this approach as well, but this is going to require quite a bit more work. So we're going to be using several different things in this particular demo. So what we're going to be building is something called an event broker. Now, in order to uh, build an event broker, you need events, and the event is a construct that we're going to take from our discussion of the observer design pattern. So you're going to see a construct here, which is going to be very simple, but it's discussed in the observer design pattern lectures. The other thing that we're going to be needing is something called command query separation, or CQS. Basically, the idea is that you have different subsystems for processing commands, i.e. things that ask you to do something and you can look at the command design pattern which follows this pattern in actual fact and queries which are requests for information that do not typically perform any modifications. So these three things, event broker, observer and CQS are going to be used in this demo. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to import an implementation of events. So here is what an event looks like. So an event is essentially a list of functions that you can call. And we're going to use this in our broker implementation. So let's define the creature as we did previously, but this time around things are gonna be slightly different or significantly different in actual fact. So we're gonna build a creature. Here is the initializer. Let's suppose that the creature has a name, attack, and defense values, but this time around, it's also going to reference a central broker, the event broker, which actually is going to take care of our chain of responsibility, and that's going to be called game because every creature is part of a game. So we'll have a reference to game. We'll have the name of the creature as well as initial attack and defense values. Notice I'm saying initial, I'm not saying final. So uh, let's assign these. So let's take care of game and name. And then uh, let's take care of attack and defense. But I want to be explicit here that these are initial values. Remember the modifiers actually change the attack and defense values. So they take the initial values and then they do something to them. So now what we want to do is we want to implement a query mechanism for getting the creature's actual attack value, incorporating any modifiers that might exist. So let's take a look at how this can work. We can build this using a property, and this property can be called attack. So when you want the actual attack value here, what we're going to do is we're going to perform a query using the event broker. Remember, the event broker is the game, and we have to define it somewhere. So let's define it right here. So this is going to be a separate class called game. Uh, and let's uh, first of all do the initializer. Now in the initializer, what we're going to do is we're going to define an event called queries. So I'm going to say self.queries equals event. So this event is something that anybody can subscribe to whenever somebody sends a query. So here's the idea. Somebody sends a query for a creature's attack, but the modifiers can listen to this event and they can modify the returning value. So we'll have some sort of method for actually performing the query. Perform query 
where you specify the sender of the query, who's actually asking, and then you specify the query itself. And then you invoke on the event. So you say self.queries and you call on the event with the sender as well as the query. Now the question is, well, what is a query? How do you define a query? That requires additional uh, information on our part. So first of all, we need to define what kind of information we are querying. Now, in our case, we can query either the attack or defense values. So we'll have an enum class, what to uh, query. It's going to be an enum. And uh, here I'll have either attack or defense. There we go. So now the query itself can be composed of uh, the name of the creature, whose attributes you want to query, and which attribute you want to query, and you can also provide a default value as well. That's going to be particularly important. Um, so uh, let's have class query. Uh, let's define the initializer for it. So what do we take? Well, we take the creature's name. Uh, we define what to query, that's our enum from above, and we also specify the default value in case nobody wants to modify it. Okay, so here's the interesting thing. We assign a creature name. We assign what to query. Uh, we assign the default value, but we change the naming, so the name is not default value internally, it's just value. And the reason for that is that even though we're storing the default value, creature modifiers are going to modify this value, and they might return something completely different. So it's not the default value we're storing in the query, it's the actual value that uh, subsequently other handlers of the event can modify. So coming back to uh, a query for the attack value, what we do here is we don't just return the default value obviously because there might be other modifiers which are actually affecting this. So we build a query where the name of the creature is self.name. Uh, the parameter we're querying is what to query dot attack and uh, the initial value is self initial attack. So we then send off this query so we say self.game dot perform query uh, providing this query and then we return q dot value. There we go. Okay, so with this setup, the only thing that's missing is uh, being able to uh, apply modifiers. But we also need a couple of other things of plumbing. So first of all, let's uh, also define the defense value. So I'll define the uh, defense value. So in this case, um, we query uh, defense, obviously, and then we use the initial defense value uh, when starting the query initial defense like so and then we want some sort of string representation so let's have def sdr here and I'm going to return um, a formatted text once again I'll say self.name and then uh, in round brackets I will use the attack and defense values but notice I'm going to be using the properties here I'm not going to be using the default values but rather the properties so it's going to be self.attack and uh, self.defense there we go so this is information about the creature essentially um, so uh, with this setup, uh, we need uh, to do a few more things because we need to somehow define the modifiers. But let's actually get some code running at least. So let me at least show you something. So I'll make a game. So here is a game and I'll make a goblin, uh, which is a uh, creature. Uh, it's a creature in the game. So we specify the game. Then comes the name. Let's say it's a strong goblin. And it's going to be two by two, so two attack and two defense, and we can print the goblin, at least. So let's just see that this works. All right, uh, clearly it doesn't work. There's a missing positional argument to perform query. Remember, we have to specify who the sender is here. So the sender is self. There we go. That's one thing we forgot. And um, uh, let's see what else is wrong here. So the same thing goes uh, for this part. Uh, let's try this once again and now we have the correct output so we have a strong goblin which is a 2-2 okay so we've already done a lot but in this event broker setup we need to do a lot more because we want modifiers so we're going to have an abstract base class for uh, a creature modifier so class creature modifier is going to be an abstract base class this time around uh, we'll initialize it so here uh, we initialize it by providing the game as well as the creature that is actually affected by this modifier. So we'll store all of them like so. But what we also need to do is we need to take that queries event and we need to uh, handle it. 
we need to handle the queries event ourselves because essentially we want to be able to somehow change the queries so that the returned value is modified. So we say self.game.queries.append and we append some method self.handle. Now, in this particular case, in an abstract base class, we'll have uh, the handle method being completely empty. So you take the sender as well as the query, uh, but you don't really implement this. It's just going to be a pass in here. Okay, so that's uh, one thing. What else do we want? Well, um, for now, it's going to be uh, is going to be enough and we're going to just just leave it as is and we're going to build actual modifiers like let's say a double attack modifier so a double attack modifier using the event broker approach where you inherit from creature modifier looks like this so let's override the uh, handle method here and what we're going to do is we're going to uh, basically check whether or not in this particular query the sender is uh, the, the name of the creature we have ourselves applied to and somebody's querying the attack value. So if the uh, sender name is equal to uh, self.creature.name and uh, the second requirement is a query dot what to query is in fact the attack value. So what to query dot attack, then then things are fine. Then, then we can actually handle this, and we can, uh, we can, we can actually take care of this. So then we take the query value, and we multiply assign it by two. So we double the query. That's how a double attack modifier would actually work. So, having made this, what we can do is we can already build a double attack modifier. So we build a double attack modifier. Uh, specifying the game as well as the goblin and uh, as soon as it's built it's already applied which means if we print the goblin the double attack modifier is going to intercept our query for the goblin's attack value and actually modify it. So uh, here is the output and you can see that we now get a strong goblin with an attack value of 4 because it's been doubled by the modifier. So in a similar fashion, you can add other modifiers, like for example, an increased defense modifier. But we, what you can also do is you can make sure that these modifiers have a lifetime so that you can use them using the with keyword. And as soon as the, they go out of scope, as soon as you drop out of the scope, the modifier no, no longer applies. So let's take a look at how to do that. Essentially, the idea is uh, simple. You define the enter and exit uh, here, so uh, inside the creature modifier, we're going to define enter. So that's what happens when you are just entering uh, the with block. So here you return self, there's no magic to be done here, but in the exit, that's where things get interesting because this is where you have to unsubscribe. You have to remove yourself from the handlers. So here you say self.game.queries dot remove self.handle. So you effectively remove yourself from the set of uh, listeners to the queries event and therefore you no longer apply uh, the modifier. So how does this work? Well, we can uh, change this code. So here I can say with and with the double attack modifier on the goblin, I can print the goblin, but then I can print the goblin again when we exit the scope. So now let's run this and let's see what we get here. So you can see when we enter the scope, the double attack modifier gets applied. We get a 4-2 goblin. Effectively, the attack has doubled. But as soon as we exit the scope here, you can see that we are now back to a 2-2 goblin because we've unsubscribed from the query. So we no longer modify the query and therefore uh, this modifier does not apply. So this has been quite an evolved demo in implementing an event broker using the event construct and uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. Hopefully you can see how this is a more kind of real-time implementation because essentially what's happening here is you no longer have to explicitly apply the modifiers. You no longer have to explicitly invoke the chain of responsibility. Instead, it happens automatically and the key aspect that makes the whole thing to happen is uh, first of all the use of events as well as a centralized construct which we call an event broker in this case it's called game
All right, so let's try to summarize the things that we've learned about the chain of responsibility design pattern. So the general idea is rather simple. You can implement the chain of responsibility either as a linked list of references, typically references to methods, for example, or you can have some sort of centralized construct which simply keeps a list of objects and then kind of pings each object, for example, using the observer pattern like we looked at in the event broker example. So uh, the idea is very simple in both of these cases. You basically have several objects which have uh, responsibilities. So they form a chain responsibility. So you enlist them in the chain. So you add them to the chain one after another. And theoretically, you can control their order as well. If you want one item to, for example, have higher processing power than the other item, having higher priority, for example, you can control their order as well. And then you sort of fire off the chain and you walk through the chain and every element of the chain can actually stop the processing. So every element, in addition to just passing the ball along and doing its own thing, it can also stop the processing and prevent the information from proceeding to other elements of the chain as well. So uh, the removal of elements from the chain can be controlled as well. So for example, you can define the exit method, which can effectively uh, ensure that whenever you're done using the object, it actually removes itself automatically from whatever chain of responsibility in which it was originally enlisted. In this section of the course, we're going to take a look at the command design pattern. So what is the command pattern all about? Well, if you think about an ordinary statement, like for example, a variable assignment, then this ordinary statement is what I would call perishable. What I mean is that if I assign a member, for example, I cannot undo this operation. There is no way for me to say, oh, wait, I'm changing my mind here. I want to go back to this. Another problem is that I cannot directly serialize a sequence of actions. I cannot save them to a file. I cannot record them in an audit database. And sometimes this is very important. Sometimes you want to make a note of every action that was made in the system so that you can play it uh, you can play it like a replay kind of thing. You can audit those events, for example. You want a record of what's actually happening. And yes, sometimes you do want to undo those things to roll back some change that you made. So we want an object that represents an operation so that we can subsequently not just process that operation by looking at the object, but also record that this operation actually took place and maybe even use that recording to subsequently uh, sort of move it back. So for example, you might want to have an object which specifies that a person should change its age to the value 22. So this would be not just an operation, obviously you would take the person and you would change the person's age to 22, but in addition, you would actually record the fact that that happened, that somebody requested it. Uh, another example, for example, would be uh, specifying that a car should uh, do some operation called explode. So in this case, once again, you would explode the car, obviously, but in addition, you would have a record of who actually asked for the car to be exploded so that when you're trying to find someone to blame for all the wreckage and stuff, you can say, ah, this was requested by this and that component, and it was run from this system, for example. So having a record of what actually happens is particularly useful. So uh, there are lots of uses of the command pattern. Uh, when you look at uh, graphical user interfaces, like when you use uh, applications for editing text where you can uh, copy a selected element by pressing Control C or by right clicking the mouse and choosing copy or by choosing something in the toolbar that is typically uh, that is typically invoking commands and those commands are packaged as separate objects. Another thing to uh, keep in mind is when you see things like multi-level undo and redo functionality that is typically implemented by commands that also know how to undo themselves, how to roll back the previous state of whatever system they were modifying. And then there is the whole business of macro recording. That's when you record a sequence of commands so that you can play back that sequence once again when you need to. So the definition of the command pattern is that a command is quite simply an object which represents an instruction to perform a particular action. And the command typically contains all the information that is necessary for this action to be taken. We're going to take a look at the command design pattern by considering an example that probably everybody uh, uses that talks about design patterns and the command pattern, and that is the example of a bank account. So let's suppose you have a bank account. Now let's say we have some overdraft limit. Uh, I'll just define it like so. 
of draft limit, let's say minus 500 is the lowest you can go. When you initialize the bank account, you can specify the starting balance. So when we initialize, we can have a starting balance or it can be zero by default. So then we just uh, uh, store the attribute like so. And uh, let's suppose that we want to support uh, the operations for depositing money into the account as well as withdrawing money, assuming you're not withdrawing too much. So first of all, the deposit operation where you uh, deposit a particular amount. This one's easy. You just say uh, self.balance incremented by the amount. Let's also print some diagnostic information so that we see what's going on. So I'm going to print that we deposited a certain amount and uh, uh, the uh, balance is now equal to uh, self.balance. There we go. So this is the deposit operation. The withdrawal operation is a bit more complicated because we need to make sure that the person isn't going over their overdraft limit. So withdraw, once again, uh, the uh, amount is specified here. So we need to make sure that uh, the current balance minus the amount withdrawn is greater than or equal to the overdraft limit. So if self-balance minus amount is greater than or equal to uh, the overdraft limit, so bank account dot overdraft limit, uh, then we can perform the withdrawal. So we say self balance minus equals the amount. So we take out the amount, we print some diagnostic information. So we print um, withdrew uh, a certain amount and uh, uh, the balance is equal to self dot balance. There we go. So this is how we would uh, basically check that uh, you have enough money to take out. And if you do, then go ahead, take the money, spend it on whatever. Let's define STR as well, just so we get some uh, diagnostic information. So return balance equals self dot balance. There we go. So we have a bank account that you could work with directly, meaning you don't really have to uh, you don't really have to implement the command pattern. You can just go ahead and grab bank account. You can instantiate it. You can uh, deposit money, withdraw money. Everything will work. Now let's imagine that uh, we are working with a real bank. A real bank obviously has to keep a record of every transaction that's going on. So if you just call these methods, deposit and withdraw, there is no record anywhere that they were actually invoked. So what you might want to do is instead of calling them directly, what you might want is to provide uh, some sort of interface for calling commands. And these commands, not only can they be invoked, but they uh, can also be recorded, like for an audit log, for example, and they can also be undone as well, which is a, an interesting side benefit of the implementation of the command pattern. So let's take a look at how this works. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to define an interface for a command. Now, this isn't strictly speaking necessary because we're in Python and everything works through duct typing, but I think it's a good idea because it, it sets your expectations on what a command can do. So I'm going to define a class called command, and this is going to be an abstract uh, class. So I'm just going to define the interface. Basically, we'll have two operations. We'll have invoke, uh, which actually calls the command. Notice I'm not using the built-in call uh, method name. Instead, I'm calling this invoke just to be explicit about the fact that this is the invocation of the command that you can uh, put a, use the dot notation to invoke on it. So here I'll put a pass and the same goes for undo, which is something that, well, we can take a look at it in, in, a, in a moment. Uh, let's start with invoke. So a command is something that you can invoke and now we can build a bank account command. So a bank account command obviously has to implement the uh, command interface. Uh, let's first of all define uh, the initializer for uh, the uh, bank account command. So we need to uh, know what account to operate on. We need to know what action to perform and the amount of money that needs to be withdrawn or deposited, one of these. So uh, speaking of action, uh, it's up to you how to implement this, but one option would be to simply put it in an enum. So we'll have a class action, which is an uh, enum. Once again, I need the import for this. Uh, so uh, we'll have two actions. We have an action to deposit some money and to withdraw some money. So depending on this, we perform the requisite operation. So here, all we do is we uh, store all of these in attributes. Uh, like so, and uh, the amount as well. 
There we go. And in addition, well, actually, that's it for now. That's, we're going to stick with this. So now we need to uh, define the invoke method. We need to define the invoke method because that's part of the interface. We have no choice but to define it. So here we check the kind of action that's required. So if uh, self action is equal to uh, self.action.deposit, if somebody wants to deposit some money, then we perform the deposit. So we say self.account.deposit self.amount, so we deposit the uh, requisite amount. Otherwise, if uh, self-action is self-action.withdraw, action.withdraw, then we withdraw the money. Uh, so we say self.account.withdraw, uh, self.amount, there we go. So this is how you would uh, implement the bank account command very simply and we can already start using it uh, we can already build something so here I will make a bank account and uh, by default it's going to uh, be empty it's going to have zero dollars in it so then what we can do is uh, instead of just calling uh, deposit or withdraw on it we create a bank account command so we say cmd equals bank account command like so, and what we put in the command is the account to operate on, which is BA. We also need to specify the action, so this would be uh, bank account uh, command dot action dot deposit, and let's say we want to deposit a hundred dollars. So then we do cmd dot invoke, and then uh, we print what happened after the uh, one hundred dollar deposit. So what happened uh, with the bank account? Stick the F in here and put B A. All right, so let's take a look at whether this works and if it does work, what it gives us. All right, so as you can see, everything works correctly. We deposited 100 and the balance is now 100. So far, so good. And similarly, uh, you can withdraw money and that should hopefully work or not work if you're going over the overdraft limit. Okay, so one side effect of uh, command is that you can also implement undo operations right inside the command. So in addition to performing the command with invoke, you can also define a new interface member called undo, which does the reverse. It basically rolls back the change that you made. However, this particular implementation, if you decide to do undo, it's going to change pretty much everything that we do around bank account command. And you'll see why in a moment. So let's imagine that we decide to uh, perform undo operations. So down, down here, we'll define an undo method. And let's suppose that uh, we we try to be symmetric. We try to uh, make sure that if you want to undo a deposit, you undo a deposit by making a withdrawal and vice versa. It's not strictly speaking the most correct way of undoing bank account operations, but it will do for our demo. So here we do the opposite of what our action is. So if the action is, uh, if the action happens to be, uh, let's say a deposit, uh, then we perform the withdrawal. So we say self.account.withdraw, self.amount. Otherwise, if self action is uh, self.action.withdraw, then we do the deposit. Self account dot deposit, uh, self dot amount. Okay, so this might seem like correct code, and we can actually try uh, invoking it. So we can, after we deposit the $100, what we can do is we can do cmd.undo, and then uh, we can print uh, we can print this after the 100 deposit has been undone. So after we have undone this, we can print uh, the bank account once again. So let's see what this gives us, uh, and everything should be uh, more or less fine uh, in this particular scenario. So we uh, deposit a hundred dollars. The balance is a hundred. So after a hundred, uh, after the one hundred dollar deposit, everything is okay. And then we undo that deposit by withdrawing one hundred, and the balance now goes back to zero. So everything seems correct. However, what I, I want to show you is uh, how it can all go wrong how it can all go terribly wrong. And let me show you, uh, let's do an illegal command. Let, let's do a command which cannot really be invoked on this account. And that is the 
uh, the action of withdrawing a large sum of money. Let's say you want to withdraw $1,000 and that should fail. So I'm going to make a legal command. So this illegal command is going to be another bank account command where we, tr we try to withdraw. So it's going to be bank account command dot action dot withdraw. We try to withdraw $1,000. Okay. So I invoke this illegal command. Well, it's legal. It's just not supposed to work. And then uh, let's print something out. So after uh, impossible withdrawal. BA and then we're going to undo this command so uh, illegal command dot invoke happens here and illegal CMD dot undo happens here and then we can print um, uh, what happens after the undo okay prepare for a surprise so I run this and you'll notice something weird so uh, we uh, uh, do the impossible withdrawal and of course, it's impossible because we have a balance of zero. We don't have any money in the account after we undid the 100. So we have a balance of zero. We try to withdraw and we fail as the system should fail. But then notice what happens. For some reason, when we call undo, we deposit a thousand. So even though the operation failed, we still undid it as if it succeeded. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us one thing that we need to track whether or not a particular operation has in fact succeeded. So we can go into, let's say, into the bank account command and we can add a success flag here. Self.success. But to begin with, we don't know if the operation succeeded or not, so we're going to set it to none. And we're also going to set it to true or false depending on how the whole thing went. So let's go into invoke. Now, obviously, uh, when you uh, perform a deposit, uh, whatever happens, it's going to succeed because a deposit is, well, somebody's putting money into the account. So we'll say self.success uh, equals true. Uh, that operation will succeed. However, the withdrawal, we don't really know. We don't really know whether the withdrawal uh, will actually work. So we need to go back, unfortunately, into withdrawal and we need to modify it uh, so that instead of uh, not returning anything, uh, the withdrawal method is going to return true or false depending on whether it actually succeeded. So if we're in this if here, we can return true, specifying that everything went okay. Otherwise, we can return false, specifying that something went wrong and we don't have enough money and so it didn't work. Now, this flag can subsequently be used down here when you actually withdraw stuff because then what you can do is you can set the success flag to the result of the withdrawal operation. So I can say self.success equals self-account withdrawal. And that way we're storing either true or false depending on whether that operation succeeded. Now what we need to do is we need to make sure that we only undo if the operation actually succeeded. So what we put here is we say if not uh, self.success we simply return. We don't perform the undo operation at all because it doesn't make sense. If it didn't succeed there is no reason to undo something that didn't succeed. So with all of this set up let's now try running uh, the program again and now this time around it's actually working correctly in the sense that after the impossible withdrawal we're still on a balance of zero and after the undo which does absolutely nothing at all we're still on a balance of zero. So this is how you can implement the command pattern and also support undo operations as well. In the previous lesson, we looked at how to implement the command pattern on a bank account, how to get uh, the bank account to process commands and how to undo commands as well. Now, if you think about a typical operation involving two parties, let's say two bank accounts, let's say you want to transfer the money from one bank account to another bank account, the question is, well, how can you do this? How can you orchestrate this in the most uh, in the nicest way. On the one hand, you could go ahead and just make two commands. So you make one command for the withdrawal from bank account one and another for depositing to bank account two. And that should, that should work to some degree. But uh, this isn't so good once again because of failure. So let me, let me show you how uh, this can uh, fail in a very uh, primitive kind of setting. So what we're going to do uh, in this example is instead of uh, writing a script, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be writing tests. So I'll have a class called test suite 
uh, which is going to uh, use unit test of test case and we're actually going to be writing tests so we'll be writing tests for uh, making sure that the uh, transfer command that we're about to build actually works okay so uh, the first test that we're going to do is just to uh, just to try and run the commands one after another and see what the what the result is and we'll try to put them together into some sort of composite uh, construct for us to use. So the test is going to be called test composite deposit and what we're going to do is uh, we'll just uh, well to begin with let's just try doing two deposits into a bank account so we're not going to deal with the transfer yet we're not transferring money from A to B we just want to perform two deposits but we want to perform them as a single command so for this what you would build is you would build a composite bank account command so uh, let's let's actually uh, build it up here. So a composite bank account command is essentially a list of commands, but it is also itself a command. And, and this is an illustration of the composite design pattern. So it masquerades as both a single command, uh, but it's actually a list of several commands. So in order to get this to actually work, we need to implement uh, the overall interface. So let's put the uh, initializer in here, first of all. So we initialize this, uh, uh, this composite with a uh, set of items that uh, can be empty by default. And then what we need to do, first of all, is uh, call the base class to uh, initialize the whole thing. And then uh, we, uh, for every single item that is provided to us, we just append it to ourselves. So for i in items, self.append i, uh, simple stuff. So we add all the commands that are added to us. And then whenever somebody wants to invoke, so uh, def invoke, uh, then we just go through every single command and we invoke it. So for x in, uh, in self, uh, we say x.invoke. There we go. And for the uh, undo, uh, if you want to implement undo, we simply undo each of the uh, each of the consistent commands, but we do it in reverse order because the last command that got applied has to be the first one to be undone. So here we define undo, and we just say for uh, x in reversed self, and uh, we go ahead and we say x dot undo. So this is how you can implement basically a composite command. So it is both a command as well as a list of commands. It has the same interface as commands, so it's very easy to use. Okay, so let's see how we can uh, we can use all of this and actually get get our first test running. So let's make a bank account. There we go. There's a bank account, and we're going to perform two deposits. So deposit one equals bank account command. And here, uh, bank account, uh, the command, the action is deposit. So bank account command dot action dot deposit. And the amount is, let's say, 100. And uh, let's duplicate this. Let's have another deposit. So we'll duplicate this. And we'll have deposit 2, uh, where the amount might be, I don't know, 50. So we expect the final value to be 150 after all of the commands are complete. OK, so what we do now is we initialize the composite command. So composite uh, is a composite bank account command uh, where we sp simply provide the list of commands, which is deposit 1 and deposit 2. And we invoke this command. So we say composite.invoke. Uh, here, what we can do is we can print uh, the bank account. And then uh, we can try undoing the composite. So composite dot undo and print the bank account once again. So this is a fairly simple unit test. Let's actually run this and let's see what we get here. Well, oh, we would run this as soon as we actually uh, provide uh, uh, the appropriate implementation. So here uh, we uh, call unit test main. Uh, what do we provide here as the argument? Uh, I can't recall. Is it empty? Yeah, it works with just empty arguments. OK, so as you can see, uh, all of the tests pass, and we uh, we see good results. So we deposited 100, balance is 100. We deposited 50, balance is 150, so everything is OK. And then we undo. So we undo the 50, first of all. 
and we get to a balance of 100, and then we undo the 100, we end up with a balance of zero. So everything is working so far. There's absolutely no problem. And we can already start thinking about maybe transferring money from one account to another, uh, but it's going to be uh, somewhat tricky. So let me show you a scenario of failing in actual fact scenario where uh, you might just try to build a composite out of a withdrawal and a, and a deposit and kind of see it work. So let's have two bank accounts. Uh, I'm going to define a new test, test, uh, test, transfer, fail. So this one is going to fail. So we'll have bank account one, and it's going to be a bank account with $100 in it, and we'll have bank account two which is going to be empty, so zero dollars on this account. And then we want to perform the transfer, but we want to perform it as part of this composite arrangement. So we'll have it as a withdrawal command and a deposit command as well. So the uh, let's specify the amount we want to transfer. Let's say we want to transfer 100 uh, to begin with. So the full amount from bank account one is going to go into bank account two. So uh, let's make the withdrawal command. So this is where we make a bank account command. And this one operates on BA1. Uh, the uh, bank account command dot action is uh, withdrawal, and uh, the amount is obviously amount. And then the uh, deposit command DC is going to be a bank account command where we specify BA2 as the uh, as the account, and we specify bank account command dot action dot deposit and specify the amount as well. So now we can define the transfer. So the transfer is a composite bank account command which takes uh, W uh, withdrawal command, I wanted it, WC and DC. WC and DC. So this is the transfer command. We can invoke this command, transfer dot invoke. So we uh, call on it. We can now print the state of the bank accounts. So let's do that. Uh, so we'll print uh, BA1, BA1, and BA2. It's going to be BA2. And then uh, let's try undoing this command. So transfer.undo. So we try to undo the uh, whole composite command. And we can uh, just copy this and see what the what the state is right now. So once again, let's let's run the whole thing. This is going to run every single test, unfortunately, so we get to see far too much data. But uh, the, the part that we want is uh, obviously the part at the bottom, uh, this part. And if you look at it, uh, you'll see that uh, in actual fact, everything everything is fine. Everything is absolutely fine. So we uh, withdraw 100 and uh, the balance is zero, and then we deposit 100, so the balance is 100 on the new account. So after all the operations, so this is the line you should be looking at, after all the operations, uh, the balance on the first account is zero, the balance on the second account is 100, and when you undo, they all go back to normal. The first balance is 100, the second balance is zero. So you might be wondering, well, hold on, uh, didn't you just say that this entire test is going to fail? Well, in actual fact, yes, it is. Because imagine you're trying to transfer a amount of money that uh, you don't have in the first account. What do you think would happen here? Now, in the previous example, we had this success flag. But unfortunately, now the success of the first command has to be implicitly tied to the success of the second, or everything is going to fail. And unfortunately, this is not implemented yet. So when I run this, uh, when I run this, you'll see that uh, after the change that is performed, the balance on the first account is a, a hundred, and the balance on the second is one thousand. Uh, that's not very good, is it? Because there's obviously nobody actually took the one thousand because there's nowhere to take it from. So why would it be one thousand? And the answer is very simple: that we simply performed an operation that seemed uh, seemed sensible, but uh, really we didn't have the money to take. So the first operation failed. WC failed, and therefore the second operation, the deposit, should have failed as well. So there should be some kind of tie in between those two commands. Somebody should have maybe checked that there is uh, a dependency uh, between the two commands. So the question is, well, how do we now implement this? Well, we have to go back into our definition of command, and this time around, uh, we have to give it uh, a uh, an attribute for success. So instead of just putting it into a bank account command, uh, which is what we did right here, 
uh, what we're going to do is we are now going to put it into the base class. So let's get rid of it here and let's put it into the command itself. So here in command, I'm going to define an initializer and here I'm going to say self.success equals, well, let's put it to false. Let's assume that a command has failed unless we have explicit proof that it succeeded. So now what happens is in the uh, constructor, you have to add the superclass call. And if you don't, then your ID will probably complain to you that you are forgetting to do that. So it's good that we have IDs to remind ourselves of this. And now we need to actually make use of this inside all of our composite command. So we're going to build a special command. We're going to build a money transfer command. Now this money transfer command is going to be slightly more sophisticated than just a composite bank account command. It's going to take it to a whole new level by tying in the commands together. Okay, so I'm gonna have a class called money transfer command is going to inherit from composite bank account command. There we go. Okay, so uh, the initializer is going to be uh, quite uh, interesting because we specify the from account. So that's the account from which we're taking the money. We specify the to account and we specify the amount that we want to transfer. Now here comes the interesting part. Since we're inheriting from uh, uh, the composite bank account command and that takes uh, the initializer takes a list, we can simply do a super call where we uh, call in it, uh, providing that list. So here is the list, and now the list has to have two bank account commands, one for, for the withdrawal and one for the deposit, just as before. So here I'll have a bank account command. Uh, so from account, and uh, then let's... Uh, let's add the action so bank account command dot action dot withdraw so we want to withdraw the amount from the first account and then we want to deposit it to the second one so bank account command to account uh, bank account command dot action dot deposit and we deposit uh, the appropriate amount into the second account so it might look like it's just like the use of the composite uh, that we had previously, but I'm going to do a trick. I'm going to override the invoke method and I'm going to do something different here. So let's define invoke. Okay, so now I'm going to have a flag called OK, which is going to tell us whether the previous operation actually succeeded. Now I'm going to say it's true by default. And then we're going to go through every single command inside our cells because remember, we're still a composite. We're still a composite bank account command. We'll go through every command, so for CMD in self, and we're going to do the following. If everything is okay, if everything is okay, then we continue invoking the command. So we say cmd.invoke, and then we set okay to the success of this command, uh, cmd.success. Remember, we added success at the command level now, so it's easier to access. Otherwise, we don't do anything. We don't invoke the command because something obviously went wrong, and we simply say cmd.success equals false because obviously something failed here. So this is how you would set up the money transfer command. And we can now write yet another test. Uh, so let me uh, let me actually comment out these tests so they don't uh, they don't particularly annoy us. And I'm going to write the new test, uh, which is going to uh, actually show the much better transfer. So be test better transfer. There we go. Okay, so I'll make two bank accounts. So BA1 is going to be a bank account. Uh, with a balance of 100. BA2 is going to be a bank account uh, with balance of zero. The amount I'm going to t take is 100 to begin with, just to show you that it does work. So here is the transfer. So the transfer is a money transfer command from BA1 to BA2, and the amount is the amount we specify. Uh, then we perform the transfer, so transfer.invoke, and then we can uh, print uh, the state of BA1 and BA2. Let me just grab it from here and I'll just uh, paste it down here. Um, we can perform the undo. So transfer dot undo and then uh, print the state. Uh, again, I can also print uh, the uh, success whether the operation succeeded. So I can take transfer dot success and that will tell us whether the transfer actually succeeded or failed. So let's run all of this. And um, as you can see what happens here as we transfer from uh, BA1 to BA2, 
Uh, let's see what's going on. So we withdrew 100 from uh, BA1. We deposited 100 to BA2. So everything is okay here. But for some reason, we're getting this, this weird false. So even though everything kind of went correctly, we're, we're still getting the false here for the overall operation. Let's see what's going on because it might be, uh, there might be a problem somewhere in our, in our processing of the whole thing. All right, so I think what we need to do is after the invocation succeeds or fails indeed, we need to save it and that's one thing that we didn't do. So here we would say self.success equals okay. So depending on whether this went right or wrong, we'll, we would actually save this value and now let's run this. Yeah, that's much better. Now we have a true here. So uh, this is basically a demonstration of how you would set up a composite command, which is sometimes also called a macro. So basically just a sequence of commands that you want to string together. But in the money transfer command, I am demonstrating additional difficulties that you might have when setting up the composite. So if you want all the steps to succeed or fail, then you have to perform additional steps like I did here. So I introduced a flag here, which tells us whether or not the whole thing has succeeded or failed. And therefore, when we perform the undo, we actually don't uh, mess up and actually I can prove it just putting uh, 1000 here instead of 100 let's run this once again and you can see that here we have uh, no change so we start out with a balance of 100 and 0 and we end up with a balance of 100 and 0 and the value here is false because the operation couldn't succeed because there is no money to actually transfer so this is how you implement the composite command design pattern All right, so let's try to summarize what we've learned about the command design pattern. So essentially what you do is you encapsulate all the details of some operation in a separate object, and then you define the instruction for applying the command, and you can do that either in the command itself, or you can define it somewhere externally by some sort of command processor, for example. You can also optionally define instructions for undoing the command. And uh, finally, you can also create composite commands. And these would be typically called macros. So you can define a sequence of commands to be processed one after another. The interpreted design pattern is a curious one because essentially it encompasses everything that we do. I mean, we work with compilers and interpreters and uh, everything that we do as developers involves the interpretation of text by the computer. But actually uh, the interpreter design pattern is all about textual input mainly. So you type in your code and somebody has to compile it. So we have this need of processing uh, textual input, for example, turning text into object-oriented structures. So here are some examples. For example, we have the programming languages, the interpreters, the integrated development environment, which does static code analysis on your code. All of these tools, they take your source code and they process it somehow. Another example is having all these formats like HTML and XML and similar, because whenever the browser processes them, it obviously turns them into some sort of object-oriented representation. Or you can have simpler examples like for example numeric expressions if I write 3 plus 4 divided by 5 how does the computer know how to evaluate this and we also have specialized languages like for example regular expressions which are also textual representations of something which is actually non-textual which is actually uh, instructions for the computer to do and so we have this uh, one big goal of turning strings turning text essentially into object oriented uh, based structures and this is typically a complicated process and it's a process which uh, actually if you go and do a degree in computer science this might be one of uh, one of the topics that you actually get taught. So compiler theory is what it's typically called. Now many universities are giving up on compiler theory now because it's such a niche topic, but we're only going to take a look at a few small examples of it here in uh, this particular course. So essentially the interpreter in our understanding in the design patterns world is a component which processes structured text data and it does so by 
uh, a two-stage process. So the first part of that stage is it takes the text and it splits it into separate lexical tokens, and this is called lexing. And then there is the second part, which interprets the sequence of tokens into an object-oriented structure, and this is called parsing. And we're going to take a look at both of these processes in our examples. All right, so now we're going to take a look at the interpreter pattern and probably the best way to actually get a feel for the interpreter pattern is to build your own interpreter. And I'm not talking about building your own like fully fledged Python interpreter, though you could do that if you wanted to, but we're going to build a very simple one and we're going to take a look at some of the key processes related to constructing an interpreter. And those two key processes are gonna be the lexing and the parsing. So we'll start this lesson with the lexing and we'll continue on to the next lecture to do the parsing. Okay, so the lexing process basically has to split up a uh, an expression of some kind into a set of tokens. So first of all, let me show you the kind of expressions that we want to calculate. Let's suppose we want to calculate an expression such as uh, 13 plus 4 minus 12 plus 1. So this is a simple numeric expression. It has opening and closing round brackets and a couple of operators like plus and minus. We're not going to support any other ones. So this uh, function calc, uh, calc is going to uh, take uh, the input and the first part of the whole process is to actually get the tokens. And that's the lexing process. So we're going to lex the input and we're going to get a list of tokens which make up this expression. Now, first of all, let's actually define a class which is going to uh, sort of uh, express a single token. So I'm gonna have a class called token. Now a token can have a different type, like an opening parenthesis, a closing parenthesis. It can be an integer, for example, or it can be a plus or minus. So let's have an inner class called type. It's gonna be an enum here. So uh, let's import enum and uh, let's have all the different types. So integer and let's use auto to just, just define every single one of them. I don't want to give them explicit names. So we're gonna have plus, uh, minus, uh, let's have left parenthesis and right parenthesis. I keep typing parent for some reason. Okay, so these are the types of tokens that you can have. And now let's define the actual initializer for the token. So here you have to specify two things. You have to specify the type of the token, but you also want to keep the text related to that token so that if you subsequently want to print it, for example, you have that as an option. So I'm gonna add both of these as attributes to the token class and I'll define str uh, to effectively uh, return just a string representation. I'm gonna put back quotes around the token itself. It's actually a good practice because if you have any white space, you're gonna see that white space. So the back quotes are here for a reason. And here we put self.text thereby making a very simple representation of the token at hand. So now the lexing process, let's define a function called lex, which takes an input. Uh, so we're building up an array. Uh, we're building up a resulting list of tokens that is going to be returned. So we'll have result as an empty list and eventually we'll return that result whenever somebody asks for it. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a while loop which goes through every single character in the input because remember input is a string so you have to go left to left to right with the you know looking at every single character so I'll have some index i equals zero and then while i is less than the length of the input we're going to go through every single character and look at it. So if the input at position i happens to be a plus we need to. Uh, we know that we need to create a token which is a plus. So we say uh, result dot append, and we create a token. The, the token type is plus, and its text is also a plus. Now, in the case of the minus token or the opening or closing round brackets, the situation is pretty much the same. You just add something to the result. So we can uh, we can sort of copy this, and we can paste it a few times. Uh, paste it, obviously uh, change if to elif because these are the other cases here and modify the things that we are actually checking for. So in the case of minus, you would put minus here and uh, uh, minus here. In the case of uh, left parenthesis, uh, once again, L paren and uh, opening left parenthesis and the same goes for the closing, like so, right parenthesis 
and here as well. Okay, so these are the simple cases because uh, they are always one character long. Now, what we also have is we have integers. Now, integers can take more than one character, which means you have to write special code in order to process them because you don't just look at the current letter, you also look forward a certain number of letters. So this is all going to go into the else block. So I'm going to make a new list called digits, and this list is going to be initialized with the first character which is input at position i. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a for loop which goes through all the other characters while they are digits. So for j in range starting at i plus 1 and ending at the length of input, so going through every single character from i plus 1 until the very end, and I'm saying if the uh, character at j, so if input at j happens to be a digit, uh, then what we do is we add it to the list of digits. So we say digits.append, we append input at position j, and we also change the i counter by incrementing it by one so that we don't subsequently reparse the whole thing when we get to the outer while loop. Okay, so if it's not a digit, that means that we have to take all the digits that we've accumulated and make a token out of them. So result.append and we make a new token. The token type is integer this time round, and the actual uh, text is an empty string which joins all the digits together. Seems fairly obvious. And here you do a break, because you're essentially done with this line of reasoning. So you do a break, but at the very end of the while loop, what you have to do is you have to increment the i variable, because we're not in a for loop, therefore we have to do this manually. So i gets incremented by uh, 1 here. Okay, so we are done with the lexing. We basically go through every single character, we check it, and then we return the whole thing. So let's see if our calc part one is actually working. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to take every single token and I'm going to turn it into a string and then print that. So I'm going to print, I'll put a single space between the actual tokens and I'm going to join them and uh, every single token has to turn into a string so I'll use the map here and I'll map uh, every single element using the str function. So tokens. There we go. So this hopefully gets us the right result. Let's actually run this. Okay, so as you can see what happened is we've split the expression into separate tokens. So here is token 1. It's an opening round bracket or a left parenthesis and then we have 13 as an integer then a plus then a 4 closing round bracket and so on and so forth until the very end. So we've split up the expression into separate little parts and we can subsequently use these parts in the second stage which is the parsing stage to construct a fully formed expression. Okay, so the second part of constructing an interpreter is turning a sequence of tokens into some sort of tree, into an expression tree, which you can subsequently traverse, and you traverse it using the visitor pattern typically in order to either print the expression or evaluate the expression, really whatever you want. So first of all, we have to actually parse the expression, of course, and for that we'll need a new function and that function will be called parse and it will return some sort of an expression tree. So I'm going to say parsed equals parse tokens. So parse is something that you feed a bunch of tokens and it takes those tokens and returns some sort of object-oriented result. Now what objects does it use exactly? Well we don't know yet because we haven't expressed those in code yet. So we're going to do it now. First of all I'm going to define a type called integer and that's going to have an initializer which basically just takes a value and stores it. So very simple kind of thing. So value equals value. Now the other uh, type of expression that we can have is a binary expression. Now a binary expression is an expression that has a left and right hand part. It's basically addition or subtraction or you could introduce other ones if you wanted to. So let's do that. Class binary expression there we go, it's going to have a type, which once again I'll use an enum to define the type, so it will either be addition or it will be subtraction. One of those two. Okay, so let's define the initializer. Uh, so here I'm going to set the type, uh, the left and right parts, to none, because we'll initialize them in the parser, not here. So we'll have the left part and right part and they are both undefined 
for the moment. Okay, so now that we have this binary expression as well as the integer, what we can do is we can begin the parsing process. It's going to be a bit more complicated than the lexing process. So let's define a function called parse, which takes a bunch of tokens. Okay, so we're going to assume that the result, the top level expression that we're going to build, is always going to be a binary expression. So I'll say result equals binary expression. Now, in addition, when parsing an expression, we need to know whether to put it into the left hand side of, or the right hand side of a binary. So I'm going to have a little flag here to tell us which one of those it is. So I'm going to have a flag called have. LHS. LHS stands for left hand side. So we're going to have a boolean indicating whether we have set the left hand side of an expression already. And I'm going to have it false by default. Okay, so once again, I'm going to have a counter i starting at zero. And while i is less than the length of the tokens, we're going to go through every single token and decide what to do with it. So the token here is just tokens at position i. Okay, so just like in the lexing stage, we're going to have an if statement or a section a set of if statements. In actual fact, depending on what kind of token we have, we're going to actually be uh, modifying the expression or making a new one. So let's start with integers. So if if the token uh, type that we got is a, an integer, uh, then we need to first of all get the actual integer value. So um, we get the integer value and then we put it into the integer type that we've defined right here. So here is the integer type. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, we say integer equals integer with a capital I and then convert to int the token text, like so. So we make an integer from the token text. Okay, and then we need to know where to put it because we have a binary expression and this integer can go on the left or the right. So if not have LHS, so if we don't have the left hand side yet, we say result.left equals integer and, and have LHS equals true. Otherwise, and that should be true with a capital C, otherwise we put it on the right hand side. Else result.right equals integer. There we go. So we took the integer, we constructed it, and we put it into the right part of the current binary expression. Okay, so uh, let's consider some of the other, other cases. Elif token type is a token type plus. Now, if we hit a plus, this is just a modifier on the current expression. We currently have a binary expression here, so we just modify it so that we know its addition. So we say result.type equals binary operation or binary expression, uh, rather dot uh, type dot uh, addition. And type should be with capital T because we're referring to the enum. So uh, let's uh, consider some of the other cases. Obviously, if it's a minus, it's subtraction. So let's just paste this. So if it's a minus here, then it's a subtraction here, like so. And uh, the only other cases are the left and right parentheses. And once again, on the opening parentheses, this is where things get a bit tricky, uh, to be honest, because you have to basically find a sub-expression within the brackets, you have to uh, parse that expression recursively and then stick it into the right location. So let me show you how this works. So uh, we're going to have elif token type is equal to uh, token type left parenthesis. Notice we are not going to process the right parenthesis as part of this if statement because it's going to be incorporated here. So first of all, I'll make a variable j equal to i. And then uh, while j is less than the length of the tokens, I'm basically uh, going to be interested in finding out the location of the right parenthesis. So I want to find the right parenthesis for this left parenthesis so I could take the sub-expression, pass it recursively, and then stick it in the right place. So here, if uh, tokens at j dot type is equal to the right parenthesis, so token dot type dot right parenthesis, then I do a break. So then the variable j gets initialized to the terminal position. Otherwise, I just increment j. There we go. So at this point, where you see the cursor right now, the value of j points to the end of the sub-expression. So I can get the sub-expression. 
Uh, that's basically tokens starting at i plus 1 and ending at j. And then what I can do is I can parse this sub-expression. So this is the recursive call. So I get the element, which is the result of parsing of a sub-expression. And I have my element as a binary expression in this case. So th then I do the same thing as before. So I say if not have LHS, then result.left equals element and have LHS equals true. Otherwise, uh, result.right equals element. So I assign the element to the right position. Uh, whatever happens, I advance here. So I advance uh, this whole thing. I set i equals j because we don't want to go into the expression we just went over entirely. We don't want to do that again. And uh, as to the outer while loop, I want to uh, keep looping. So I increment i. Remember, we're not in a for loop. We're in a while loop. And then finally, at the end of it, I return result. There we go. So this is my parsing process. As you can see, it's not exactly simple. There are lots of things here which are uh, somewhat challenging. I forgot the round brackets here. Uh, but apart from that, uh, we are uh, more or less ready to go. Let me just fix a few things. Actually, no, this this is correct. This was a class, uh, just, just being weird. OK, so we parse the tokens uh, like so, and then we try to uh, print the final result, so to speak. So let me uh, let me now try to show you how you can actually, first of all, use uh, the tree to print the expression and to evaluate the value as well. So we want to do both of those things. How do we do this? Well, uh, one way to do this is to define value on both the integer as well as primary expression or binary expression rather. So for the integer, the value of that integer is just self.value. That's not a problem. The problem is here. The problem is how do you evaluate a binary expression? Well, let's make a property because obviously it cannot be just an attribute. So we'll have a property called value. And this uh, property is going to basically calculate it on the basis of the left and right hand side. So if uh, self.type is equal self type addition, and I forgot the equals here. So if we're working with an addition expression, we take the uh, left value and uh, add it to the right value. So return uh, self left value plus self right value. So that's how we do this. Otherwise, it's obviously a subtraction. So in this case, you do the same, but with a minus sign. Okay, so now we have uh, value defined on integer, we have value defined on binary expression, which means we can get the overall value. And that means we can print both the input as well as the output, the result. Print. So input equals parsed dot value. So this is how you get the final value. Let's actually run this. I hope it works. Well, we forgot a couple of things here and there. So let's uh, try again. And here is the final output. 13 plus 4 is 17. 12 plus 1 is 13. 17 minus 13 is equal to 4. So uh, this is how you can actually interpret an expression. So just to recap the whole thing, first of all, you uh, perform a lexing process where you turn the input into a series of tokens. Then you perform the parsing tokens where you turn the tokens into some sort of tree, some sort of object-oriented structure. And then, of course, it's up to you how you want to evaluate things. So here I'm not even using a fully fledged visitor pattern. I'm just saying parse.value and I've intrusively added the evaluation to both binary expression as well as the integer, of course. All right, so let's try to summarize uh, the interpreter design pattern. So with the exception of simple cases, an interpreter actually works in two stages. So first of all, there is lexing, which takes a chunk of text and turns it into a sequence of tokens. And then there is parsing, which turns the sequence of tokens into meaningful object-oriented constructs that you can subsequently traverse and, for example, print or evaluate or whatever it is that you need to do with them. We are now going to take a look at the iterator design pattern. So what is 
What is iterator all about? Well, iteration or traversal is a core functionality of various data structures. Essentially, whether you have a list or a dictionary or something else, you want to be able to go through all the elements in this or that data structure. And certainly some data structures have really complicated mechanisms of traversal. Like if you think about trees, for example, it's not just a simple way of going from the start to the end of a list. It's a bit more complicated. So an iterator is typically a class that actually facilitates the traversal. So we're doing this separation of concerns thing and saying that, well, whenever we have this concern, which is called traversal, we're going to put it into a separate class and then use that class whenever somebody asks for the mechanism to traverse something. So the idea is typically that an iterator keeps a reference to the current element, so the element on which it's actually on right now, and then it knows how to move from the current element to a different element there by hopefully covering all the necessary elements in the data structure that you want to traverse. So the iterator protocol is really simple. It requires two things. So first of all, if you want an object to be iterable, it has to have an iter method, you know, which is actually required to expose an iterator. And the iterator in turn has to have a next method, which returns the uh, each of the iterated elements. So as you go from one element to another, you return from next the current element, the element that you're pointing to. And in certain situations, you can have a setup where an object actually has both the iter as well as the next methods inside a single class. That's also a possibility and there is nothing particularly wrong with it. So uh, when you are done, when you don't have anything to return from next, that's when you typically raise a stop iteration. and this is how you indicate that there are no more elements to give essentially. So the formal definition of an iterator is it's simply an object that facilitates the traversal of a data structure. All right, so to illustrate our approach to implementing the iterator design pattern, we're going to iterate a binary tree. Now the tree that I'm going to iterate is actually going to be rather simple. So let me first of all show you the kind of tree that I want to iterate. Basically I'm going to have a tree composed of just three elements. There's going to be an element with a value one on top and then it will have the left and right nodes and here I will just have values two and three. So a very simple tree, but we're going to take a look at how to iterate it both using the uh, canonical, shall we say, constructs such as iter, as well as just writing a function which uses the yield keyword. So both of these approaches are equally valid, but what you'll see is that stateful iterators are typically extremely painful to do right. And you're going to see how uh, badly this is all going to go. So essentially we have this tree, so we need to define a node in that tree. So I'll define a node right here. Uh, now in the initializer, what we want is we want to give a node a value. I'm going to be using numeric values as you may have guessed. And in addition for a given node, you might also want to specify the left and right sub nodes since this is a binary tree and both of those are going to be none by default. So we'll define both left and right to have the value of none. And we're going to assign first of all, all of these. So I will uh, put value left and right into attributes like so. But in addition, we're going to do a few more manipulations. So first of all, I'll set the parent of the current node to none. And the idea is that you can provide the left and right parts, in which case the owner of those parts is going to be set as the parent of the left and right part respectively. So if we have a left part, uh, then I, what I can say is I can say self.left uh, dot parent equals self. So we're making a child on the left hand side and so its parent reference is set to the current object and the same goes for the right. So if right then self dot right dot parent equals self. So that way the parent gets initialized whenever we actually construct uh, node trees using this initializer. Okay, so having set this up, we can already define our tree, the tree that I've uh, defined right here. Now there are different ways of traversing the tree. So for example, you can have in order traverse, so in which case you have uh, the result two, one, three. So first of all, the left side, then the middle, then the right side. And there are other uh, forms of traverse, so like pre-order, that's where you get the value one, two, three, and you could do post-order 
Oh, where you, you'd get values 2, 3, 1. Oh, we're just going to stick to in order traversal for this example. You can do the other traversals on your own time. So essentially the root of the tree, in our case, is going to be a node with a value of 1 and 2 children. The left child is going to be a node with a value of 2 and the right child is going to be a node with a value of 3. So now that we have this setup, we want to somehow iterate the different elements uh, of uh, the root. So the root obviously has its own value as well as the left and right parts. We want to perform iteration. We might want to perform in order iteration, for example. So what we can do for this, just to get started, is we can build a separate component, a separate class, which actually allows for in order iteration. So we're going to define a class called in order iterator and this iterator is going to take a reference to the root of the tree and it's just going to try and give us the tree using in order traversal so it's going to give us all the nodes so in the initializer uh, we're going to initialize quite a few things so we have to specify the root of the tree to be traversed and then I'll set root and I'll also set uh, the current element to uh, the root so that we have two of these. Now uh, the root is something we want to stick to always. We want to just keep it forever. Now self.current is going to refer to the uh, current element, the element that we are currently on because this iterator is stateful. Whenever you call next on it, you move from the current element to the next element. So you obviously have to remember the current element because otherwise you wouldn't know where to start. Now interestingly enough, because we're doing this in order, we're going to navigate to the leftmost element. And we're going to do this right now. We're going to say that while self.current.left, uh, while there is a left element, we're going to set self.current to self.current.left. Now, another flag that I'm going to set here is uh, to indicate whether I have yielded the starting value. So I'll say self.yielded yielded start and I'll set it to false to begin with. Okay, so now that we've done this, what we need to do is we need to define the next method. The next method is the one that's going to take us uh, from the currently pointed to element to the next element up until the point where we have to stop the iteration altogether. Now, since this is a stateful iterator on the tree, you're going to see some pretty nasty code. In actual fact, what I'm going to do is instead of boring you with all of this, I'm going to paste in the implementation because it's rather ugly. And if you look at uh, in order iteration in Wikipedia, for example, you're going to see something that is nothing like what you see here. So the code here is just uh, really, really terrible terrible in, its, in the sense that it's very difficult to understand. So I promise you that it does in fact do what it claims to do. So it starts from the very left and it traverses the entire tree correctly to the very rightmost element. But the way that it's defined is not the way that you'd see it in textbooks. We have lots of uh, magic here, like this yield at start attribute, for example. And I'm not going to delve into the details. I just want to show you that the uh, stateful iterator, the iterator that keeps manipulating its self.current is a really painful uh, kind of construct to work with. Uh, but eventually, when we get to the final uh, the final case, the case where we're kind of moving up, uh, we can uh, either uh, return self.current, and it's actually returned from several locations in code as we go through it, or if we run out of elements to iterate on, we just raise uh, stop iteration, and that pretty much uh, finishes the overall iteration and just gets us, uh, get sort of throws us out of uh, this, uh, this infinite cycle of uh, iterating effectively. So we're done with the iteration. Now, of course, the second question is, well, okay, we have an iterator, but how is this iterator exposed? And of course it has an initializer, so you can just construct one. Uh, nothing is stopping you from uh, simply constructing the iterator in place, or you can expose it as part of an API. So for example, since we're not creating any special binary tree class, what I can do is I can expose the iterator right from uh, the node itself. So we have a node and here I can uh, define the iter method like so and here I can return an in order iterator which starts at the current node. So this is how you would expose it or one of the ways you could expose it. So we're not going to build a separate binary tree class, we're going to iterate right on the root. So how does this work exactly? Well 
there are actually different ways in which you can do this. So first of all, you can still use iter to construct the iterator uh, imperatively. So you can say it equals iter root. And then of course, what you can do now that you have the iteration object is you can call next to get the next value. So for example, I can print a list of all the elements uh, iterated in order by just saying, well, let's get the next element of the iterator and let's get its value for x in range three because I know there is three elements overall. So I'm gonna call next on the iterator three times. So that's going to give me the appropriate nodes, the left node, the center node and the right node. And then for each of them, I'm just going to get the value and I'm going to print this. So if I run this now, I see uh, the correct output, 2, 1, 3, so everything is working correctly. Now, of course, sometimes you use the iterator implicitly, like for example, if you make a for loop, I can say 4x in root, and this would also work without calling next explicitly because it's done implicitly. So here I can print x.value, and if we run this, then you'll see that once again, we're getting the same output, 2, 1, 3. So everything is fine. Now the real problem with this kind of stateful iteration is that even though we're sticking to separation of concerns, the single responsibility principle, uh, this entire chunk of code, the code that does the iteration in order and does it in a stateful way is really ugly and it's not the way that you'd read it on Wikipedia because Wikipedia will tell you that in order to do in order traverse, so you traverse the left side of the tree, then you yield the middle element, then you yield the right side of the tree. Now this code, does what I just described, but it does it in a way that doesn't allow you to make the one-to-one -one correspondence between this code and what I just said. So the question is, well, how can we write nice iterations? How can we provide a uh, nicer iteration mechanic? How can we get away from storing self.current and returning it whenever, you know, some condition holds or something? And the answer is very simple. We can use the yield keyword to actually yield the elements as we encounter them. And we sort of make the state or the position implicit as opposed to explicit. We are not going to micromanage the state of the iterator. So here I can define a function. I'm just stick to a function. And I will also call it traverse uh, in order. So we're starting at some root and we want to traverse the elements in order and we want to yield them effectively. So how do we do this? Well, inside this function, we're going to define a new function called traverse, uh, which takes the current element. And here is how you would define it. So this is uh, essentially taking the algorithm that you would find in a textbook or on Wikipedia and, and putting it directly into code. So we say that if there is a current element, uh, if there is a left element on the current, then for each uh, left side element in the recursive traversal, which is traverse, on current.left, what we do is we yield that element. So we yield left, uh, yield left. Uh, then after we are done with the left side, we yield the current element. And then we do the same thing for the right. So if current.right, so if we do have something on the right, then for each rightmost element in recursive traversal of uh, current.right, what we do is we yield the right side. So that's pretty much it for the implementation of the traversal. And now what we need to do is given a uh, current node inside the uh, traversal implementation of the root, we yield that node. So uh, this is an inner function, remember? So traverse is an inner function. And then uh, up at the level of that function, we say for node in traverse root, uh, we yield that node and that gets around this idea of kind of nested yields and whatever. So essentially this is a very nice, very kind of a concise implementation of in order traversal, which also is very readable and very understandable. So let's see how we can use it. So you'll notice there is no explicit kind of iterators or anything like that. I can say, for example, for y in uh, traverse in order root. And once again, I can uh, go ahead and print y dot value here. Okay, so let's run this. And as you can see, we are getting exactly the same results as before. So the takeaway from this example is that uh, there is an iterator protocol, which is combined, uh, which is composed out of the iter method, which has to return some sort of iterator, which in turn has to implement 
the next method in order to move from one element to another. But in the real world, what you end up with a stateful iterator, and here we have an iterator which manages the current state, the self.current, is you end up, sometimes, you end up with a really nasty mess. And this mess can be managed with the use of the yield keyword, resulting in a much more concise, much more understandable expression of algorithms. I want to show you a particularly weird approach to the iterator design pattern, or in actual fact, the way that you would expose properties to the idea of iteration. So, uh, what do I want to talk about? Well, let's imagine that you're making a game. You are making a game, it has creatures roaming the grounds, and you want to keep certain statistics about those creatures. So, um, let's suppose that somewhere in the initializer you give the creature a certain number of stats. Now the question is, how do you do this? Let's suppose that you decide to define the creature's strength, agility, and intelligence. So you define self.strength equals, let's say everything starts with a value of 10, self.agility and self.intelligence, uh, all having the values of 10. Okay, so you have these attributes and you can expose them as properties or just keep using them as attributes. It doesn't really matter. But at some point in time, you decide that you want aggregate statistics. For example, for a given creature, you want to have the sum of the stats. You want to have the maximum statistic. You want to have the average of those statistics. So how do you define all of this in code? Well, we can actually do it using properties. So let's define a property called sum of stats. That's basically the sum of of whatever stats the creature has. And here what you'd have to write is you'd have to uh, return self.strength, uh, self.strength plus self.intelligence plus self.agility, uh, uh, for example. Okay, so it's already looking, uh, it's already looking pretty, uh, well, unstable. I would say I would say that this is uh, a the kind of code where it's easy to forget to write one of the stats, especially if there's more than three of them. Imagine there's ten different stats; you're gonna have problem writing those. Now let's imagine that you want the maximum statistic. So once again, you would have to uh, define the property where you uh, uh, let's call it uh, max stat. So you want the maximum value out of all of these values. So here you would have to return uh, the maximum of uh, uh, self-strength, uh, self.intelligence, self.agility, and whatever other stats you had. Now imagine you want to get the average. So you want another property which gives you the average statistics value, so average stat. Okay, so the average stat would return uh, the sum of all the stats uh, divided by however many there are. So here you would return a self dot sum of stats divided by 3.0. Okay, so this code is uh, somewhat unstable for a number of reasons. One of those reasons is that you really have to make sure that whenever there is a list of every single ability, you really uh, type every single one of those out and you don't forget any. And if, for example, at some point later in time, you decide that you add another ability, like for example, I don't know, dexterity, then you're going to have to change all of these methods in quite a drastic way because you have to make sure that that additional ability is added to every single one of those methods. But also you have uh, like this magic number 3.0. So this magic number relates to the number of uh, attributes there are related to abilities. And if that number changes and you forget to change that 3.0 to 4.0, well, you're obviously going to get incorrect values. So the question is, can we modify, can we somehow refactor this code so that we no longer have this problem? And it turns out that we can, and we can uh, change it using properties as well as redefine the ways that the actual values are stored. So instead of storing them as attributes, we store a single list and we'll call it stats and that's just going to have uh, 10 comma 10 comma 10 to begin with because we are starting out with uh, three uh, three different properties. So I'm going to get rid of, well, I won't get rid of the uh, calculations here, but I'm just going to uh, start typing things out. So essentially now we have this challenge that we want to expose these stats, which are kept in the list, uh, and we want to expose them as you know, creature.strength, creature.agility, and whatever. And we can do this. We can actually do this. So I can define a bunch of properties. So I can define a property here, uh, which actually uh, gets us the strength value. And this would typically just look 
up uh, the value in the stats. So you return self stats at position uh, zero in this case. And the same would go for the setters and the same would go for uh, agility and intelligence and whatever properties you want. Now, uh, this is also a magic number, this zero. You might want to uh, make it a bit more expressive and the way we can do this is by sticking some class level uh, properties here so here I can define strength having the value of zero notice I'm using the underscores agility uh, with value of one and intelligence uh, with a value of two and what I can do here is I can replace this zero with underscore strength uh, actually that has to be uh, creature dot strength and I can do the same for uh, whatever other implementation. So in the example of strength, I would also have a strength setter. And this setter would uh, have uh, a fairly obvious implementation. So I would define strength uh, with uh, some value here. And here I would say self.stats at underscore our creature underscore strength uh, equals value and similarly we can implement all of the other properties now it is quite a bit of work to uh, get all of this but the stability that you get from this and uh, the flexibility is uh, quite significant so let me uh, let me actually uh, paste in all these implementations so here I have uh, strength and uh, agility and intelligence all implemented so let's get rid of the extra implementation of strength now what does this give us well it gives us a very interesting thing because now we have the uh, storage uh, as a single list and as a result of that what we can do is we can take that list and we can change the aggregate calculations such as the sum of stats and whatever we can change them to be much more concise because instead of writing this manual sum we would just return the sum of self.stats and obviously for the other implementations we would do pretty much the same thing so if you want the maximum stat you return the maximum of self.stats and if you want for example uh, the average of the stats you no longer need this magic number 3.0 in case uh, of uh, the average what you can do is you can return uh, and let's convert it to a float so you do the sum of self.stats or indeed you can use the sum of stats from above and you divide it by the length of self.stats so if you have a new statistic that length is going to change and there will be no magic number it will always be up to date so this approach is typically called array backed properties or in the case of python list backed properties it does require a bit of ceremony to set up the actual properties but once you do you have this ability of actually iterating on attributes of a particular class because otherwise you don't really have any flexible way of doing this kind of iteration and what I find typically in actual programming is I group things together so for example you can have a group of several properties being in one list and you can have another group being in another list and then you can do aggregate calculations on top of those lists and it's certainly a lot easier once you have those lists instead of just just unique attributes which are a bit more difficult to work with. All right, so let's try to summarize some of the things that we learned about the iterator design pattern. So an iterator basically specifies how you can traverse a particular object and uh, stateful iterators, as we have seen, they have a few problems. And one of those problems is they cannot be recursive. So you need to always be able to navigate from the current state to the next state. And there is really no way for you to kind of recursively call that procedure because essentially, as soon as you found a particular state, you stop the execution and then you have to resume from that particular point. So you cannot persist any kind of extra states which would help you go uh, to the next element for example you cannot stop yourself in the middle of an iteration yourself if you have a list you cannot stop in the middle return the current element and then resume the iteration from that element that's simply impossible but luckily for us we have an entirely different mechanism using the yield keyword and this allows for much more succinct and much more understandable implementation of the iteration process The mediator design pattern facilitates communication between different components. 
So the motivation for using the mediator is the following. So if you imagine a system with many components, you know that components can go in and out of the system at any time. For example, you might have a chat room, the chat room has participants, but they all kind of join the room, they leave the room, they go to a different room. Or if you think about, let's say, a massively multiplayer online game, you have a bunch of players, but some of them might uh, leave the game, some of them might suffer a disconnection, for example. And it really makes no sense for all of these players to have direct references to one another. In fact, it would be a nightmare to deal with because keep in mind some of those references can go dead at any time and you can't even predict when they'll go dead. So the solution is to have every single component of uh, every single participant in your system or refer to some central component that facilitates communication. And that is exactly what the mediator actually is. So a mediator is a component which facilitates communication between other components without them necessarily being aware of each other or having any kind of references to one another. A classic implementation of the mediator design pattern is the implementation of a chat room. So a chat room is basically a component, if we think of it as a component in the system. So it's a component where people can join the chat room and they can leave the chat room, but they don't necessarily have to be aware of one another unless they're sending a direct message. If they're not sending direct messages, if they're sending messages to the room, so to speak, to a chat room, then it doesn't really matter how many of them there are. So we're going to implement this entire system scenario and we're going to begin by defining a person who happens to be in a chat room. So uh, I'll define the initializer as follows. We'll have just the person's name and here I'll assign the name. Okay but in addition what I'm going to do is I'm going to store the chat log of this particular person. Maybe I want to store it just so that a person can save it later on. So self chat log equals just an empty list and I also specify the room but initially I'll specify the room to none. We'll assign the chat room later as we go along. So the second part of this puzzle is to actually build the chat room. So this is going to be a separate class called chat room. There we go and all we need to do uh, in the initializer is we need to uh, specify the people who are in the chat room so we can just say self.people uh, equals empty list and then people can join the chat room. So the question is how does a person join? Let's define a method for that. So def join uh, where a particular person joins the chat room. So first of all we might want to build a join message. Join msg. So we want to say hey person.name joins the chat. So let's do exactly that. Person.name uh, joins the chat. So this message obviously has to be broadcast to everybody who's in the room. So we say self.broadcast. Uh, we specify the source of the message as room and we broadcast the join message. Of course, we haven't defined broadcast yet. We'll do that in just a moment. The next thing we need to do is we need to set the room reference of a person to the current room. So we say person.room equals self and then we also need to add this person to the list of people in the room. So self.people.append and we append this particular person to the list of people currently in the room. Okay so now that we've done this let's implement broadcast. So broadcast is basically sending a message to everybody that's in the room except maybe yourself because if you're sending out a message you might not want to be uh, the one to receive a copy of that message as well because you, you've just typed it. You don't want to see it twice. So broadcast where you specify the source of the message as well as the message itself. And here we simply go through every single person in the room and provided it's not the source we receive the message. So for uh, p in self.people if, uh, if p.name is not equal to source what we do is we say p.receive source message. So now what we are saying is we're saying that every person has to have an ability to receive a message so we need to go up into person and add the appropriate method. So here we'll have a method called receive where you uh, receive a message from a sender and here is the message itself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to specify whose chat session this actually is. So the message itself, uh, the message itself, let's format it. So S is going to have the sender 
uh, colon and then the message itself but we're going to prefix this with the name of whose chat session we are currently looking in so uh, print formatted so first of all I will have self dot name chat self dot name apostrophe s yes, chat session in square brackets and then uh, the actual message there we go so what I'm going to do is I'll print this I'll also add it to the chat log and uh, uh, I'll just add the the message in the center and not the prefix uh, not the self.names chat message but everything else gets added to the chat log uh, that's pretty much it so we now have an ability of receiving messages that are broadcast okay uh, let's add uh, another piece of functionality let's add functionality for direct messages so that's when somebody wants to message a particular participant in the room assuming that participant actually exists because imagine you're sending off a message to John and John has just left this scenario also has to work it, it shouldn't crash the system or anything so let's define a message so this is going to be a method that takes the source and also the destination who you're sending the message to as well as the text of the message itself so here we go through every single person in uh, self.people and if that person's name happens to be the destination then we actually get them to receive the message so in this case we say p.receive and uh, we have uh, source and message and I misspelled uh, desti nation here there we go okay so this gets the person to receive this particular message sort of one on one nobody else can see it because it's not a broadcast and finally we need to give person an ability to send private messages so here we'll define a method called private uh, message so you have to specify who you're sending the message to and what the message is and this simply uses this central mediator which is the chat room so we say self dot room dot message and uh, we specify self.name as the origin, who to send the message to, and what the message actually is. So this scenario uses the chat room as the mediator. So it's the component that every single person refers to right here, but nobody actually has any control over. So they simply uh, use the chat room to send messages or receive messages, and they can subsequently leave the chat room if they wanted to. I'm not actually adding code for leaving the chat room. You can do that yourself. So let's try this entire scenario. So what I'm going to do is I'll make a couple of people in the room. So first of all, the room, uh, let's make a chat room. Uh, there we go. I'll add two people, John and Jane. So John equals person John and uh, Jane equals person Jane. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get both of them to join the room. Remember, you have to say room.join, uh, John and Jane. And then, of course, we'll get some things to uh, be printed out. So John is going to say, uh, and by the way, uh, we haven't implemented this part so a person has to be able to say something in the room which in turn gets broadcast so that's another thing that we need to add here so when you say a particular message basically you grab the room so self.room and you broadcast uh, that message self.room.broadcast you specify your own name as well as what the message is there we go so coming back here john can say for example hi room and uh, then Jane can say oh uh, hey John and subsequently we could get another participant in we can get Simon to come in so Simon is going to be a person uh, with the name Simon uh, room.join Simon uh, Simon says hello everyone Simon say uh, hi everyone and then uh, let's have a private message as well. So Jane sends a private message to Simon uh, saying, uh, glad you could join us. Okay, so we can try running all of this and seeing what the output is. Okay, so we're starting out with an empty room. Uh, John joins the room, but there are no messages because when John joins the room, there's nobody to see that he joined. Nobody actually gets the message. But then of course, Jane joins the chat and John is already in the room. So John's chat session, John's chat session actually gets a message that Jane has joined. And then Jane says, uh, hi room. Notice only John can see it. Jane does not see hi room because she just typed the whole thing. So then uh, 
Jane says, oh, hey, John. And then uh, when Simon joins the chat, you get two notifications because John and Jane are both in the room. So they both get the notification that Simon joins the chat. They both get the notification that Simon says, hi, everyone. And then uh, Jane sends a private message to Simon saying, glad, glad you could join us. And this only shows up in Simon's chat session and not in John's. So this has been a small illustration of how you can build a central mediator, in this case it's called the chat room, which actually connects several people together and allows them to send messages to one another. You can also build a mediator using events as discussed in the observer pattern discussion in this course. Now, in order to implement a mediator using events, we're going to use the same event implementation that we used countless times before. So here it is. In this case, an event is basically just a list of functions that you can call whenever something happens. So now let's imagine that you're modeling a football game, for example, or soccer, if you're in the States. So you have a game as a kind of central mediator, and the game generates events that subsequently players and football coaches and the viewers can subscribe to and get information about something happening in the game. So here is the mediator itself. It's going to be called game. And what we're going to do is we'll just have a single event, and I'll call it events so that it's kind of more global. So let's define the initializer and here I'm going to say self.events equals event. So in this case anybody can take game.events and simply subscribe to it and get some information about it. And we'll have a utility method for actually uh, firing uh, the events. So here you specify a bunch of arguments and you say self.event events args. So this is how you actually sort of invoke the event and make sure that everybody who subscribes to this event actually gets the information and we can uh, define what those args actually are. So for example, let's suppose that I want, I, I want information about uh, a goal being scored since we're talking about soccer. So uh, here I'll have a separate class called goal scored info. So this is information about who scored the goal and how many goals they scored overall. So uh, in the initializer, I'll just specify who scored and uh, the number of goals they scored in this match. So let's keep both of these as attributes like so. And then we can define a player. So a player is obviously somebody who actually scores a goal. So class player. Uh, let's define the initializer here. We'll specify the name of the player. And we'll also specify the actual mediator will specify the game that they are participating in. So we'll store both of these. But in addition, what we're going to do is we're going to actually specify that they have scored zero goals so far. So self.goals scored uh, equals zero. And then we want some sort of method for actually scoring a goal. Def score. Not going to have any arguments here. So first of all, we increment the number of goals scored. So we say self.goals scored plus equals one. And then what we do is we generate this goal scored info structure, and then we send it off to the event so that every subscriber actually gets a copy of this information. So we say args equals goal scored info, where the name of the uh, player who scored is self.name and the number of goals scored is self.goals scored. And then what we do is we say self.game. So we use the mediator. We fire the event on the mediator and that event is args. That's the structure that we've just set up. Now, who cares about the player scoring a goal? Well, maybe the football coach does. Maybe the football coach wants to congratulate the player on a goal scored, but only up until their second goal. So when they score their third goal, maybe the coach isn't impressed anymore. So let's define a class called coach. Uh, so in the initializer, the coach is going to just uh, reference the game. And all they need to do all they need from the game is they need a subscription. They need to subscribe to the game's events in order to celebrate a goal. So we say game.events.append self celebrate goal. So we need to define this method celebrate goal, which I'll define right here. So celebrate goal uh, takes args. And remember, args relates to the goal scored info in this case. So that's what we can first of all, check. Because remember, arcs can be something else. It can be something different, something other than uh, a ghost scored info. Maybe a player got sent off and we would have a, a player sent off info. So here we would say if is instance 
So if args is an instance of go scored info, and by the way, we need an import for this. Uh, what do we need? Actually, hold on, I'm just misspelling things probably. Is instance, yeah, I forgot a letter here. So if args is an instance of go scored info and uh, args dot go scored is less than three, let's put a uh, backslash in here, uh, then we can actually congratulate the player. So then we can print something like coach says, well done, comma, and then args who scored. So we find out who exactly scored and we congratulate them. That's pretty much all there is to it. And now we can try this whole setup. So here in main, what I can do is I can make the game, first of all, I can make a player, let's call him Sam, and uh, here we specify the mediator for the overall scenario. We also make a coach. Once again, we provide the mediator so that the coach can subscribe on the events, and then we can try scoring. We can say player.score, and let's do it three times like this. So when I run this, you can see that we get two lines of output. So the coach congratulates Sam on scoring twice. On the third run, remember, we're checking that uh, the number of goals scored is less than three. So on the third goal, the coach is no longer impressed and he doesn't congratulate the player. So this has been an illustration of an implementation of the mediator pattern by using events, by basically making a centrally available component which is in this case called game, uh, that has been injected into both player as well as coach. And then of course, what we do is we use the events to subscribe to something's happening in the game and we can handle them. Like in this case, we can handle them by celebrating a goal, for example. All right, so let's summarize what we've learned about the mediator design pattern. So first of all, you make a mediator which will uh, be referenced by every single object which requires it. Typically it's in a property and typically you want to stick the mediator right inside the initializer so nobody forgets to initialize their mediator. And then what happens is the mediator engages in bidirectional communication with the connected components. So on the one hand, the mediator has functions the components can call and on the other hand, and the components have functions that the mediator can call. So they know about one another. And typically in terms of event processing libraries and stream processing libraries like reactive extensions, for example, uh, you can leverage these libraries to make the communication between the different components a bit easier to implement because we're talking about streams of data going to and from. So reactive extensions is very useful here. Now let's talk about the memento design pattern. So what is the motivation for using the memento? Well, uh, an object in a typical system might go through several changes. So for example, you can have a bank account and the bank account has a money deposited in it. You withdraw some money and there are different ways of actually navigating those changes. So one of the ways is you simply don't store the changes. You simply store only the final value, but it's also possible to record these changes. Now we've already seen one of the ways this is done using the command design pattern. That's when you record every change and you can also teach your command to undo itself to roll back the bank account to a previous state. But a different and simpler approach is to quite simply save the snapshot of the system at every point in time. And this is precisely what the memento design pattern does. So essentially the memento itself is a token or some sort of handle class for representing the system state at a particular point in time. And what it lets us do is it lets us roll back to the state when the token was actually generated. Now the token typically does not expose the actual state information, but in some cases it might. So long as the information is immutable, there's really no problem in exposing it. So the idea behind the memento pattern is actually very simple. Whenever you have a change in the system, for example, you can return a token which gives you a snapshot of the current state so that subsequently you can restore the system back to the state contained in the snapshot. So let's imagine the scenario that we've looked at a few times already, the scenario of a bank account. So let's make a, 
uh, bank account here and the bank account is going to have an initializer with a balance uh, which is going to be zero by default I'm just going to store it like so and then let's have the deposit and withdrawal methods well let's actually deal with the deposit method only but what we're going to do is we're going to have the deposit method uh, return a value and that value is going to be uh, peculiar so we're going to have a method called deposit where you deposit a certain amount of money we set the balance self dot balance uh, plus equals amount and then we return a memento so we take the system in its current state and we return a snapshot so we need to define a new class let's call it just memento you could call it like a bank account snapshot or something now the idea is that in the initializer what you do is you specify all the particulars about the bank account at a particular moment in time so in this case for example we could specify the balance so we could specify what the balance is and as a result here what we can do is we can return the memento uh, passing uh, in self.balance as the balance for that memento. Now the whole point of having these mementos is that you can roll back the system to a state which has been preserved by a memento. So here we would have some sort of uh, restore method where it takes the memento and it restores the bank account to this state. So for example we can set the balance uh, seeing how the balance is the only thing we're actually changing, you can set the balance to the value provided by the memento, so memento.balance. This is how you roll back the state of the system. Let's also add str so we can uh, just uh, print uh, the balance of the bank account like so. And then we can try using the mementos. So let me show you how this can work. So uh, make a bank account. Let's make a bank account with $100 on it. We'll have two mementos, M1. So M1 is going to be the result of depositing uh, $50 and M2 is going to be uh, the result of depositing an additional $25. So here we can print the bank account. It should give us uh, the uh, $175 balance and that's exactly what we get. And moving on, we can actually roll back to one of these mementos. So we can uh, restore uh, uh, M1, restore to the M1 memento, so I can say bank account restore, uh, pass the M1 memento and print the bank account. And uh, we can do the same uh, for uh, restoring M2 and do ba.restore uh, M2 and once again I'll uh, print the bank account balance once again. So let's run all of this, let's see what we get. So as you can see uh, the starting balance is $175. When we uh, restore Memento M1 we return to the state where we had just 150 and when we restore M2 we get back to 175. Now one thing worth noting about the setup is there is no Memento for the initial balance because the uh, initializer doesn't really return a value other than the uh, constructed object. So the problem is that uh, we have the mementos for the different states, but we don't have uh, the memento for the initial state. And that's something that we're going to learn in the next lesson. So one interesting thing that you can do with mementos is you can implement undo and redo functionality and for that you obviously need to store every single state of the system as a memento and sometimes it's uneconomical, sometimes it would just take up too much memory but there are situations where you can do this and if you can do this then you have the entire snapshot of the system in time and you can roll it back to any single state. Now one problem we saw in the implementation of the memento is that we never get a memento for the initial state but if we we are storing every single state then things become a little bit easier and we can just store it somewhere else somewhere like a list for example so let me show you how that this can work so the idea is that we have a list of all the changes stored as mementos so we say self.changes equals a brand new list and this list gets an initial memento uh, which encapsulates the current balance or any additional properties that you might have but in this case we have just a balance. Now in addition we'll have some sort of indicator for where we are in this list of uh, mementos and the reason why we want this is so that we can do both undo so going back in time as well as redo going forward. So I'll call this 
uh, attribute current and I'll give it a value of zero. So at the moment, we are at position zero in this list, meaning that we are at the starting balance. And subsequently, when we do the deposit, uh, we need to not only change the value, but we also need to make a memento and add this memento to the set of mementos that we have. So let me show you how this can work. So we have to make the memento uh, like so with the balance. We add it to the set of changes. So we say self.changes.append append the memento. We say self.current plus equals one. That's our pointer to the current memento. And then and only then do we actually return the memento. So as you can see, the implementation of deposit has become a bit more complicated. It's now grown to five lines of code, but the end result is that we can now walk forwards and backwards. Now, first of all, let's implement the restore memento here. So the restore has to uh, well, we're actually going to introduce an additional little trick. We're going to assume that memento can be set to none. And I'll show you why in just a moment. But here we're going to have a guard condition if memento. So if memento is not none, then we set it to the balance. Uh, we set the bank account to the balance uh, shown by the memento. We add this memento to the list of changes. So we say self.changes.append memento like so, and then we move the current uh, pointer. So the current has to now point to the last element of the list because we've just appended something. So here we can say self.current uh, equals, and we can take the length of self.changes minus one. So that points to the last element of uh, the list. The, the index of the last element uh, is stored in self.current. Okay, so now we need to implement undo and redo. That's why we started this whole thing. And let's first of all do undo. Now remember, you can only undo if uh, the current position is greater than zero. If the current position is zero, there is nowhere to undo to. So we say if self.current is greater than zero, then we perform the actual undo. So we say self.current minus equals one. So we decrease it by one. Uh, we get the memento. So memento is self.changes at self.current. So we get the sort of current state. Uh, we say uh, self.balance equals m.balance. So we restore the balance and we return this memento. So the memento we return is essentially uh, the memento that we just moved back to. Okay, and failing that, if we fail to undo because there is nothing to undo, then we return none. And this explains why I have a guard condition in the restore because here we can return none. And so we need to check for none in the restore. And the same goes for redo. Now, obviously you cannot redo if you're already at the last position. So we say if self.current plus one is less than uh, length of self.changes, then we can perform uh, the redo, otherwise it's impossible. So here we do the opposite of undo. So we say self.current plus equals one. Uh, we get the change. So uh, self.changes at uh, self.current. So we get the uh, next memento. Uh, we set the balance to that memento and we return that memento. Otherwise, as before, uh, we return none. Okay, so uh, we have now got this nice little setup and we can actually try working with it. So let me show you how this can work. Let's uh, get rid of uh, the uh, sort of uh, mementos here. We don't really care about the mementos so much as we care about uh, the undo and redo functionality. So uh, we now have a balance of 175. I can say ba.undo and uh, let's actually uh, print what happens here. So after undo one, uh, we get uh, the uh, bank account and then I can I can replicate this and I can do undo again. So after undo two, uh, we should get back to the original balance, which is 100, which kind of shows that now we can go back to the original state, whereas in the previous lesson, we couldn't go back to the original state. And let's also try redo. Let's try to reapply the $50 deposit. And uh, once again, here, I will say that this is going to be the redo operation. Okay, so let's see what we get here. All right, so as you can see, the starting balance is 175. We perform one undo and we get back to 150. We perform the second undo and we get back to 100. We perform a redo of that $50 deposit and we get back to $150. So this is how you can implement undo and redo operations using the memento design pattern.
All right, so let's try to summarize what we've learned about the memento design pattern. So we saw that mementos are used to roll back states arbitrarily. A memento is quite simply a token or a handle class with typically no functions of its own. It just stores a piece of data and allows us to roll back to this data. The memento itself is not required to expose this state. Uh, to which it reverts the system. And then we can use the memento to implement, for example, the undo and redo operations. The observer pattern is probably the most common design pattern out there. So what is it all about? Well, the motivation for using the observer is that sometimes in our system, we need to be informed when a certain thing happened. And that can be virtually anything. So for example, let's suppose that an object's property changes and we need to be informed about those changes because some of those changes might be disallowed, for example, or some of those changes might trigger other things in the system. Another thing we might want to watch for is whenever an object does something. So whenever you have a class which does a particular thing, you might want to get a notification on it, maybe like a real human human notification so somebody can take a look at this operation and determine whether it was invalid or not. For example, uh, you might have some external event that might occur outside the system that you're programming, but you want to be notified about that event anyway. So what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to listen to events and to be notified when those events actually occur. And these notifications typically should include all the useful information about the event. So for example, who generated the event, what values were uh, generated as part of this event. All this information should be delivered to us and we should be able to act upon this information. So we also want to be able to unsubscribe from events. So once we're not interested anymore in uh, getting information about a certain event, we should be able to unsubscribe from this event and stop receiving those notifications. So the observer design pattern actually involves two concepts. So first of all, you have the observer, and the observer is the object that wishes to be informed about something else happening in the system. And the entity which actually generates those events, which we want to observe, is typically called an observable. So the observable is the generator of the events, and the observer is the consumer of the events that get the notifications and can decide on what to do with them. I'm now going to introduce the idea of an event. So an event is something that happens and you want to be able to get a notification when something happens. So for example, let's suppose you got people walking around. If you're a doctor, you might want to have notification that somebody falls critically ill because then you need to visit them and check them out. So let's take a look at how we can actually implement all of this. So let's suppose that we have a class called person and this person, let's put something in the initializer. So uh, let's have the name of the person. Let's actually initialize it right here. So I'll put the name in the initializer. Let's also have the address. So we know where to call the doctor. So name and address. So self name equals name. Uh, self dot address equals address. And then uh, we want some sort of event to happen when somebody falls ill. So how do we do this? Well, there are lots of implementations, but the one that I prefer is the following. You basically have a class called event, which is a list. And essentially, it's a list of functions which need to be invoked whenever this event actually happens. So here we define call. So we define the call method. And here for every single item inside this event, so that would be every single subscriber, we actually call that subscriber. So for item in self, what we do is we call item passing in the args and the keyword args. There we go. Okay. So now what I can do is I can say that self dot falls ill is an event. And what this means is that now other classes, like for example, a doctor class can subscribe to this event and get notifications whenever somebody uh, falls ill. Now let's actually simulate this. Let's have a method called catch a code. So a person might catch a code in which case you might want to raise the notification. So you might want to use this event and actually call it. So here we say self.falls ill 
open round bracket, and this is where you pass in those arguments. So the arguments here get passed from here, and we can provide any information that we actually need. So for example, I can provide both the name of the person that fell ill as well as their address. So I can provide self name and self dot address. Okay. So uh, this is that, and now we can define a doctor class. So the doctor wants to be notified whenever somebody uh, catches a cold. In actual fact, we don't strictly need the doctor as such. We don't need a separate class. We just need some sort of uh, call doctor function. So let's have that. Call doctor. Okay, so we need to call a doctor for the given name and address. And uh, here we can print uh, that name needs a doctor at address. That's pretty much it. So this is how you would call a doctor. And now what we want to do is we want to make sure that whenever a person actually falls ill, the doctor gets called. So this uh, function gets executed. So how do we do this? Well, first of all, let's make a person. So uh, Sherlock and the address is 221B Baker Street. Okay, so now we can make that connection. So we can say that a person might fall ill and when they do, we want to call a doctor. So we say person.fallsill.append call doctor. And then we can simulate the person catching a cold. So we can say person catch a cold and that should hopefully uh, get the doctor coming in. So let's actually run this and let's see what we get here. So running this, you see the following output. So Sherlock needs a doctor at 221 Baker Street. So essentially what happened is uh, we invoked catch a code. Uh, so we ended up here and here we use the event. So we basically fired the event, we called the event. And so we invoked this call method here. And the call method just went through every single subscriber and we only have one subscriber, it gets appended right here. So we went through the subscribers, we called every single one of them passing the arguments in this case, name and address. And uh, that is pretty much that. Now notice that instead of a function, what you can do is you can, for example, subscribe on an event using a lambda. So for example, I can say person dot falls ill dot append. And here I can provide a lambda. So I can say lambda name, uh, name and address. In actual fact, there are two arguments there. And what we can do is we can once again print uh, name is ill. So whenever a person falls ill, in addition to uh, invoking call doctor, we also invoke this lambda as well. So if we now run this, you can see that Sherlock is ill. That's the first line. And then Sherlock needs a doctor at to the one Baker Street. Now, in addition to making the subscriptions, you can also remove subscriptions. So for example, here, I can say that I no longer want to call the doctor. So Sherlock might fall ill, but maybe he just took too many drugs. We don't really need the doctor, we just need him to sleep it off, so to speak. So we can say person dot falls ill dot remove call doctor. So now we are removing the subscription. We no longer care about a person falling ill in the sense that we do care, but we don't want to call a doctor anymore. So we remove call doctor from the subscription. And now if I call person not, uh, catch, catch a cold, uh, we should see just the Sherlock is ill part. Let's take a look at that. So as you can see here, we only have the Sherlock is ill. We don't have any second, you know, doctor. Sherlock needs a doctor at whatever address. So this is a very simple and very succinct way in which you can define events using just a list that is callable, a list of functions that you can call. And subsequently, you just set it up in the initializer. For example, you say self.fallzill equals event, and then you inform the client, so inform whoever is using your API that there is this event and you might want to call it or subscribe to it indeed and unsubscribe from it if you are no longer interested in monitoring that event. And that thing is available for you. And from then on, whoever is actually interested can use uh, this event. They can call append to perform subscription and they can uh, call or remove to perform unsubscription.
Since Python has properties that you can use as decorators and we have just set up the observer design pattern using events, what we can do is we can merge the two ideas together and set up the so-called property observers. So a property observer basically tells you whenever a property is actually changed. So how do we set this up? Well, first of all, we'll copy the same event implementation that we had previously. That's a pretty good implementation. It's very simple and it's very easy to add to whatever class actually needs it. And then what we're going to do is we're going to set up a class called property observable. Property observable. So the idea is that you would inherit from this class and thereby get a property changed event. That's the only thing that it can really offer. So we're going to have uh, self.property changed and that's going to be an event that people could subscribe to and subsequently get information about properties being changed. So then when we set up a class, let's set up a class called person. So we're going to have a person which is a property observable. So that means that person has properties that you can actually get notifications about, assuming they actually change. So uh, how do we do this? Well, first of all, let's initialize person. I'm going to have uh, a single uh, property called h with a value of zero. Now here I'll call the uh, base class obviously. And then what I'm going to do is I'll set the inner age uh, to uh, the age parameter. So notice I'm using the underscore here because the property itself is not going to use an underscore. It's going to have age without the underscore. So then we can build the getter and the setter for the property. And in the getter, because there is no modification taking place, there is really no problem. The getter is the same as before. So we say property and we say def age and we simply return self dot underscore age. So this is fairly simple stuff. But in the setter, what we need to do is we need to check first of all, whether the property has in fact been changed, whether this the new value being assigned is different to the old value that's there. If it's different, then we send off the notification. So here's how it works. So we uh, write an age.setter and here uh, we say def age where we specify the value. First of all, we check that the value has in fact been modified. So if self dot underscore age is equal to the value, that means that we're not really changing the value. So we can just return because nothing is happening here. But if we do need to perform the change if the values are different, then we say self dot underscore age equals value. And then we perform the change notification using the property changed event that we have inherited. So we say self dot property changed and then we call it with the name of the uh, uh, property that's actually being modified. So in this case, I'll put age and the value that we've just assigned. So this is how you notify. Now the question is, uh, well, how do you monitor those changes? So you now have an event here. How do you actually subscribe to this event and get notification on a person's change of age? Well, imagine you have some class called traffic authority. Now, traffic authority might be interested whether you are old enough to actually drive a car. So in the initializer, uh, we provide uh, the person that we want to monitor and we might may as well store it somewhere. So may as well uh, store it as an attribute here. And in addition, what we do is we subscribe to the property changed event. So we say person dot property changed dot append. And here we need to provide some sort of uh, method for actually handling the whole thing. So here I can provide self dot person changed. And this is a method that we need to define. So you need to have a method called person changed. And remember the parameters, there are two parameters. So the first one is the name of the property that's changed. And the second one is the value that's been assigned. So now we need to check whether or not it was the age property that was modified. So if uh, the name of the property is equal to age, then we can check the age and we can either tell the person that they are still uh, too young to drive or we can tell them to drive and stop monitoring them. That's the key part. After they get old enough, you can stop monitoring them uh, hereafter because it doesn't make any sense anymore. So if uh, the value is less than 16, uh, then what happens is you print, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, you still cannot drive. Otherwise, what you do is you, you might congratulate them. You can say, uh, okay, you can drive now. And then you unsubscribe from this event. Now remember, an event is just a list. So to add a uh, subscriber to a list, you use append and to remove it, you just use remove. So we say self dot person 
dot property change dot remove and we remove uh, self dot person changed so we remove the subscription obviously without any round brackets we just want the method here okay so we have set up uh, the subscription so now we can use both of these components and see what we get so uh, let's make a person okay and let's uh, make a traffic authority so uh, traffic authority that watches this person and then let's cycle the age so I'm going to say that the age is going to be in the range from 14 to 19 effectively so I'll put 20 here and we're going to print some information so I'll say that I'm setting uh, setting age to age and then we can actually do it we can set the age to age and what should happen is as we hit that magic number 16 uh, we should uh, basically satisfy the traffic authority so the traffic authority will say okay you're old enough to drive and, and it should unsubscribe even when we call the value of 19 nothing should happen so let's execute this and let's see what we get here so we're setting the age to 14 cannot drive 15 cannot drive 16 okay you can drive now and when we set the age to 17 18 or 19 you'll notice that there is no longer any feedback from the traffic authority because it has unsubscribed itself uh, from the event so it no longer gets any notifications Property observers seem like a really nice thing to have, a really nice implementation that will tell you whenever a property changes. Unfortunately, there are problems with them, and one problem is what happens when you have a property that's dependent on another property. So let me show you how this can go slightly wrong, shall we say. Let's suppose that in addition to the age, we also want to have a Boolean property indicating whether a person can vote. And this is actually really easy to implement, so we can add a property called can vote like so and let's suppose that you can vote when you're 18 or older so here we return self dot underscore age greater than or equal to 18. so this property has a getter it obviously has no setter since this is a computed property but now we have a problem how do we send notifications on changes to the voting ability of a person at the moment it seems just impossible basically so let's let's try to build a scenario where we actually want to monitor a change in this value so uh, let's suppose that we construct a person so we construct a person like so and we subscribe to property changed once again so we append some handler let's call it person changed okay so we append this handler uh, which I'm just going to put it in here so person changed where you have the name as well as the value and here we want to check if the voting status has changed so if name is equal to can vote that means the voting status has changed from false to true or vice versa so we can print something uh, we can say that uh, voting ability changed to uh, and then the value there we go okay so uh, we can actually set up a scenario where once again we cycle the person's age and as we cycle it we see uh, whether or not the voting status has changed so we print uh, changing age to age like so and then uh, we do it in a cycle so for age in range uh, from uh, let's say 16 to 20 uh, we print the uh, age and then p dot age equals age so we actually assign it so this might look like a really nice scenario but as we execute this you can see that we get no notifications of a person's voting ability changing and the reason for that is at no point in time do we call property changed with can underscore vote and it's unclear where you should be calling it now you could be forgiven for thinking that we should simply call it in age because age actually modifies can vote therefore you might think well hold on let's just duplicate this let's put can underscore vote in here but this is incorrect this is incorrect because between the ages of 15 and 16 for example can vote has not changed and you would be calling it unconditionally so this is an incorrect way of doing things what we need to do in this case is we need to cache the old can vote value compare it to the new value after age has been changed and then only perform the notifications if they are different so here's how you would do this correctly so first of all you would cache the old can vote value 
And then after performing all the work on the age property, what you would do is you'd compare it to the current value. So if old can vote is not equal to self can vote, that means uh, this has in fact changed. And this is the only case where you would actually invoke property change specifying can underscore vote and uh, self can vote as the new value. So if we run this, we would actually get the correct output here. So you can see that we're changing the age to 16, 17, 18, and at 18, the voting ability has changed to true. And subsequently, as we change it, nothing changes once again, because we haven't changed can vote. So this example, illustrates uh, some of the complexity that you end up with if you have properties depending on other properties. And if you think about more complicated scenarios, let's suppose scenarios uh, like what you would have in Microsoft Excel where you'd have lots of cells depending on other cells and everything being dynamically recalculated, this can become a real mess. And this approach, the approach of caching the old values and comparing them uh, with the new values, it doesn't really scale. So it works if you have one property dependent on another, that's going to be okay. But if you need to do it on a larger scale, then this approach is quite simply insufficient. All right, so let's try to summarize what we've learned about the observer design pattern. So we saw that observer is generally an intrusive approach. You basically have to jump into the class and perform modifications so as to expose some sort of event that people can subscribe to. And of course, this can be done using a base class as we've done, or you can just modify the class directly. Now, subscription and unsubscription is fairly easy, at least it is in the implementation that I have shown in the sense that an event is quite simply a list of a function references. And then what you do to subscribe and unsubscribe is you add to that list and you remove from that list. That allows easy subscription and unsubscription. And finally, we looked at uh, property observers and we saw that in the general case where you have just individual independent properties, then property notifications are really easy. However, if you have properties depending on other properties, then those notifications get significantly more difficult. Now we're going to talk about the state design pattern. So the motivation for using the state is very simple. If you think about an ordinary telephone, then what you can do with a telephone largely depends on the state of the phone as well as the state of the line. So for example, if the phone is ringing or if you want to make a call, you have to pick up the phone. Otherwise, nothing will actually happen. Now the phone must be off the hook to actually talk to somebody or make a call. And if you try calling someone and it's busy, you can put the handset down. So we have this idea of state and changes in state. And these changes can be either explicit, so you explicitly change the state from one to another, or they can be in response to an event, which once again takes us back to the observer pattern. So the state design pattern is basically a pattern where the object's behavior is determined by its state, kind of like my behavior is determined by my state. For example, if I don't get enough sleep, then I'm going to be uh, particularly groggy. So uh, the same idea applies here. So an object can also transition from one state to another and something needs to trigger that transition. So for example, for me to stop being groggy, I need to get a coffee or something and then I'll be fine once again. So a formalized construct, which actually she manages state and transitions from one state to another is called a state machine. It's also sometimes called a finite state machine. And we're going to see how to build one in the next lesson. We're going to begin our look at the state design pattern by considering the classic implementation of state, which you're going to find really bizarre. You're going to find this example, this whole setup completely ridiculous, but I'm going to show it anyway. And it's a good illustration of the kind of equilibristics that you can do with object oriented programming, but it's not such a good example of what you'd actually do in real life. So the classic Ganga, for example, involves a light switch and a light switch can obviously be in two states. You've either got the light on or the light is off. But you're going to see that on top of this very simple example, you can build a rather complicated and somewhat unnecessary state machine. So first of all, let's model the switch. So uh, initially, the switch is going to be off. But the way that we're going to define it is going to already start looking a bit strange because we're going to define self.state 
as an off state with round brackets. So obviously there is a class called off state somewhere and uh, that's what we're going to build in just a moment. But first of all, we're going to introduce a base class called state, which is going to have uh, methods representing all the possible different states. So a lot of very strange things are happening here, but we're going to have a straight state, which is an abstract base class. So let's import this and I'm going to have two methods called on and off which both take uh, the switch as the argument and here we're going to print that whenever we switch the light on by default what we're going to say is we're going to say that light is already on and we're going to do the same for the off state so you can see it's getting more and more bizarre by the minute this whole example but bear with me it's going to get somewhat clearer as we actually implement the whole thing Okay, so coming back uh, to uh, the switch, you can see that we need an on state and an off state. So we're going to implement those. Those are actually going to be classes. Now, in the typical state machine, you don't necessarily need your states to become classes. You can keep them as enum members or just, you know, just numbers or just, just attributes. Uh, but here we're going to have a class called on state, which is going to inherit from state. And uh, what we're going to do is uh, we'll have uh, the initializer. So in the initializer, we're going to print that the light is turned on and we're going to override the off method. So we're going to uh, actually, I'll just use the code generation tools here. So we're going to override the off method. And here I'm going to say print, uh, print that we are turning the light off. And then I'm going to take uh, the state and uh, the state is something that we have uh, up above. So we have a uh, switch dot state and I'm going to set it to the off state. There we go. So now that we've set this up, we can uh, implement a similar construct for the off state. So let me uh, do this quickly. Off state state uh, in it uh, where uh, we print uh, light turned off and then uh, for the uh, implementation of on what we do is we print uh, turning the light on and we say switch dot state equals on state okay so let's jump back to our switch which is now a bit more valid because all of a sudden this makes sense we have an off state and a corresponding on state so the switch is essentially uh, just a single attribute class. It has a an attribute called state and it has a couple of methods on it. So one of the methods is going to be on. And here we say self.state.on self. And in addition, we have off, which also has self.state.off. Okay, so it's, it might seem like like it's a really complicated example for something very simple and it certainly is it certainly is so let's try to r sort of understand what's going on here so we have a light switch the light switch itself is uh, something that holds a state so the state of the light switch is one of the two classes it's either the on state or the off state so the switch itself can be flicked on and off but whenever we do it, we don't do it directly. We don't directly modify the state. Instead, what we do is we take the current state, so self.state, and we force a transition on it. We, we tell the current state that we now want to transition to the on state. So let's suppose we're in the off state. Then when we turn the light on, we end up in off state's on method, this method. And uh, here we print that the light is turning on so we're turning the light on and then we use that reference to the switch to actually change the state so instead of changing it directly we're changing it right inside the current state now you might be wondering well why do we have these base class implementations why do we have uh, the base class for on saying the light is already on well think about it let's imagine that uh, for example we're in the off state and we decide to switch the light off but the light is already off. So when you call self.state.off, you would typically end up in offState.off, but we haven't written offState.off. So what we do instead is we go into state off. 
and we end up here. And of course, switching the light from off to off, we have to say that the light is already off, which is exactly what we're doing. So uh, with all of this put together, let's actually um, uh, try using it. So I'll make a switch. Okay, so first of all, I'll switch the light on like so. So this is gonna tell us that light is turning on. Then I'll switch the light off and then I'll switch the light off again. Let's just do it twice. Okay, so when I uh, run this demo, let's take a look at what happens. So first of all, uh, when we initialize the switch, the light is turned off. Then we turn on the light. So light turning on, light turned on, that's good. Then we turn the light off, so light turning off, light turned off, that's good. And now we're in the off state and we try to turn the light off again. And we have that base class state implementation, which tells us that the light is already off. So this is the classic implementation of the state design pattern where every single state is actually a class and it handles transitions from one state to another. So it's the actual off state which handles the transition from off to on. So uh, even though this is a classic implementation, it's not something I would personally recommend because the amount of ceremony, the amount of things which are not obvious here is far too great and it's really not worth even having uh, the uh, classes on state and off state because you're you're simply wasting wasting time and wasting you know the potential for the program to be simpler because essentially you can take the on state and the off state and you can simply stick them to an enum for example and it just makes it a lot simpler to orchestrate and also this idea that uh, the state itself uh, regulates the transition to some different state while it's a nice idea it's not something that people do nowadays so we're going to leave this as a kind of classic example as a reminder of the kind of things that people might have done at some point in time but this isn't the kind of state machine that we build nowadays Let's take a look at a more realistic implementation of a state machine. And this time around, we're going to build something a bit more complicated. We're going to build a state machine for modeling a phone call. So how are we going to define a phone call? Well, first of all, we'll begin by defining the states of the phone call. So the phone can be off the hook. It can be connecting to somebody. You can be connected or placed on hold, for example. And we're also going to define triggers. Now, triggers are things which are going to force a transition from one state to another. So a trigger might be something like a call that's been dialed. So you dial the call, therefore you're transitioning from uh, let's say uh, the off hook state to the connecting state and so on. So let's define the states. Uh, so that's going to be in uh, enum and uh, uh, kind of states you can have our off hook, for example, uh, connecting. I need to import auto as well. So connected. Uh, let's also have on hold and on hook. That's when you're done actually calling. So these are the states the phone can be in. And then we can define the uh, triggers. Trigger. So the triggers are the things that cause a transition from one state to another. So we can dial a call. Uh, we can hang up. Uh, we can get connected. Uh, we can be placed on hold. We can be taken off hold. And we can leave a message. There we go. So these are some of the things that we can do. And this causes a transition from one state to another. So now what we need to do is we need to define this large big map, large set of rules effectively for which transitions cause uh, what essentially. So given a particular state, we need to define a list of the triggers and the states they would move us to. So these are going to be the rules of our system. So for example, let's suppose that we're starting in the off hook state. So the key here would be state off hook. And the sets of values here would be a list of pairs. And for every single pair, there are two elements to it. There is the trigger and the state you end up to if you actually fire this trigger. 
So the trigger here uh, might be uh, call dialed, for example, and the state uh, might be connecting. So what does this mean? This means that if the phone is currently off the hook, when you dial a call, you are now connecting. And we can add other uh, states to this. I'm just going to paste a couple of uh, things in here. So these are uh, additional rules for our phone call. So for example, when you are connected, you have three options. You can leave a message, you can hang up, or you can get placed on hold. So uh, if you are placed on hold, then you're on hold. If you hang up, then the phone is on the hook because you've just placed it there. So these are the rules that we're going to use to actually orchestrate the state machine. So the word orchestrate just means get it to run, get it to execute. So what do we need to actually run all of this? Well, we need two more pieces of information. We need the starting state, that would be the state that we are starting from, and we also need some sort of exit state for determining when this entire state machine is done executing. Now, some state machines are infinite, which means they never complete. So for example, if you have a robot trading on the financial markets, it might never actually stop trading because, well, a trading session might finish, but then another one begins. And so there is no reason to really uh, determine any kind of exit state. But here we do have an exit state because we're modeling just a single phone call. And as soon as the person places the phone on the hook, we want to exit. So we're going to have the starting state as state off hook. That's when you've taken the phone off the hook and you want to dial somebody. And the exit state is going to be on hook. So that's when you, you've actually placed the phone back on the hook. So what we do is we basically make a loop. So while the state is not equal to the exit state, what we can do is we can do like an interactive simulation, for example. So here I can print, uh, for example, that the phone is currently and print the state. And yes, that's going to print it in capitals, but that's not such a big deal. And then what we can do is we can offer the user all the options that are available at this particular position. So we need to find, given the current state, we need to find all the possible triggers and we need to offer those triggers uh, to the user. So for i in range of length of rules at the current state, so we're getting all the rules, uh, all the triggers at the current state and we get that particular trigger. So we say the trigger is actually rules at state at position i at zero, so that will get us the trigger, and we can actually print this with an index. That's why I use an integer here. So here is the index, colon, and then the trigger itself. And now we get the user to actually input what kind of action they want to do. So idx equals int input uh, select a trigger. So they get to input a trigger, and then we get to actually uh, perform the transition. So here what we need to do is we need to figure out the state we'll be moving to. So that is rules at state at index at uh, position one. So position zero is the trigger, and position one is the state. And then we simply assign the state. So we say state equals s. So that's how we perform a transition to a different state. And once this entire loop is done, we can just print something like we are done using the phone. Okay, so we've set up this rather complicated state machine. Let's actually run this and let's see how you can interact with it. So here we are, the phone is currently in off the hook and you can see that the printouts here are not particularly pleasant. You have state.offhook. I'm sure you can guess how to sanitize those and make those look really pretty. So we have just a single trigger. At index zero, we can dial a call. So I'm going to type zero here and now the phone is in uh, state.connecting and we have uh, a couple of options. We can hang up or we can get connected. Let's imagine we get connected. So in this case, the phone is connected and we have a couple of more options because we can leave a message, we can hang up or we can get placed on hold. So I can get, for example, placed on hold, I can get taken off hold and then I can, uh, for example, leave a message like so. And then we are done because after we leave the message, we place the phone back on the hook. And so we are done with the entire state machine. So this is an example of how you would build a simple state machine by hand without it using any libraries, any external packages. You just uh, write a set of rules for, uh, well, first of all, you have to define these states as well as the triggers. So the triggers are the things that cause a transition from one state to another. Then you define a set of rules such as the ones you see here. So essentially you, for each of the possible states, you define 
what happens uh, when you transition to a particular state and what state you actually end up with. And then you run the whole thing specifying the entry state and possibly the exit state, not necessarily though. And that's how you hand row your own state machine. There is another kind of state machine that I want to show you, and that is typically called a switch-based state machine. Now, the Python language doesn't have a switch statement, but we're going to do a very similar thing to what's done in other languages using the if statement. So let's imagine that you want to model a combination lock. Let's have the state of that lock. I'm going to uh, make it an enum, and I'm going to have just a couple of uh, different states. So for example, the combination lock is locked by default, uh, you can fail uh, to enter the correct code into the uh, combination lock or you can open it, in which case the, it gets unlocked. There we go. So uh, let's uh, see how we can orchestrate this state machine. And the interesting thing about the switch-based approach is that it doesn't really use any additional data structures. It doesn't uh, use a dictionary, for example, to keep the sets of... Um, transitions and triggers and whatnot. So instead, uh, we're going to model it like follows. Uh, so first of all, I'll define the code that you need to enter to actually open the uh, state, open the, uh, the lock and, and get it into the unlocked state. The current state, the starting state, so to speak, would be state.locked. And we're also going to have a string which is going to store the current entry. So that's the text that the user has already entered, the code that they have already typed. So then what you do in the switch-based state machine is you make an infinite loop while true. And here you look at the state. So you say if state is equal to state.locked, that's where we are actually getting the user's input here. So we uh, get the user's input and we add it to the entry. So entry plus equals input and uh, entry. There we go. So essentially, uh, we feed the current input into the uh, input function so that you get to see what you've already entered. And then you enter an additional digit and it gets appended to the overall entry. So uh, now what you can say is if the entry is equal to the code, then the state transitions to uh, unlocked. Now we transition to unlocked. Notice we're not doing a break out of the while loop here, we're just transitioning the state, nothing else. Okay, and the other case is if we get a mismatch. So if not code dot starts with entry, that means somebody is typing in the wrong code, in which case we're not going to let them in. So we say state equals state dot failed. There we go. So this is the if statement for the locked state. Now we can be in other states, like for example, in failed. So else if uh, state is equal to state of failed. Yeah, in this case, we just print that it failed. And uh, we set the entry to the empty string once again. And we set the state back to state.locked. Uh, so we kind of lock the th whole thing again. And you can try again typing in a different code. So uh, the final uh, state that we can be in is state.unlock, that's when you've unlocked the state, uh, the safe rather, and here we can print um, unlocked. And uh, this is the point where we can actually break from the loop because you've unlocked the safe, therefore everything is okay. So you can see that uh, it's an interesting setup because we haven't defined any data structures, we haven't made any lists of tuples or whatever, we are being very simple, in actual fact, we are not even storing transitions specifically. We're just storing the states and we have some sort of uh, set of if statements. And in a different language, you would have a set of switch statements which uh, orchestrate the entire state machine. So let's run this and let's see how it works. So here I have the kind of very empty input and I can try typing things in here. So for example, I can type one and notice I get a one. So everything is okay, two three, and let's put five. So I get a failed because that's the incorrect code and I get reset to the beginning. So now if I type one, two, three, and four, then I have unlocked the safe and everything works correctly. So this is an alternative 
to how you can define state machines. It certainly works very well for very simple state machines, but it's not as organized and it's a lot more difficult to understand because you can see there is a lot of code happening inside what would typically be a transition that would be formally defined, but here there is no formal definition of triggers. There's only a formal definition of the states and everything else happens in this large while loop. So this implementation is really up to the programmer's taste. So some of you might like it and some of you might not. All right, so let's try to summarize what we've learned about the state design pattern. So given sufficient complexity, it's actually uh, useful to define, uh, formally define the states as well as the possible transitions from one state to another. And what we can do is we can define uh, a lot more than that. So we can certainly define the uh, behaviors of a state entry and exit. So we can define the behaviors that occur as you entry, enter a particular state or as you exit a particular state. You can also customize the state machine in terms of actions that are done when a particular event causes a transition. You can define guard conditions for enabling or disabling particular transitions. You can define default actions when no transitions are found for an event. So all of these things allow you to customize the behavior of state machines. In this section of the course, we're going to take a look at the strategy design pattern. So what is this all about? Well, we know that in some systems and many algorithms can be actually decomposed into their higher level and lower level parts. By higher level, we mean the more general approach. You can describe at a high level how something works and the low level parts are the actual implementation details, which at some point you might want to vary as well. So if you think about an algorithm of making tea, for example, you can decompose this algorithm into the process of uh, making hot beverage, whether it's tea or coffee or whatever. Typically, it's the same you boil the water and you pour it into a cup which is a kind of high level description of the algorithm or the really tea specific things the details so when you get a tea bag for example and you put it into the water you see uh, you let the tea bag sort of simmer in there and when the tea is the right color you pull the tea bag out and you throw it away that would be the low level part of the algorithm so the uh, design pattern here the strategy design pattern is all about decomposing those two parts so essentially you keep the high level algorithm you provide it to the client and it can be reused for making in this case either coffee or hot chocolate or whatever but the low level parts can actually be specified by uh, whoever is using it and uh, we make different strategies we make different beverage specific strategies so in the case of tea you would have a tea strategy you could have a coffee strategy like a hot chocolate strategy that you would put into this high level algorithm in order to specify exactly what it is you want to do so the strategy design pattern basically enables the exact behavior of a system to be selected at runtime. So at runtime, you specify the actual details, you feed them into whatever component is able to uh, consume them. And then that component uses its high level approach with your low level strategy in order to actually do something. Let's take a look at an implementation of the strategy pattern. Now, what I'm going to build is I'm going to build a very simple text processor that is intended to process different kinds of elements and output them to one of two possible formats. So we'll have either Markdown or HTML as the output. And the only element that we're actually going to process is a list. So uh, let's uh, first of all, start with the text processor itself. So we'll have some initializer where we'll set up the buffer. Uh, that's where we're going to put all the text. And then subsequently, we'll have some sort of method for actually adding a list to a set of, an, a list element rather, to a set of lists. So here I will have a, a method called append uh, list where uh, you have uh, the items and you simply process the items into whatever format is actually required and you add them to the buffer once they are rendered in the appropriate uh, format. So the question is, well, how do you provide the format? How do you tell the text processor which kind of format you want 
the lists to be in. Now, if you want to make this flexible, then what you can do is you can define a list strategy. So you can define a strategy that will be used to process a list whenever somebody wants to append a list as opposed to something else. So here we would add a list strategy. And of course, we need some classes which define these strategies and define specifically the interface for these strategies. So once again, I'm going to introduce an abstract base class. It's not required, but it's a good idea just to kind of outline the interface that every single list strategy is supposed to conform to. So a list strategy is going to be an abstract base class. And here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to define three different methods. There will be a method called start which appends the start of the list to the buffer. We'll also have a method called end. And we'll have a method called add list item. This is the key one. This is where we add an item and we actually add it to the buffer. Uh, so this is our uh, interface. And now what we can do is we can define different strategies depending on uh, what we want to do. Now, in the case of rendering a list into markdown format, you don't need either start or end tags. They are simply not required. So when we build a markdown list strategy, which is, of course, a list strategy. All we have to do is we have to override the add list item method. And this is where we get to append the list item prefixed by a star because this is how markdown renders lists. So here I will say buffer dot append and I will put a star. I would add the actual item and put a line break at the end. So this is all that I need to do for Markdown, but with HTML, things are a bit more complicated because HTML lists have opening and closing tags. So here we'll have an HTML list strategy, also a list strategy. And here I'm going to do all the overrides. Here we go. So to start with, you have to append an unordered list tag followed by a line break. To terminate the list, you similarly have to append the closing list tag, like so. And when you come to add each of the list items, you have to append uh, the list item tags and a bit of indentation there as well. So we're going to append space, space, list item, then the actual item, and then the closing tag and the line break. There we go. So we now have two different strategies for rendering lists. We have a markdown list strategy, which knows how to render lists in markdown. And we have an HTML list strategy, which knows how to do it using HTML. So we can come back to the text processor. We can first of all define the default strategy. So here I can define that the default strategy is going to be an HTML list strategy, but you can change it later on. And of course, we're going to put this into an attribute so that we can refer to it later on. So now coming back to append list, obviously, this is the place that has to use the list strategy. And so here we would invoke the uh, start and and add list item members of the list strategy in order to actually build up our list. So we would say self dot list strategy. Actually, let me just say ls equals self.list strategy because there is too much typing here. So ls.start. So we start the list by uh, specifying the uh, uh, the buffer, which in our case is self.buffer. Then what we do is we go through every single item in the items that have been provided to us. Items is a parameter of append list. So we go through every single item. And here we say uh, list strategy dot add list item. We uh, specify the buffer as well as the item itself. And then we have to have the closing tag or the closing whatever. So ls.end self.buffer. So this is how you build a list. Now what you can do in addition is you can sort of flip the uh, uh, strategies at runtime. So you can, for example, have a method called set output format, which will actually uh, define the kind of output format you want. And this is something that can be changed dynamically. So what I can do is I can introduce, uh, let's say, some sort of enum for the output format, like so. And here I can have either markdown or HTML. 
And then coming back here, what I can do is I can take this output format as a parameter and I can determine what kind of strategy I want. So I might want either uh, HTML or Markdown. So if format is equal to output format dot markdown, then we set the strategy. So we say self dot list strategy equals markdown list strategy. Otherwise, if format is equal to output format dot HTML, then we set the appropriate list strategy as well. So list strategy equals HTML list strategy. Now, whenever you actually change the format, you might want to, let's see, well, actually, no, we don't want to clear the, uh, the buffer, but we do want to have some sort of method for clearing the buffer. Uh, let's have a, a uh, method called clear, which just says self.buffer.clear, so we can clear the buffer. Let's also have a string representation uh, like this. So I'm just going to return empty string.join self.buffer, self so we put everything together and return it as a single string. So now let's define uh, the actual body of our program. Let's see how the whole thing works. So first of all, you make a list of items. Let's say foo, uh, bar, and baz. And then you make a text processor, so text processor like so, and then you can set the output format if you don't like the default. So I can say uh, tp.set output format, and I can say output format dot markdown, for example. And then I can append the list. I can append all the items, and I can print the items. Uh, like so. And, and if we run this, you'll see that the output is precisely what you would expect. It's the markdown output for the list of three elements, foo, bar, and baz. Now what we can do coming back to the program is we can at runtime change the output format. Uh, so I can say output format.html. I can clear the buffer, so I can say tp.clear, and then I can add the list item again and print it again like so. And if we now run this, you can see that after the markdown, you see a nicely formatted HTML list of those elements. So what do we learn from this example? What is the strategy pattern all about? Well, the strategy is essentially a separate chunk of uh, code, basically a blueprint for some sort of algorithm that you can subsequently use inside the uh, object that consumes it. So in this case, the text processor takes a particular list strategy, and then in the append list, it actually uses this list strategy to perform operations on list elements. So uh, the, the flexibility here is that you can construct a brand new list strategy, you can substitute this, and uh, I uh, put it in place of uh, the list strategy already being used. This is particularly useful for testing when you have uh, uh, different parts that you want to test. You can build a kind of dummy list strategy that doesn't really do anything that helps you quickly test certain features if you want to have a proper unit test as opposed to an integration test. So this is pretty much all that we're going to discuss about the strategy pattern. So essentially you have a blueprint for an algorithm. In this case we define a blueprint which has three methods in it and then whatever inheritors you have they would expect what well, they would be expected to implement at least some of them. So in the case of the markdown list strategy for example we don't have to implement every single method because we don't need every single method. Method. So here is the sort of interface segregation principle in action to a degree in the sense that even though we put maybe too much into the uh, overall interface, that's actually good because, you know, the list, uh, the HTML list strategy does in fact require both the start and the end as well as the add list item. So we got some flexibility by uh, not following the interface segregation principle too much in this particular case and being more uh, judicious about how we actually distribute the different methods here. So let's try to summarize what we've learned about the strategy design pattern. So essentially the idea is very simple. You define an algorithm at a high level, sort of very general, and then what you do is you define the interface that you expect each of the strategies to follow. So for example, you say that, well, I'm expecting a strategy that has a method called X, Y, Z, because that's what I'm going to use to determine uh, like which drink I'm going to make, for example. And subsequently you provide 
for the dynamic composition of these strategies. So you make the strategies and then you enable the composition of those strategies in the resulting object. And in certain cases, this can in fact result in the different strategies interacting with one another or taking care of parts of the uh, thing that you're trying to build there. And this is how you work with the strategy design pattern. So in this section of the course, we're going to take a look at the template method design pattern. So what is this all about? Well, essentially, we know that algorithms can be decomposed into the common parts as well as the specifics. And we actually saw this in the strategy design pattern. So the strategy pattern does this through composition. And basically, you have your high level algorithm and uh, the algorithm or the class in that algorithm basically expects you to provide a parameter with a strategy just to feed the strategy in. and then you expect the strategy to conform to some sort of interface, meaning that you know which methods you can call on that strategy. So concrete implementations uh, then implement this interface one way or another, they conform to this interface and then you just feed them in there. But the template method is different. The template method does the same thing, but it does it through inheritance as opposed to composition. So here's what you do. You basically define the overall algorithm in a base class, but this overall algorithm actually makes use of several abstract members, which are also defined in this base class. So then you have inheritors, and the inheritors of this class, since they see a couple of abstract members, they know that they have to override those, they have to provide actual implementations of those members. And then of course, the template method gets invoked from the base class. And we, you invoke that method and all of those overrides are actually taken into account and are used to actually get the work done. So the idea of the template method is it's a construct which allows us to define the skeleton of the algorithm, just like the strategy pattern, but the concrete implementation details are kept in a subclass. Now we're going to take a look at the template method design pattern. Now the template method and the strategy are very similar patterns. In fact, they are almost identical except for the type of mechanism that they use to provide the uh, boilerplate as well as to fill it in. So if you remember the strategy, the idea is simple. You have a component which takes a strategy as a parameter, it assigns it, and then it uses that strategy's methods, which it knows either from knowing what interface the strategy conforms to, or just, just using duct typing, if you want to use that. Now, in the case of the template method, the idea is very similar, but instead of just providing arguments, what you do is you use inheritance instead. So let me show you how this can work. Let's suppose that we decide to make some boilerplate code for a game. It's going to be an abstract base class. Now this game is going to involve a certain number of players. And in addition, it's going to run according to certain number of rules. And we're going to define the skeleton of the game inside this abstract class. So first of all, uh, let's uh, initialize the game. We'll have to specify the number of players. So we'll uh, store that. And in addition, we might store the index of the current player. Self.currentPlayer equals zero. So this is something that the inheritors of uh, this game class can actually use for themselves. Now here's the interesting part. We want to run a particular game. And whether we're talking about chess or checkers or Magic the Gathering, for example, the process of running a game is pretty much the same. So when you run the game, very similar things happen. So first of all, you have some sort of start, some starting process that you run as you uh, get the game ready. And then while not self have winner. So while you don't have a winner, every single person gets to take a turn. So we say self dot take turn. And then when the game is done, we can actually print the index of the winning player. So we can print uh, player uh, self dot winning player wins. Like so. As you can see, in this method, we have a lot of unknowns, a lot of things that haven't been defined yet, like start and have winner and take turn and winning player. So what we can do is we can actually get them to appear as part of the game interface, and we can subsequently get the implementers of game to fill in the blanks, so to speak, and provide the missing parts. So there are four missing parts here. There's start, have winner, take turn, and winning player, and we can define them either as methods or as properties, for example. So we can define start as a method, 
uh, we can define have winner as a property. Have winner. Once again, it doesn't have a body. We can define take turn as a method. And we can also define winning player as a property. Winning player, pass. There we go. So this is our base class. This is essentially the uh, the skeleton of any kind of game. And the question is, well, where is the template method? And the answer is that it's the run method. The run method is the template method that's using a lot of other uh, members which have to be implemented by the inheritors because they don't have any kind of implementation. Okay, so let's suppose we decide to very crudely model a game of chess. So we'll have a class called chess, which inherits from game. And what we can do is we can just use the code generation functionality to uh, generate lots of stuff for uh, the missing bits because we have to call all of this. Now, uh, let's begin at the beginning. A chess is a game of two players. So when you call in it, you can call it with a value of two and you don't have to take number of players as a parameter here. In addition, we're going to limit the maximum number of turns. We're not going to do real chess, obviously. We're just going to simulate it. So I'll set the uh, max number of turns to 10 and I'll set uh, the current uh, turn to one. So these are uh, the attributes related specifically to chess as opposed to any uh, game. So these two are not inherited from the parent class. Okay, so uh, we don't need to override run because run is a skeleton at, that has already been defined. So it's a skeleton algorithm that we already have. So there is no need to redefine it. Now, when the game starts, we can print some sort of message, for example, uh, that we are starting uh, starting a game of chess with um, the number of players, uh, with so many players. Obviously, in this case, we are guaranteed to have just two players, but I thought I would reuse some of the APIs that we already have. Now, when it comes to specifying the property for have winner, I'm just going to say that uh, we're going to have a winner once the turns run out. I specified that we would have 10 turns in our game. So here I'm going to say that uh, I'm going to return when self.turn is in fact equal to self.maxTurn. So this is just a simulation, not a real chess game. Now, when it comes to taking the turn, we can first of all output some diagnostic message, but we can also increment a couple of variables. So here I'm going to print the turn self.turn taken by player uh, self.current player. So turn one taken by player zero, for example. Uh, then we can increment the turn uh, we, and we can set the current player to the other player. Now we only have players with indices 0 and 1, so I can say self.current player equals 1 minus self.current player, and that way we cycle between 0 and 1. And finally, we can uh, determine who the winning player is. I'm just going to return self.current player, so as the get execution terminates on max uh, number of turns, we'll return the current player's index as the winning player. And now we can simulate all of this. Uh, so here what I can do is I can say chess equals chess and I can say chess.run. So what happens when I call chess.run is of course that we run the template method which is defined in game. Here it is. It's going to call all of these things one after another and of course uh, since we inherited we have redefined the behavior of start, have winner, take turn and winning player in our uh, chess class. So let's run all of this and let's see what the output is. So fairly obvious stuff. You can see that we're starting a game of chess with two players and then uh, we take the turn 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 and then turn 10 is the terminating turn and that's when player 1 is declared the winner. So the takeaway from this is that the template method is a very similar approach to the strategy design pattern, but it's letting you fill in the blanks, not by using some interface that you have to conform to, but instead by using inheritance. So you have the template method, which has a number of blanks, a number of methods which are undefined and which have to be defined in the inheritor. And so you make an inheriting class like chess in this case, you fill in the blanks. So you fill in all the methods that you actually want to have uh, do something effectively and then you call the template method 
through the derived reference and thereby get all the benefits of the skeleton algorithm with the specifics provided by you, the implementer of the inheriting class. All right, so let's try to summarize what we've learned about the template method design pattern. So essentially to make a template method, you define an algorithm and that would be the template method. You define it at a high level in a parent class and then you define the constituent parts of this algorithm as various abstract methods or properties that you also keep in the base class and then you make inheritors. So you inherit from the algorithm class and you provide the necessary implementations of those methods so that the whole thing would actually work. We're now going to talk about the visitor design pattern. So what is it all about? Well, sometimes what we need to be able to do is we need to be able to define a new operation, not just on a single class, but on a bunch of classes in a class hierarchy, for example. So the question is, how do we define this new operation? We, for example, let's suppose we have some document and a document can be composed of many paragraphs and images and whatever. And we want this document to be printable to different formats like HTML or Markdown. The question is, where do we actually stick the code to do exactly that. And when we do print to some format, we obviously need some sort of accumulator. We need some sort of buffer where everything gets put together. And that buffer happens to be uh, the visitor in this particular very simplistic case. So one thing we really do not want to be doing is we don't want to be modifying the entire hierarchy. We don't want to go into every single element. If you have, let's say, 100 elements and say, oh, can you please add support for rendering to Markdown? That's not how we want to do things. But of course, all the different elements are related to one another. So for example, a paragraph might contain, let's say, a list item or something to that effect. And they are all interrelated and we want to be able to navigate them without modifying them and adding additional functionality in there. So how can we do this? Well, we need access to all the uh, non-common aspects of the classes too. So in the sense that uh, you don't just have all the aspects uh, of the classes being identical, you also have their own specifics and we want to keep those specific elements there as well. Uh, so what we do is we make some external component. So let's suppose you want to render a complicated hierarchy of types, a very complicated tree representing a document. You want to render it in different formats. So you create an external component, which somehow knows how to navigate this entire structure, knows how to navigate, for example, to go into a paragraph and see what's in a paragraph and so on and so forth. And we want to avoid explicit type checks. We don't want to say, oh, if this element is a paragraph, then please go into this and, and that and the other. So um, we want to avoid explicit type checks, but we might want to have those type checks being done implicitly in the sense that uh, we might want to use, for example, some decorations in order to actually show us that we're going to have like a single method with a bunch of overloads for different types in a hierarchy. So the visitor design pattern or the visitor is basically just a component that knows how to traverse a particular data structure. And that data structure can be composed of uh, types, different types related to one another. They could possibly be in a kind of inheritance tree and uh, some types could contain other types. We just want some sort of component that can go over uh, a complicated data structure and can, for example, print it to a string or uh, save it to a file or something to that effect. So something which knows how to traverse a structure and to uh, do appropriate things on every single type of node that the structure might refer to. All right, so to begin our exploration of the visitor design pattern, I want to show you a very simple scenario where we're going to work with simple numeric expressions. It's just going to be one operation, addition, and it's going to basically add a couple of numbers. So the kind of stuff that we'll be working with is expressions like one plus two plus three, for example. So very simple stuff. But what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to take this expression in object-oriented format. And we want to be able to print it or evaluate the final value, which in this case is six, by the way. So let's set up the object-oriented structures that are going to help us do that. So this expression is made up of double values, like this one, and also the addition, which has a left-hand side 
and a right hand side and obviously it's a recursive structure so this addition also has this addition and this addition has two and three as the uh, leaf nodes so first of all let's make a double expression now uh, this one's going to be very simple because in the initializer we just specify a particular value we keep that value as an attribute and that's pretty much it for now and then we'll have addition expression uh, it's a bit more complicated because uh, in the initializer we take the left and right hand uh, leaves the sides of the addition itself and we store them as attributes uh, like so and that's pretty much it for now so the question is well uh, suppose I build uh, an expression using uh, this kind of terminology so let's actually build an expression I'm going to build 1 plus 2 plus 3 in round brackets so e is going to be an addition expression uh, where the uh, left side is equal to 1 and remember that's a double expression and the right hand side is itself an addition expression with a double expression of 2 and a double expression of three. So this is our overall expression. The question is, how do we actually print it? So in the most uh, direct, the most kind of intrusive way of implementing the visitor design pattern, we don't make a visitor as such. Instead, what we do is we modify both double expression as well as addition expression to print themselves. And this is what I call an intrusive visitor because it's an intrusive approach. And by intrusive, we mean that we jump into classes that have already been written and we modify them, which of course goes against the open close principle. So it has to be said that in this particular approach, we violate that principle, unfortunately. So let's see how we can get the expression to print itself given its object-oriented nature. So we'll have a method called print that is going to be added to both double expression as well as addition expression. So uh, here the method called print, we're going to print everything into a buffer and in the case of a double value, or indeed any numeric value, we're just going to append it as is, turning it into a string of course, so we'll say buffer.append str self.value. So this is easy, but for the addition expression, we obviously have to print the left and right hand sides. And maybe we also want to add a couple of round brackets so that the expression is self-contained. So I'm, I'm going to uh, define print. Uh, once again, it's going to take a buffer. And uh, taking the buffer, the first thing I'll do is uh, I'll append a couple of things. So I'll append the opening round bracket. Towards the end, we'll have the closing round bracket. And in the middle, we'll have a plus. But between these round brackets and around the plus, we need to print the left and right sub-expressions. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take them. So self.left.print buffer and uh, self.left.right.print or self dot right rather dot print buffer and that prints the left and right hand sides accordingly so now we can see how everything uh, comes together so if I make an empty buffer which is just a list I can take the expression and I can print it to that buffer and subsequently I can print uh, the result. So I can say empty string dot join buffer and this should hopefully give us a string representation for this entire thing. So let's run this and here is the output 1 plus 2 plus 3 with a copious amount of perhaps unnecessary round brackets but they certainly serve as good illustration here. So we've gone on this intrusive approach and uh, in the case of two classes we, that we're happy to modify adding two methods is not such a big deal but if you imagine a very large hierarchy then you have a problem because you have to modify maybe 10 or 20 different classes adding the same member in every one of them and uh, it once again like I said it goes against the open close principle because maybe you want to keep the printing functionality together so you, you can keep some printing settings like for example where to uh, where to include the round brackets or what kind of indentation you want. So you might want to have these settings somewhere. And at the moment, you can't really have them anywhere except introducing additional parameters here to store the information. So it's all very inconvenient. But let me show you that you can uh, continue uh, extending this idea. So for example, let's suppose we decide that we want to evaluate this expression. So we want to print the expression and we want to say, well, this expression actually equals, and then we want to take expression and say eval on it. So evaluate the entire thing. How can we do this? Well, we can do this by once again taking on the intrusive approach and modifying both double expression as well as addition expression to 
to evaluate themselves. So in the case of uh, the double expression, uh, eval would simply return self.value. That much is obvious. But here in the addition expression, we would uh, define eval to uh, return uh, the evaluated left side plus the evaluated right side. So that would be self.left.eval plus uh, self.right.eval. There we go. So this is how you would do this. And now we can run this with e.eval uh, working here, basically. And let's run this. Let's see what we get. And we get the right value. So we get 1 plus 2 plus 3 is equal to 6, which is what we wanted in the first place. So the takeaway from this example is that even though there is... Um, well, there is no classic visitor as such, but we can think of buffer as an object that's actually visiting both addition expression and double expression because the buffer is the element that gets written to in this case. But there is no general visitor solution here. Uh, what we see instead is we see an intrusive solution, meaning a solution where you modify existing code, which, as I said before, goes against the open-close principle. Okay, so now in our previous discussion of the visitor pattern implemented in an intrusive way, we mentioned that uh, concerns such as printing, for example, could be better suited to a separate class. So let's suppose that we do decide to make a separate class specifically for printing. And we're, gonna, we're going to ignore the evaluation part for this demo. So I'm going to get rid of print and eval from both double expression as well as addition expression. And we're going to have a separate component that is actually going to take care of printing. And it's going to be called surprise, surprise expression printer. All right, so I'm going to give expression printer a static method for printing a particular expression. So uh, here I will have a static method. Now I'm going to do a little trick here. So I'm going to define a uh, print method and this print method is going to take two arguments. So first of all, it will take the expression, which I'll call E, maybe not the best naming, maybe you want to call it expression. I'll just keep things short here because there'll be lots of typing anyway. And of course you need the buffer where you actually want to print the whole thing. So how can we implement this? Well, at the moment, the only way we can implement this is by testing what type of value we got here. Because remember E, the argument E here, it can be either an addition expression or a double expression. And we don't really know. So when somebody calls this, we don't really know what kind of expression this is. So we need to check. So we can say if is instance. So if E happens to be a double expression, then we can get its value and we can just append its value turned into a string. So we can say buffer.append str e.value. Otherwise, uh, if is instance, um, if we have an addition expression, so e, if e is an addition expression, uh, then we do the thing that we did before with the round brackets and everything. So buffer.append uh, round bracket and uh, closing round bracket and there's a plus in the middle. Now in here what we do is we reuse the uh, method that we're actually in. We simply reuse it recursively. So we say expression printer dot print we specify e.left and the buffer. And here, similarly, we specify e.right as the buffer. That way, we print the entire expression tree. So how do you use it? Well, it's actually rather simple. So instead of uh, e.print, which we can't have yet, but we'll get it in just a moment, we'll make a buffer. And then what we'll do is we'll just say expression printer dot print. We take the expression and print it into a, a buffer. Uh, that's pretty much it. Um, so uh, now I'm going to get rid of the eval part, but we'll still keep the printing part. So this will actually work. We can run this and you can see we get the same result as before. Now the advantage of this approach is now all the printing stuff is kept in a separate class and we don't go into addition expression or double expression. We don't touch them anymore. If we need printing or indeed any other functionality like evaluation, for example, we do uh, it in the expression printer here. Now, if we do want this kind of syntax, if we do want e.print to work, what we can do is the following. Uh, so if we want this to work, we can actually use uh, the print uh, method here and we can use it on, uh, we can give it to an expression in actual fact. So this is rather easy. You simply say expression.print 
equals. And uh, here we can just write a lambda which takes the arguments, uh, lambda which takes uh, self and b. And uh, we call expression printer, let's do it on the next line, we call expression, let's do it like this, uh, restion printer dot print self and b. Now, you might be wondering, well, what exactly is expression? We don't have this type anywhere in our code. We have an addition expression and a double expression. And the answer is that the only way you're going to be able to propagate this construct is if you use inheritance. So we can go up here, we can make a class called uh, expression, which is of course going to be abstract because at the moment we don't have anything to put in there. So just put a pass in here. But later on when we construct the expression printer here, what we can do is we can say expression.print equals lambda which takes uh, self and b and we call expression printer on self and b where of course self refers to the expression that we're working with. So all of a sudden this line of code actually becomes valid even though your IDE will of course complain that it doesn't see the print method anywhere because well guess what it, there is no such attribute uh, explicitly being assigned up until this point and unfortunately not all IDEs can see that. But if I run this uh, you could see that, oh, uh, addition expression has no attribute print. That's because we forgot to inherit. So we need to now inherit from expression uh, both here as well as here. And now if I run this again, you can see that we are finally getting the right output here. So we're getting the output 1 plus 2 plus 3 as before. So what we managed to do here is two things. First of all, we managed to extract all the printing concerns. So the separation of concerns idea, we extracted the printing concern into a separate class, which has a static method called print, which takes any kind of expression and just prints it. And then we managed to imbue the expression class, which is a base class we introduced with a member called print, which does pretty much the same thing. So it prints the expression to some buffer. Now, is there any downside to this implementation? Well, yes, there is one downside. Let's imagine that we also introduce a subtraction expression. Now, annoyingly enough, subtraction expression will actually continue to work. So the printer will continue to work, even though there is no if case for a subtraction expression. It's simply going to ignore it basically. So if you add new classes, new inheritors of expression, the expression printer needs to be modified explicitly in order to support those kinds of constructs. Otherwise it will, it will compile and run and there will be absolutely no problem with this code being interpreted and executed. So that's something to watch out for and this approach is called the reflective approach because in some programming languages the uh, checking of the type is a reflection operation. So that is its unofficial name, shall we say, the name that I give it. So this is a reflective printer, also not the classic approach. So this is something that you can do it has certain downsides, but you can do it. It's, it's a functional approach. It works just fine. All right, so in our previous discussions of the visitor design pattern, we basically looked at two things that you can do with a numeric expression. One is being able to print it from its object-oriented form, and the other is being able to evaluate its value. Now, what we're going to take a look at now is the classic Gang of Four implementation of the visitor design pattern as it's implemented in most programming languages. And that is done using something called double dispatch, which might sound really cryptic, but in just a moment, you're going to see how the whole thing works. So just like in the previous example, we're going to build a separate expression printer. So a separate class, which is going to take an expression and get us the printable form. So here is an expression printer. There we go. This time around, I'm going to get the expression printer to manage its own buffer. So instead of passing the buffer in, we're going to keep the buffer as an attribute. So in the initializer, I'll just say self the buffer equals empty list. And let's also define str, which is going to return that concatenated list. So here I'll just join uh, self the buffer thereby returning the entire string. Okay. So what we want is we want uh, expression printer to be able to uh, take any kind of expression and get it to print. 
So let's implement this for a double expression. Now I'm going to call these methods visit. This is a notation that everybody uses, so just, just bear with me. So we're going to have a method called visit, which takes a double expression, and of course if you have a double expression you just take the buffer and you append the string representation of that expression. So you call str on double expression dot value, and that gives you the value. So far it might look like expression printer is a valid class, but I'm about to break it. Because what I'm going to do is I'll have another visit method, and this time around it takes an addition expression. Now your eyebrows are probably lifting right now and you're saying, well hold on, you can't do this really because you can't have two methods which are, well, effectively identical signatures, one of them kind of... Uh, <laughs> It's uh, it's a redeclaration effectively. So uh, I will agree that at the moment the code I'm writing is in fact invalid, but bear with me and we'll make it valid in just a moment. So in the case of visiting an addition expression, what I'm going to do is I'll write the round brackets and the plus sign as before, so we'll have self.buffer.append and we'll have the round brackets and the closing round brackets and uh, uh, the plus here in between. However, in between these uh, printouts, what I'm going to do is slightly weird. I'm going to take the left and right hand side of the expression and I'm going to call a method called accept on both of them. So I'm going to say addition expression dot left dot accept self and similarly here I will say addition expression dot right dot accept self. Okay, now we haven't talked about the accept method yet, uh, so let's just leave the fact that this is an impossible situation, a situation that you shouldn't be able to uh, operate in, and we're going to go ahead and add the uh, accept method to both double expression and addition expression. Now, in fact, one thing that we can do is we could for example, introduce a base class called expression and put it there as an abstract member and then propagate it down. But I'm just going to add it in both of these locations by hand. So here we'll have accept, which takes some sort of visitor. And notice the, uh, the self from here happens to be that visitor that gets passed in here. And the only thing that we do here is we say visitor.visit self. And we do exactly the same thing for the addition expression exactly the same. Okay, so now we have this scenario where we have double expression and addition expression. They both have an accept member, so whenever you call something like ae.left.accept or ae.right.accept, you're guaranteed to succeed because there is a member there to handle this kind of situation. So what does this give us? Well, it gives us a rather bizarre expression printer which has uh, this kind of overloaded visit method which shouldn't be allowed by default. Uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to ensure that uh, these invocations, visitor.visitself here and here, actually get redirected to the right locations inside the expression printer. What I mean is that if I pass self, which is a double expression, I will end up here in this method. And if I pass in the addition expression, then I will end up in this method. And this is done using a decorator that I'm simply going to uh, copy and paste into my code. It's just a, a piece of infrastructure effectively. So uh, let me uh, just paste it in here. Now uh, the key thing here is that you have uh, a decorator called visitor, and this visitor takes an argument type which specifies what kind of class you're actually in, what kind of class you're visiting, what kind of class you're getting as the argument. So here what we need to do inside the expression printer is we need to decorate the uh, visit method. So here I will say that this is a visitor for a double expression, and this is a visitor for an addition expression. Okay, now we have uh, a chunk of infrastructure that works and we can use it to actually uh, print something to the printer. So we could say printer equals expression printer. I can say printer.visit and feed it the entire expression E. And then I can print the printer. Remember we defined str to show its internal string representation. So if we now run this, uh, you can see that, well, we have str returning not a string. Let's take a look at what's going here. We, we just forgot the actual uh, return statement. So let's try this again. And this time around we're getting the correct output, 1 plus 2 plus 3 as before. So what I've shown you is the classic a double dispatch visitor. The reason why it's called double dispatch is because it does this kind of double hop around the bend, so to speak. So whenever you want to visit something, let's say you want to visit uh, the left side of some expression, instead of visiting it directly, what you do is you go into uh, the accept method 
of that type and and you end up maybe here or you may end up here and then you call a visitor dot visit with the self referring to the correct type and because self refers to the correct type of object you end up in one of these two methods and this is a more scalable more flexible approach and it's just better so if you're building a visitor for something like this this is probably the kind of approach that you want to take The classic implementation of the visitor design pattern works very well in statically typed languages. However, you might be surprised to know that the implementation of the accept methods is actually not required that uh, this is simply done in languages with static typing and you can get rid of the whole thing and still get the same operations as before. So if I were to remove all of the accept methods here, what would change inside uh, the visitor is of course these invocations that do use them. What we can do here is we can just call visit directly. So instead of saying ae.left.accept and doing the double jump, what we can do is we can say self.visit and we can simply uh, provide the appropriate addition expression part. So in this case, it would be ae.left, and let me uh, comment uh, this bit out, and subsequently it will be uh, ae.write that we visit. So self.visit ae.write. Okay, so uh, this is going to work just as before. I can run this and you can see we have exactly the same output. So the reason why it works is because when you call visit, remember the uh, visitor decorator infrastructure has already been set up on top of the expression printer class. So when you call self.visit on ae.left, the system knows which of the visit overloads, so to speak, you have to invoke. Therefore, this entire setup works correctly without any additional uh, kind of uh, requirements. The, the only thing that you lose, of course, in this particular scenario is any kind of uh, explicit requirement for a support of uh, this and that structure. Because remember, when we were calling accept, if you accidentally forgot to implement accept on one of the elements, especially if you have elements in the hierarchy, if you forgot one of those accept methods, then the program would fail. Whereas here, it wouldn't fail really, because you would simply be uh, calling visitor on something and it would, uh, it would simply continue to work. We can actually try and uh, setting up a scenario where it doesn't work. Uh, for example, I can add a subtraction expression, which can be identical to an addition expression, and we can see what's going on here. So here is uh, a copy of addition expression, let's call it uh, subtraction expression. And let us suppose that we are processing a subtraction expression. So somewhere down here we have subtraction instead of addition and I now run this. You'll notice that uh, we still get an error so it's not such a bad implementation after all because what happens as we try to visit the right hand side a.write is we don't find the appropriate visitor. So we have a runtime error. Now this is admittedly somewhat worse than having an interface, having some sort of base class called expression, which is implemented uh, or inherited in double expression and addition expression, but this is still some safeguard against maybe some missing case. But of course, if you never look the right way, if you don't have any tests, if you just test your code with addition expressions and subsequently put it in, into production with uh, subtraction expressions, then you're going to be in trouble. You're going to be in real trouble because there is no way to tell automatically that this particular part is missing. Whereas in the classic visitor implementation, if you introduce an abstract base class, uh, you can require every single element to have its accept method. And therefore you are providing some minimal safeguards against runtime errors. Okay, so having said this, the other thing I want to show you is uh, the kind of problems you can have if you build an evaluator which is actually stateful, meaning that an evaluator actually keeps some value for the evaluated state. So we have the expression printer. Let's do the expression evaluator. So the expression evaluator gets to visit an expression and evaluate its actual value. 
Uh, so when we initialize it, instead of having a buffer, we say self.value equals none, and we hope that we can subsequently initialize this value to the value that we are actually visiting. So if we are visiting, uh, for example, a double expression, then the result is obvious. We simply store the value. So uh, if we visit uh, the double expression, we simply say self.value equals double expression dot value. That's pretty much all that we need to do. However, in the case of the addition expression, things are a little bit more complicated. So let's make a visitor for the addition expression. So here, if I define visit uh, for addition expression, what happens is we first of all visit the left hand side. So that's easy. We say self dot visit uh, addition expression dot left. Notice I'm not calling accept anymore because, well, we don't really need to. Uh, and then subsequently what we have is self.value now stores the evaluated left side. But unfortunately, as soon as we evaluate the right side, the left evaluated value will be overwritten. So we need to store it somewhere. And I'll make a temporary variable here and I'll say temp equals self.value. So we store that value. Uh, then we visit uh, ae.right, so we visit the right-hand side, and so now temp contains the left side, and uh, the value is the right side, so we need to take self.value, and we need to add temp to it, and that gives us the plus operation, so we have the left-hand side and the right-hand side all added up together inside self.value, and we can actually use this code now, so coming down here, in addition to the expression printer, I'll also have an evaluator, so evaluator equals expression evaluator like so and I would say evaluator dot visit we visit our expression and then we can uh, print something more sophisticated so this time round I'm going to print uh, both the information from the printer that would be the expression in textual form and I would say it's equal to evaluator dot value and let's actually run all of this and we get the complete expression so we get 1 plus 2 plus 3 is in fact equal to 6. So there are two takeaways from this lesson. First of all, even though the double dispatch is kind of the classic approach to implementing the visitor design pattern, it's not important in Python because of duck typing and because there is no strong typing that mandates you to absolutely know uh, the type of a.left and a.right and how to dispatch on them. Instead, you can just call self.visit and the useful visitor decorator that you can investigate on your own time can uh, actually dispatch it to the right overload of this particular method. So that's one thing. And the second thing that I wanted to show is that sometimes if you have a stateful visitor, then you might have to cache some of these states just because of the way that you've set up uh, the evaluation. In this particular case, we have to cache the temporary inside a uh, temporary value and then uh, use that together with the other value and combine them together later on. So this is just something to watch out for. All right, so let's try to summarize what we've learned about the visitor design pattern. So essentially the kind of object-oriented double dispatch approach, which is shown in other programming languages all the time, is not really necessary in Python because of uh, the implementation that we've shown with the dynamic dispatch. So there is no need for this double hop uh, from visit to accept and back to visit. That's not something that we uh, particularly want to do in Python. So instead, the simplest approach here is to make a visitor using a decorator. The visitor decorator that we've used is precisely what allows us to effectively have several methods with identical names an identical number of arguments but those argument types are different and therefore when you call on one of them you're calling on the correct variation in effect so uh, then what you do is if you have a visitor with all of these visit overloads you simply keep calling these overloads so you keep calling visit with whatever argument is actually uh, being used here and your language starts to behave a little bit like a strongly typed language in the sense that you are calling the correct visitor overload and so as you do this the entire structure eventually gets traversed Phew, 
that was a lot of design patterns. So let's try to summarize all the things that we've learned about every single one of them. So we're going to begin with the creational design patterns and we'll start with the builder. So we saw that the builder is a separate component for when object construction gets too complicated, when you cannot just create an object using a single statement, but you have to make several calls to actually initialize the object, that's when you need a builder. So essentially you can also, if the object is really complicated, what you can do is you can create several mutually cooperating sub builders which will build the different aspects of your object. Uh, we also saw that builders often have a fluent interface. You make a fluent interface simply by returning self and that allows you to chain several calls together. So then we looked at factories. So first we saw the factory method which is more expressive than an initializer because it can have a unique name. And in addition, you can have several factory methods with same sets of arguments, just differently named. And this way you can uh, you can understand better what kind of object you're creating. Uh, we also saw that the factory can either be just a separate standalone class. So if you're building a factory as a class, it can be a standalone class or it can be an inner class of whatever object you're creating, which certainly does introduce a bit more coupling, but the factory and the object being constructed are tightly coupled anyway. We also looked at abstract factories, which allow you to uh, have a corresponding set of factories to a hierarchy of objects and we saw how to use those. Uh, then we looked at the prototype design pattern. So the idea with the prototype is that you make an object not from scratch but from an existing object which sometimes is easier to have sort of predefined objects that you simply replicate. Now in order to replicate them correctly you need something called deep copy. So you need to copy uh, the data structure recursively including all of its members and their members to infinity. So we have library support for doing this and as a result we can uh, implement the prototype factory and indeed the prototype factory uh, makes the prototype more convenient so you make a couple of prototypes and then you simply deep copy them and allow the user of the factory to customize them and return customized instances and then we looked at the singleton probably the most controversial design pattern out of them all we uh, saw that this pattern is required when you need to ensure that only one instance of a particular class exists and we saw that it's easy to make a singleton either with a decorator or a meta class, so you can have a reusable approach to making singletons. And uh, we uh, saw that there are problems in testability that are solved by using dependency injection. And here I don't just mean using some heavyweight dependency in injection framework, I mean that you can simply inject the uh, uh, class to be used as the singleton into the constructor, for example. You can inject it by hand by providing it as a parameter and that way you can replace that class, thereby allowing for easier testability. So these are the creational design patterns. Let's talk about the structural design patterns. So first of all, we saw uh, the adapter, basically uh, a pattern that allows you to convert uh, the interface that you get from some other system. Let's suppose some other developer gives you an interface and says, well, this is the only interface you're going to have. And, and then you have a different interface, you have a different set of data structures, and you need to adapt those uh, to the interface that you are actually given. Then we looked at bridge, a very simple pattern which simply de decouples abstraction from implementation. So essentially the bridge kind of avoids the Cartesian product complexity explosion by having uh, by introducing dependencies. In, in our case, it was initialize the dependencies. So then we looked at the composite design pattern which allows clients to treat both individual objects and compositions of objects uniformly, also very convenient in all sorts of settings. Uh, we looked at the decorator design pattern where you can attach additional responsibilities to objects without necessarily modifying those objects or inheriting from those objects. Uh, we saw that uh, Python has a particular type of decorator called the functional decorator, which is not directly related to the decorator design pattern as per the Gang of Four, but it's also very useful because Python functional decorators allow you to wrap a function with another function and you can do things like, for example, measuring the amount of time that a function takes to execute just by using that decorator on top of the function. And we've certainly used lots of decorators in this entire course because we looked for we used, for example, the property decorators. We used the decorator for making a singleton and there were lots of other decorators all over the place. So very convenient functionality, but not directly related to the decorator as it is defined in by the Gang of Four. Okay, so continuing with the structural patterns, we look at the facade pattern. Essentially, you provide a single unified interface over a set of interfaces over a set of types. So you're trying to hide all the Goro implementation details, but uh, you give the user a friendly and easy to use interface, but you can also provide 
uh, access to the low-level features in the sense that you can allow the user to uh, use uh, those low-level uh, features. If they are a power user, if they understand exactly how the system works, then why not let them uh, additional, uh, why not give them additional possibilities for customizing the system and doing things in a more sophisticated way, sh shall we say. Then we looked at flyweight, which is an efficiency technique. It's basically uh, attempting to efficiently support a large number of uh, similar objects without spending huge amounts of memory on actually storing those objects. We looked at the proxy design pattern, which provides essentially a surrogate object, which forwards the calls to the real object while performing additional kind of functions. And we looked at uh, different kinds of proxies that uh, exist, like access control proxies, for example. Uh, and uh, that's it for the structural design patterns. So uh, behavioral uh, design patterns then. So we looked at chain responsibility, which allows uh, components to process information or events in a chain one after another. Uh, we saw that each element in the chain can refer to the next element. That was the, the method chain approach. Or you can have some sort of uh, list and go through that list and therefore uh, notify each of the elements in turn. And that is the approach taken by the event broker because an event is essentially just a list of functions that you can call one after another. We looked at the command design pattern which encapsulates a request into a separate object. So instead of just uh, calling something directly, you package your request, you send that request to somebody and then that request gets processed and that's very convenient for lots of reasons. It's good for audit, it's good for uh, replaying the sequence of events for doing undo and redo functionality as well. And it's also part of CQS and CQRS. So CQS is this command query separation that we've talked about, essentially having separate systems for commands and queries. This is something that happens uh, with uh, database processing systems and uh, where you are prepared to uh, go for eventual consistency as opposed to at the moment con consistency. And it's also related to command query responsibility segregation, which is a, another technique that's also used in sort of heavy software engineering. We haven't gone into it, it in any great depth because it would be part of uh, maybe an enterprise patterns course rather than the design patterns course. So the interpreter design pattern, it's everywhere. It's all around us in this very room because it transforms textual input into uh, object-oriented design structures and then those structures can be traversed using the visitor pattern for example to get some get some output. It's used everywhere. It's used by interpreters, compilers, static analysis tools, so it's all over the place really. Uh, th this is actually a separate branch of computer science called compiler theory. And if you go to university, if you're lucky, you might end up being taught this branch of computer science, but maybe not because it's a bit niche and it's going out of fashion in most universities. So it, it depends on how lucky you are. But certainly if you go to work uh, for a company that makes, let's say, static analysis tools, then this is something worth knowing. And it's an interesting topic in and of itself. Uh, then we looked at the iterated design pattern, essentially providing some sort of interface for accessing the elements of an aggregate object, so going through the elements one after another. We saw that you can just go ahead and uh, use iter and next, uh, but these are stateful and they often result in uh, really ugly implementations of common algorithms. But if you use the yield keyword, then everything becomes nicer and more convenient and more readable and, and reads more like what you would read from an algorithm description in Wikipedia. So I, I prefer the yield approach, certainly. Uh, more behavioral patterns. So we looked at mediator, which provides mediation services between uh, two or more objects indeed. So you have uh, ways of uh, objects coming into the system and exiting the system without necessarily being aware of one another. And a chat room or something is a uh, typical example of something that you would uh, build using a mediator. Uh, the memento design pattern, which uh, yields tokens representing the system state. So basically the memento is like a snapshot of the system and you can use that memento to subsequently uh, roll back the, uh, that uh, system back into the state stored by the memento. They the memento itself doesn't have any API for manipulating the system, but you feed that memento into some API and uh, that memento is subsequently used to turn the system back into a state which it was in when the memento was generated. Uh, then we looked at the observer design pattern. Essentially, uh, the observer allows notification of changes or any kind of happenings in one component. So other components can subscribe to the observer and get notifications of when something happens. So uh, then we looked at the state design pattern, basically this idea of modeling systems by having a set of possible states and describing the transitions between those states. Such a system is typically called a state machine or a finite state machine. And uh, we saw that, uh, well, we didn't look at special frameworks, but I'll tell you now that you do typically work with frameworks rather than hand rolling the state machine. So there are special frameworks which exist to actually orchestrate state machines so that you can just 
grab an existing framework and use it without having to build everything by your by hand. Although uh, in the examples that I gave, we actually did build several state machines by hand and provided those state machines are simple, there is no problem in building them. But uh, there is a lot more that a state machine can give you in addition to those hand rolled examples. So using a framework might be worth your time. So then we looked at two strategies uh, to patterns rather strategy and template method they're very similar both of them define some sort of skeleton the high level description of an algorithm where the details are filled in by the implementer and then uh, their approach is different so strategy is boring it just uses ordinary composition so whatever subparts of uh, a the overall algorithm you require, you just take them as parameters in the, in the initializer, for example, and you, you sort of use them together. Whereas the template method is a bit smarter because it uses inheritance. So it defines a base class with a couple of abstract members and the algorithm which uses those abstract members. And then you inherit from the base class and you provide the actual implementations. Finally, we looked at the visitor design pattern. So the idea here is that a visitor allows a non-intrusive addition of functionality to hierarchies, allows us to effectively traverse complicated data structures which might have references to one another. So that's it. Those are the patterns that we've seen as part of this course.